Today, in audiobooks for me, we are going to listen to Jane Eyre, an autobiography by Charlotte Bronte. This book is divided in five videos. This is part four. We hope you enjoy it. Chapter 22. Mr. Rochester had given me but one week's leave of absence, yet a month elapsed before I quitted Gateshead. I wished to leave immediately after the funeral, but Georgiana entreated me to stay till she could get off to London, whither she was now at last invited by her uncle, Mr. Gibson, who had come down to direct his sister's interment and settle the family affairs. Georgiana said she dreaded being left alone with Eliza. From her, she got neither sympathy in her dejection, support in her fears, nor aid in her preparations. So I bore with her feeble-minded wailings and selfish lamentations as well as I could, and did my best in sewing for her and packing her dresses. It is true that while I worked she would idle, and I thought to myself, if you and I were destined to live always together, cousin, we would commence matters on a different footing. I should not settle tamely down into being the forbearing party. I should assign you your share of labour and compel you to accomplish it, or else it should be left undone. I should insist also on your keeping some of those drawling, half-insincere complaints hushed in your own breast. It is only because our connection happens to be very transitory and comes at a peculiarly mournful season that I consent thus to render it so patient and compliant on my part. At last I saw Georgiana off, but now it was Eliza's turn to request me to stay another week. Her plans required all her time and attention, she said. She was about to depart for some unknown bourne, and all day long she stayed in her own room, her door bolted within, filling trunks, emptying drawers, burning papers, and holding no communication with anyone. She wished me to look after the house to see callers and answer notes of condolence. One morning she told me I was at liberty. And, she added, I am obliged to you for your valuable services and discreet conduct. There is some difference between living with such an one as you and with Georgiana. You perform your own part in life and burden no one. Tomorrow, she continued, I set out for the continent. I shall take up my abode in a religious house near Lille. A nunnery, you would call it. There I shall be quiet and unmolested. I shall devote myself for a time to the examination of the Roman Catholic dogmas and to a careful study of the workings of their system. If I find it to be, as I half suspect it is, the one best calculated to ensure the doing of all things decently and in order, I shall embrace the tenets of Rome and probably take the veil. I neither expressed surprise at this resolution nor attempted to dissuade her from it. The vocation will fit you to a hair, I thought. Much good may it do you. When we parted, she said, Goodbye, Cousin Jane Eyre. I wish you well. You have some sense. I then returned, You are not without sense, Cousin Eliza, but what you have, I suppose, in another year will be walled up alive in a French convent. However, it is not my business, and so it suits you. I don't much care. You are in the right, said she, and with these words we each went our separate way. As I shall not have occasion to refer either to her or her sister again, I may as well mention here that Georgiana made an advantageous match with a wealthy worn-out man of fashion, and that Eliza actually took the veil and is at this day superior of the convent where she passed the period of her novitiate, and which she endowed with her fortune. How people feel when they are returning home from an absence, long or short, I did not know. I had never experienced the sensation. I had known what it was to come back to Gateshead when a child, after a long walk, to be scolded for looking cold or gloomy. And later, what it was to come back from church to Lowood to long for a plenteous meal and a good fire, and to be unable to get either. Neither of these returnings was very pleasant or desirable. No magnet drew me to a given point, increasing in its strength of attraction the nearer I came. The return to Thornfield was yet to be tried. 
My journey seemed tedious, very tedious. 50 miles one day, a night spent at an inn, 50 miles the next day. During the first 12 hours, I thought of Mrs. Reed in her last moments. I saw her disfigured and discoloured face and heard her strangely altered voice. I mused on the funeral day, the coffin, the hearse, the black train of tenants and servants, few was the number of relatives, the gaping vault, the silent church, the solemn service. Then I thought of Eliza and Georgiana. I beheld one the cynosure of a ballroom, the other the inmate of a convent cell, and I dwelt on and analysed their separate peculiarities of person and character. The evening arrival at the great town of scattered these thoughts. Night gave them quite another turn. Laid down on my traveller's bed, I left reminiscence for anticipation. I was going back to Thornfield, but how long was I to stay there? Not long, of that I was sure. I had heard from Mrs. Fairfax in the interim of my absence. The party at the hall was dispersed. Mr. Rochester had left for London three weeks ago, but he was then expected to return in a fortnight. Mrs. Fairfax surmised that he was gone to make arrangements for his wedding, as he had talked of purchasing a new carriage. She said the idea of his marrying Miss Ingram still seemed strange to her. But from what everybody said, and from what she had herself seen, she could no longer doubt that the event would shortly take place. You would be strangely incredulous if you did doubt it, was my mental comment. I don't doubt it. The question followed, where was I to go? I dreamt of Miss Ingram all the night. In a vivid morning dream, I saw her closing the gates of Thornfield against me and pointing me out another road. And Mr. Rochester looked on with his arms folded, smiling sardonically, as it seemed, at both her and me. I had not notified to Mrs. Fairfax the exact day of my return, for I did not wish either car or carriage to meet me at Millcote. I proposed to walk the distance quietly by myself. And very quietly, after leaving my box in the ostler's care, did I slip away from the George Inn, about six o'clock of a June evening, and take the old road to Thornfield, a road which lay chiefly through fields and was now little frequented. It was not a bright or splendid summer evening, though fair and soft. The haymakers were at work all along the road, and the sky, though far from cloudless, was such as promised well for the future. Its blue, where blue was visible, was mild and settled, and its cloud strata high and thin. The west, too, was warm. No watery gleam chilled it. It seemed as if there was a fire lit an altar burning behind its screen of marbled vapour, and out of apertures shone a golden redness. I felt glad as the road shortened before me, so glad that I stopped once to ask myself what that joy meant, and to remind reason that it was not to my home I was going, or to a permanent resting place, or to a place where fond friends looked out for me and waited my arrival. Mrs. Fairfax will smile you a calm welcome to be sure said I, and little Adele will clap her hands and jump to see you, but you know very well you are thinking of another than they, and that he is not thinking of you. But what is so headstrong as youth? What so blind as inexperience? These affirmed that it was pleasure enough to have the privilege of again looking on Mr. Rochester, whether he looked on me or not, and they added, hasten, hasten, be with him while you may, but a few more days or weeks at most, and you are parted from him for ever. And then I strangled a newborn agony, a deformed thing which I could not persuade myself to own and rear, and ran on. They are making hay, too, in Thornfield Meadows, or rather the labourers are just quitting their work and returning home with their rakes on their shoulders now, at the hour I arrive. I have but a field or two to traverse, and then I shall cross the road and reach the gates. How full the hedges are of roses! But I have no time to gather any. I want to be at the house. I passed a tall briar, shooting leafy and flowery branches across the path. I see the narrow stile with stone steps, and I see Mr. Rochester sitting there, a book and a pencil in his hand. He is writing. 
Well, he is not a ghost, yet every nerve I have is unstrung. For a moment I am beyond my own mastery. What does it mean? I did not think I should tremble in this way when I saw him, or lose my voice, or the power of motion in his presence. I will go back as soon as I can stir. I need not make an absolute fool of myself. I know another way to the house. It does not signify if I knew twenty ways, for he has seen me. Hello, he cries, and he puts up his book and his pencil. There you are. Come on, if you please. I suppose I do come on, though in what fashion I know not, being scarcely cognizant of my movements, and solicitous only to appear calm, and, above all, to control the working muscles of my face, which I feel rebel insolently against my will, and struggle to express what I had resolved to conceal. But I have a veil. It is down. I may make shift yet to behave with decent composure. And this is Jane Eyre. Are you coming from Millcote and on foot? Yes, just one of your tricks, not to send for a carriage and come clattering over street and road like a common mortal, but to steal into the vicinage of your home along with twilight, just as if you were a dream or a shade. What the deuce have you done with yourself this last month? I have been with my aunt, sir, who is dead. A true Janian reply. Good angels be my guard. She comes from the other world, from the abode of people who are dead, and tells me so when she meets me alone here in the gloaming. If I dared, I'd touch you to see if you are substance or shadow, you elf. But I'd as soon offer to take hold of a blue ignis fatuous light in a marsh. Truant, truant, he added when he had paused an instant. Absent from me a whole month, and forgetting me quite, I'll be sworn. I knew there would be pleasure in meeting my master again, even though broken by the fear that he was so soon to cease to be my master, and by the knowledge that I was nothing to him. But there was ever in Mr. Rochester, so at least I thought, such a wealth of the power of communicating happiness, that to taste but of the crumbs he scattered to stray and stranger birds like me, was to feast genially. His last words were balm. They seemed to imply that it imported something to him whether I forgot him or not. And he had spoken of Thornfield as my home, would that it were my home. He did not leave the stile, and I hardly liked to ask to go by. I inquired soon if he had not been to London. Yes, I suppose you found that out by second sight. Mrs. Fairfax told me in a letter. And did she inform you what I went to do? Oh, yes, sir. Everybody knew your errand. You must see the carriage, Jane, and tell me if you don't think it will suit Mrs. Rochester exactly, and whether she won't look like Queen Bodicea leaning back against those purple cushions. I wish, Jane, I were a trifle better adapted to match with her externally. Tell me now, fairy, as you are, can't you give me a charm or a filter or something of that sort to make me a handsome man? It would be past the power of magic, sir. And, in thought, I added, a loving eye is all the charm needed. To such you are handsome enough, or rather your sternness has a power beyond beauty. Mr. Rochester had sometimes read my unspoken thoughts with an acumen to me, incomprehensible. In the present instance, he took no notice of my abrupt vocal response, but he smiled at me with a certain smile he had of his own, and which he used but on rare occasions. He seemed to think it too good for common purposes. It was the real sunshine of feeling. He shed it over me now. Pass, Janet, said he, making room for me to cross the stile. Go up home and stay your weary little wandering feet at a friend's threshold. All I had now to do was to obey him in silence. No need for me to colloquize further. I got over the stile without a word and meant to leave him calmly. An impulse held me fast. A force turned me round. I said, or something in me said for me, and in spite of me. Thank you, Mr. Rochester, for your great kindness. I am strangely glad to get back again to you, and wherever you are is my home my only home. I walked on so fast that even he could hardly have overtaken me had he tried. Little Adele was half wild with delight when she saw me. 
Mrs. Fairfax received me with her usual plain friendliness. Leah smiled, and even Sophie bid me bonsoir with glee. This was very pleasant. There is no happiness like that of being loved by your fellow creatures and feeling that your presence is an addition to their comfort. I that evening shut my eyes resolutely against the future. I stopped my ears against the voice that kept warning me of near separation and coming grief. When tea was over and Mrs. Fairfax had taken her knitting and I had assumed a low seat near her and Adele kneeling on the carpet had nestled close up to me and a sense of mutual affection seemed to surround us with a ring of golden peace. I uttered a silent prayer that we might not be parted far or soon. But when, as we thus sat, Mr. Rochester entered, unannounced, and looking at us, seemed to take pleasure in the spectacle of a group so amicable, when he said he supposed the old lady was all right now that she had got her adopted daughter back again, and added that he saw Adele was prête à croquer sa petite maman anglaise. I half ventured to hope that he would, even after his marriage, keep us together somewhere under the shelter of his protection and not quite exiled from the sunshine of his presence. A fortnight of dubious calm succeeded my return to Thornfield Hall. Nothing was said of the master's marriage, and I saw no preparation going on for such an event. Almost every day I asked Mrs. Fairfax if she had yet heard anything decided. Her answer was always in the negative. Once she said she had actually put the question to Mr. Rochester as to when he was going to bring his bride home. But he had answered her only by a joke and one of his queer looks, and she could not tell what to make of him. One thing specially surprised me, and that was there were no journeyings backward and forward, no visits to Ingram Park, to be sure it was 20 miles off, on the borders of another county. But what was that distance to an ardent lover? To so practised and indefatigable a horseman as Mr. Rochester, it would be but a morning's ride. I began to cherish hopes I had no right to conceive that the match was broken off, that rumour had been mistaken, that one or both parties had changed their minds. I used to look at my master's face to see if it were sad or fierce, but I could not remember the time when it had been so uniformly clear of clouds or evil feelings. If, in the moments I and my pupil spent with him, I lacked spirits and sank into inevitable dejection, he became even gay. Never had he called me more frequently to his presence, never been kinder to me when there, and alas, never had I loved him so well. Chapter 23 A splendid midsummer shone over England, skies so pure, suns so radiant, as were then seen in long succession, seldom favour even singly, our wave-girt land. It was as if a band of Italian days had come from the south, like a flock of glorious passenger birds, and lighted to rest them on the cliffs of Albion. The hay was all got in, the fields round Thornfield were green and shorn, the roads white and baked, the trees were in their dark prime, hedge and wood, full-leaved and deeply tinted, contrasted well with the sunny hue of the cleared meadows between. On Midsummer Eve, Adele, weary with gathering wild strawberries in Hay Lane half the day, had gone to bed with the sun. I watched her drop asleep, and when I left her, I sought the garden. It was now the sweetest hour of the twenty-four, day its fervid fires had wasted, and dew fell cool on panting plain and scorched summit where the sun had gone down in simple state, pure of the pomp of clouds, spread a solemn purple, burning with the light of red jewel and furnace flame at one point on one hill peak and extending high and wide, soft and still softer, over half heaven. The east had its own charm or fine deep blue and its own modest gem, a rising and solitary star. Soon it would boast the moon but she was yet beneath the horizon. I walked a while on the pavement, but a subtle, well-known scent, that of a cigar, stole from some window. I saw the library casement open a handbreadth. I knew I might be watched thence, so I went apart into the orchard. 
No nook in the grounds more sheltered and more Eden-like. It was full of trees. It bloomed with flowers. A very high wall shut it out from the court on one side. On the other, a beach avenue screened it from the lawn. At the bottom was a sunk fence, its sole separation from lonely fields. A winding walk, bordered with laurels and terminating in a giant horse chestnut, circled at the base by a seat, led down to the fence. Here one could wander unseen. While such honeydew fell, such silence reigned, such gloaming gathered, I felt as if I could haunt such shade forever. But in threading the flower and fruit parterres at the upper part of the enclosure, enticed there by the light the now rising moon cast on this more open quarter, my step is stayed. Not by sound, not by sight, but once more by a warning fragrance. Sweet briar and southernwood, jasmine, pink, and rose have long been yielding their evening sacrifice of incense. This new scent is neither of shrub nor flower. It is, I know it well. It is Mr. Rochester's cigar. I look round and I listen. I see trees laden with ripening fruit. I hear a nightingale warbling in a wood half a mile off. No moving form is visible, no coming step audible. But that perfume increases. I must flee. I make for the wicket leading to the shrubbery, and I see Mr. Rochester entering. I step aside into the ivy recess. He will not stay long. He will soon return whence he came, and if I sit still, he will never see me. But no, eventide is as pleasant to him as to me, and this antique garden as attractive. And he strolls on, now lifting the gooseberry tree branches to look at the fruit, large as plums, with which they are laden. Now taking a ripe cherry from the wall, now stooping towards a knot of flowers, either to inhale their fragrance or to admire the dew beads on their petals. A great moth goes humming by me. It alights on a plant at Mr. Rochester's foot. He sees it and bends to examine it. Now, he has his back towards me, thought I. And he is occupied too. Perhaps, if I walk softly, I can slip away unnoticed. I trode on an edging of turf that the crackle of the pebbly gravel might not betray me. He was standing among the beds at a yard or two, distant from where I had to pass. The moth apparently engaged him. I shall get by very well, I meditated. As I crossed his shadow, thrown long over the garden by the moon, not yet risen high, he said quietly without turning. Jane, come and look at this fellow. I had made no noise. He had not eyes behind. Could his shadow feel? I started at first, and then I approached him. Look at his wings, said he. He reminds me rather of a West Indian insect. One does not often see so large and gay a night rover in England. There, he has flown. The moth roamed away. I was sheepishly retreating also, but Mr. Rochester followed me, and when we reached the wicket, he said, Turn back. On so lovely a night, it is a shame to sit in the house, and surely no one can wish to go to bed while sunset is thus at meeting with moonrise. It is one of my faults, that though my tongue is sometimes prompt enough at an answer, there are times when it sadly fails me in framing an excuse. And always the lapse occurs at some crisis, when a facile word or plausible pretext is specially wanted to get me out of painful embarrassment. I did not like to walk at this hour alone with Mr. Rochester in the shadowy orchard, but I could not find a reason to allege for leaving him. I followed with lagging step and thoughts busily bent on discovering a means of extrication, but he himself looked so composed and so grave also, I became ashamed of feeling any confusion. The evil, if evil existent or prospective there was, seemed to lie with me only. His mind was unconscious and quiet. Jane, he recommenced, as we entered the laurel walk and slowly strayed down in the direction of the sunk fence and the horse chestnut. Thornfield is a pleasant place in summer, is it not? Yes, sir. You must have become in some degree attached to the house. You who have an eye for natural beauties and a good deal of the organ of adhesiveness. 
I am attached to it indeed. And though I don't comprehend how it is, I perceive you have acquired a degree of regard for that foolish little child Adele too, and even for simple Dame Fairfax. Yes, sir, in different ways. I have an affection for both. And would be sorry to part with them? Yes. Pity, he said and sighed and paused. It is always the way of events in this life, he continued presently. No sooner have you got settled in a pleasant resting place than a voice calls out to you to rise and move on, for the hour of repose is expired. Must I move on, sir? I asked. Must I leave Thornfield? I believe you must, Jane. I am sorry, Janet, but I believe indeed you must. This was a blow, but I did not let it prostrate me. Well, sir, I shall be ready when the order to march comes. It is come now. I must give it tonight. Then you are going to be married, sir? Exactly. Precisely. With your usual acuteness, you have hit the nail straight on the head. Soon, sir. Very soon, my. That is, Miss Eyre. And you'll remember, Jane, the first time I, or rumour, plainly intimated to you that it was my intention to put my old bachelor's neck into the sacred noose to enter into the holy estate of matrimony, to take Miss Ingram to my bosom. In short, she's an extensive armful, but that's not to the point. One can't have too much of such a very excellent thing as my beautiful Blanche. Well, as I was saying, listen to me, Jane. You're not turning your head to look after more moths, are you? That was only a lady clock child, flying away home. I wish to remind you that it was you who first said to me, with that discretion I respect in you, with that foresight, prudence and humility which befit your responsible and dependent position, that in case I married Miss Ingram, both you and little Adele had better trot forthwith. I pass over the sort of slur conveyed in this suggestion on the character of my beloved. Indeed, when you are far away, Janet, I'll try to forget it. I shall notice only its wisdom, which is such that I have made it my law of action. Adele must go to school, and you, Miss Eyre, must get a new situation. Yes, sir, I will advertise immediately. And meantime, I suppose... I was going to say, I suppose I may stay here till I find another shelter to betake myself to. But I stopped, feeling it would not do to risk a long sentence for my voice was not quite under command. In about a month, I hope to be a bridegroom, continued Mr. Rochester, and in the interim, I shall myself look out for employment and an asylum for you. Thank you, sir, I am sorry to give... Oh, no need to apologise. I consider that when a dependent does her duty as well as you have done yours, she has a sort of claim upon her employer for any little assistance he can conveniently render her. Indeed, I have already through my future mother-in-law, heard of a place that I think will suit. It is to undertake the education of the five daughters of Mrs. Dionysius O'Gall of Bitternut Lodge, Connaught, Ireland. You'll like Ireland, I think. They're such warm-hearted people there, they say. It is a long way off, sir. No matter. A girl of your sense will not object to the voyage or the distance. Not the voyage, but the distance. And then the sea is a barrier. From what, Jane? From England and from Thornfield and... Well, from you, sir. I said this almost involuntarily, and with as little sanction of free will, my tears gushed out. I did not cry so as to be heard, however. I avoided sobbing. The thought of Mrs. O'Gall and Bitternut Lodge struck cold to my heart and colder the thought of all the brine and foam destined, as it seemed, to rush between me and the master at whose side I now walked, and coldest the remembrance of the wider ocean. Wealth cast, custom intervened between me and what I naturally and inevitably loved. It is a long way, I again said. It is, to be sure. And when you get to Bitternut Lodge, Connaught, Ireland, I shall never see you again, Jane. That's morally certain. I never go over to Ireland, not having myself much of a fancy for the country. We have been good friends, Jane. Have we not? Yes, sir. 
and when friends are on the eve of separation, they like to spend the little time that remains to them close to each other. Come, we'll talk over the voyage and the parting quietly half an hour or so, while the stars enter into their shining life up in heaven yonder. Here is the chestnut tree. Here is the bench at its old roots. Come, we will sit there in peace tonight, though we should never more be destined to sit there together, he seated me in himself. It is a long way to Ireland, Janet, and I am sorry to send my little friend on such weary travels. But if I can't do better, how is it to be helped? Are you anything akin to me, do you think, Jane? I could risk no sort of answer by this time. My heart was still. Because, he said, I sometimes have a queer feeling with regard to you, especially when you are near me, as now. It is as if I had a string somewhere under my left ribs, tightly and inextricably knotted to a similar string situated in the corresponding quarter of your little frame. And if that boisterous channel and 200 miles or so of land come broad between us, I am afraid that cord of communion will be snapped. And then I've a nervous notion I should take to bleeding inwardly. As for you, you'd forget me. That I never should, sir. You know, impossible to proceed. Jane, do you hear that nightingale singing in the wood? Listen. In listening, I sobbed convulsively, for I could repress what I endured no longer. I was obliged to yield, and I was shaken from head to foot with acute distress. When I did speak, it was only to express an impetuous wish that I had never been born or never come to Thornfield. Because you are sorry to leave it? The vehemence of emotion, stirred by grief and love within me, was claiming mastery and struggling for full sway and asserting a right to predominate, to overcome, to live, rise and reign at last. Yes, and to speak. I grieve to leave Thornfield. I love Thornfield. I love it because I have lived in it a full and delightful life, momentarily at least. I have not been trampled on. I have not been petrified. I have not been buried with inferior minds and excluded from every glimpse of communion with what is bright and energetic and high. I have talked, face to face, with what I reverence, with what I delight in, with an original, a vigorous, an expanded mind. I have known you, Mr. Rochester, and it strikes me with terror and anguish to feel I absolutely must be torn from you forever. I see the necessity of departure, and it is like looking on the necessity of death. Where do you see the necessity? He asked suddenly. Where? You, sir, have placed it before me. In what shape? in the shape of Miss Ingram, a noble and beautiful woman, your bride. My bride? What bride? I have no bride. But you will have. Yes, I will, I will, he set his teeth. Then I must go. You have said it yourself. No, you must stay. I swear it, and the oath shall be kept. I tell you I must go. I retorted, roused to something like passion. Do you think I can stay to become nothing to you? Do you think I am an automaton, a machine without feelings, and can bear to have my morsel of bread snatched from my lips and my drop of living water dashed from my cup? Do you think, because I am poor, obscure, plain, and little, I am soulless and heartless, you think wrong. I have as much soul as you and full as much heart. And if God had gifted me with some beauty and much wealth, I should have made it as hard for you to leave me, as it is now for me to leave you. I am not talking to you now through the medium of custom, conventionalities, nor even of mortal flesh. It is my spirit that addresses your spirit, just as if both had passed through the grave and we stood at God's feet, equal as we are. As we are repeated Mr. Rochester. So, he added, enclosing me in his arms, gathering me to his breast, pressing his lips on my lips. So, Jane. Yes, so, sir, I rejoined, 
and yet not so, for you are a married man, or as good as a married man, and wed to one inferior to you, to one with whom you have no sympathy, whom I do not believe you truly love, for I have seen and heard you sneer at her. I would scorn such a union, therefore I am better than you. Let me go. Where, Jane? To Ireland. Yes, to Ireland. I have spoken my mind and can go anywhere now. Jane, be still. Don't struggle so, like a wild, frantic bird that is rending its own plumage in its desperation. I am no bird, and no net ensnares me. I am a free human being with an independent will, which I now exert to leave you. Another effort set me at liberty, and I stood erect before him. And your will shall decide your destiny, he said. I offer you my hand, my heart, and a share of all my possessions. You play a farce, which I merely laugh at. I ask you to pass through life at my side, to be my second self and best earthly companion. For that fate you have already made your choice and must abide by it. Jane, be still a few moments. You are overexcited. I will be still too. A waft of wind came sweeping down the laurel walk and trembled through the boughs of the chestnut. It wandered away, away, to an indefinite distance. It died. The nightingale's song was then the only voice of the hour. In listening to it, I again wept. Mr. Rochester sat quiet, looking at me gently and seriously. Some time passed before he spoke. He at last said, Come to my side, Jane, and let us explain and understand one another. I will never again come to your side. I am torn away now and cannot return. But Jane, I summon you as my wife. It is you only I intend to marry. I was silent. I thought he mocked me. Come, Jane. Come hither. Your bride stands between us. He rose and with a stride reached me. My bride is here, he said again, drawing me to him, because my equal is here and my likeness. Jane, will you marry me? Still I did not answer and still I writhed myself from his grasp, for I was still incredulous. Do you doubt me, Jane? Entirely. You have no faith in me. Not a whit. Am I a liar in your eyes? He asked passionately. Little skeptic, you shall be convinced. What love have I for Miss Ingram? None. And that you know. What love has she for me? None. As I have taken pains to prove, I caused a rumour to reach her that my fortune was not a third of what was supposed. And after that, I presented myself to see the result. It was coldness, both from her and her mother. I would not, I could not, marry Miss Ingram. You, you strange, you almost unearthly thing, I love as my own flesh. You, poor and obscure, and small and plain as you are, I entreat to accept me as a husband. What me? I ejaculated, beginning in his earnestness, and especially in his incivility, to credit his sincerity. Me who have not a friend in the world, but you, if you are my friend, not a shilling, but what you have given me. You, Jane, I must have you for my own, entirely my own. Will you be mine? Say yes, quickly. Mr. Rochester, let me look at your face. Turn to the moonlight. Why? Because I want to read your countenance. Turn. There. You will find it scarcely more legible than a crumpled, scratched page. Read on. Only make haste, for I suffer. His face was very much agitated and very much flushed, and there were strong workings in the features and strange gleams in the eyes. Oh, Jane, you torture me, he exclaimed, with that searching and yet faithful and generous look. You torture me. How can I do that? If you are true and your offer real, my only feelings to you must be gratitude and devotion. They cannot torture. Gratitude, he ejaculated, 
and added wildly, Jane, accept me quickly. Say, Edward, give me my name. Edward, I will marry you. Are you in earnest? Do you truly love me? Do you sincerely wish me to be your wife? I do. And if an oath is necessary to satisfy you, I swear it. Then, sir, I will marry you. Edward, my little wife. Dear Edward, come to me. Come to me entirely now, said he, and added in his deepest tone, speaking in my ear as his cheek was laid on mine. Make my happiness. I will make yours. God pardon me, he subjoined ere long, and man meddle not with me. I have her and will hold her. There is no one to meddle, sir. I have no kindred to interfere. No, that is the best of it, he said. And if I had loved him less, I should have thought his accent and look of exultation savage. But, sitting by him, roused from the nightmare of parting, cool to the paradise of union, I thought only of the bliss given me to drink in so abundant a flow. Again and again he said, Are you happy, Jane? And again and again I answered, Yes. After which he murmured, It will atone. It will atone. Have I not found her friendless and cold and comfortless? Will I not guard and cherish and solace her? Is there not love in my heart and constancy in my resolves? It will expiate at God's tribunal. I know my maker sanctions what I do. For the world's judgment, I wash my hands thereof. For man's opinion, I defy it. But what had befallen the night? The moon was not yet set, and we were all in shadow. I could scarcely see my master's face near as I was. And what ailed the chestnut tree? It writhed and groaned, while wind roared in the laurel walk and came sweeping over us. We must go in, said Mr. Rochester. The weather changes. I could have sat with thee till morning, Jane. And so, thought I, could I with you. I should have said so perhaps, but a livid, vivid spark leapt out of a cloud at which I was looking, and there was a crack, a crash, and a close rattling peal, and I thought only of hiding my dazzled eyes against Mr. Rochester's shoulder. The rain rushed down. He hurried me up the walk, through the grounds, and into the house, but we were quite wet before we could pass the threshold. He was taking off my shawl in the hall and shaking the water out of my loosened hair when Mrs. Fairfax emerged from her room. I did not observe her at first, nor did Mr. Rochester. The lamp was lit. The clock was on the stroke of twelve. Hasten to take off your wet things, said he. And before you go, good night, good night, my darling. He kissed me repeatedly. When I looked up on leaving his arms, there stood the widow, pale, grave, and amazed. I only smiled at her and ran upstairs. Explanation will do for another time, thought I. Still, when I reached my chamber, I felt a pang at the idea she should even temporarily misconstrue what she had seen. But joy soon effaced every other feeling, and loud as the wind blew, near and deep as the thunder crashed, fierce and frequent as the lightning gleamed, cataract-like as the rain fell during a storm of two hours' duration, I experienced no fear and little awe. Mr. Rochester came thrice to my door in the course of it to ask if I was safe and tranquil. And that was comfort. That was strength for anything. Before I left my bed in the morning, little Adele came running in to tell me that the great horse chestnut at the bottom of the orchard had been struck by lightning in the night and half of it split away. Chapter 24 As I rose and dressed, I thought over what had happened and wondered if it were a dream. I could not be certain of the reality till I had seen Mr. Rochester again and heard him renew his words of love and promise. While arranging my hair, I looked at my face in the glass and felt it was no longer plain. There was hope in its aspect and life in its colour, and my eyes seemed as if they had beheld the fount of fruition and borrowed beams from the lustrous ripple. I had often been unwilling to look at my master because I feared he could not be pleased at my look, but I was sure I might lift my face to his now and not cool his affection by its expression. 
I took a plain but clean and light summer dress from my drawer and put it on. It seemed no attire had ever so well become me, because none had I ever worn in so blissful a mood. I was not surprised when I ran down into the hall to see that a brilliant June morning had succeeded to the tempest of the night, and to feel through the open glass door the breathing of a fresh and fragrant breeze. Nature must be gladsome when I was so happy. A beggar woman and her little boy, pale, ragged objects both, were coming up the walk, and I ran down and gave them all the money I happened to have in my purse. Some three or four shillings, good or bad, they must partake of my jubilee. The rooks cawed, and blither birds sang, but nothing was so merry or so musical as my own rejoicing heart. Mrs. Fairfax surprised me by looking out of the window with a sad countenance and saying gravely, Miss Eyre, will you come to breakfast? During the meal she was quiet and cool, but I could not undeceive her then. I must wait for my master to give explanations, and so must she. I ate what I could and then I hastened upstairs. I met Adele leaving the schoolroom. Where are you going? It is time for lessons. Mr. Rochester has sent me away to the nursery. Where is he? In there, pointing to the apartment she had left. And I went in, and there he stood. Come and bid me good morning, said he. I gladly advanced, and it was not merely a cold word now, or even a shake of the hand that I received, but an embrace and a kiss. It seemed natural. It seemed genial to be so well loved, so caressed by him. Jane, you look blooming, and smiling, and pretty, said he. Truly pretty this morning. Is this my pale little elf? Is this my mustard seed? This little sunny-faced girl with the dimpled cheek and rosy lips, the satin-smooth hazel hair, and the radiant hazel eyes. I had green eyes, reader, but you must excuse the mistake. For him they were new-dyed, I suppose. It is Jane Eyre, sir. Soon to be Jane Rochester, he added. In four weeks, Janet, not a day more. Do you hear that? I did, and I could not quite comprehend it. It made me giddy. The feeling the announcement sent through me was something stronger than was consistent with joy, something that smote and stunned. It was, I think, almost fear. You blushed, and now you are white, Jane. What is that for? Because you gave me a new name, Jane Rochester, and it seems so strange. Yes, Mrs. Rochester, said he. Young Mrs. Rochester, Fairfax Rochester's girl bride. It can never be, sir. It does not sound likely. Human beings never enjoy complete happiness in this world. I was not born for a different destiny to the rest of my species. To imagine such a lot befalling me is a fairy tale, a daydream. Which I can and will realize. I shall begin today. This morning I wrote to my banker in London to send me certain jewels he has in his keeping heirlooms for the ladies of Thornfield. In a day or two, I hope to pour them into your lap. For every privilege, every attention shall be yours that I would accord a peer's daughter, if about to marry her. Oh, sir, never rain jewels. I don't like to hear them spoken of. Jewels for Jane Eyre sounds unnatural and strange. I would rather not have them. I will myself put the diamond chain round your neck and the circlet on your forehead, which it will become, for nature, at least, has stamped her patent of nobility on this brow, Jane. And I will clasp the bracelets on these fine wrists and load these fairy-like fingers with rings. No, no, sir. Think of other subjects, and speak of other things, and in another strain. Don't address me as if I were a beauty. I am your plain, Quakerish governess. You are a beauty in my eyes, and a beauty just after the desire of my heart, delicate and aerial. Puny and insignificant, you mean. You are dreaming, sir. Or you are sneering. For God's sake, don't be ironical. I will make the world acknowledge you a beauty, too. 
he went on, while I really became uneasy at the strain he had adopted, because I felt he was either deluding himself or trying to delude me. I will attire my Jane in satin and lace, and she shall have roses in her hair, and I will cover the head I love best with a priceless veil. And then you won't know me, sir, and I shall not be your Jane Eyre any longer but an ape in a harlequin's jacket, a jay in borrowed plumes. I would as soon see you, Mr. Rochester, tricked out in stage trappings as myself clad in a court lady's robe, and I don't call you handsome, sir, though I love you most dearly, far too dearly to flatter you. Don't flatter me. He pursued his theme, however, without noticing my deprecation. This very day I shall take you in the carriage to Millcote, and you must choose some dresses for yourself. I told you we shall be married in four weeks. The wedding is to take place quietly in the church down below yonder, and then I shall waft you away at once to town. After a brief stay there, I shall bear my treasure to regions nearer the sun, to French vineyards and Italian plains, and she shall see whatever is famous in old story and in modern record. She shall taste, too, of the life of cities and she shall learn to value herself by just comparison with others. Shall I travel? And with you, sir. You shall sojourn at Paris, Rome, and Naples, at Florence, Venice, and Vienna. All the ground I have wandered over shall be re-trodden by you. Wherever I stamped my hoof, your sylph's foot shall step also. Ten years since I flew through Europe half mad, with disgust, hate, and rage as my companions, now I shall revisit it healed and cleansed with a very angel as my comforter. I laughed at him as he said this. I am not an angel, I asserted, and I will not be one till I die. I will be myself. Mr. Rochester, you must neither expect nor exact anything celestial of me, for you will not get it, any more than I shall get it of you, which I do not at all anticipate. What do you anticipate of me? For a little while you will perhaps be as you are now, a very little while, and then you will turn cool, and then you will be capricious, and then you will be stern, and I shall have much ado to please you. But when you get well used to me, you will perhaps like me again. Like me, I say, not love me. I suppose your love will effervesce in six months, or less. I have observed in books written by men that period assigned as the farthest to which a husband's ardour extends. Yet, after all, as a friend and companion, I hope never to become quite distasteful to my dear master. Distasteful, and like you again. I think I shall like you again, and yet again, and I will make you confess I do not only like, but love you, with truth, fervour, constancy. Yet are you not capricious, sir? To women who please me only by their faces, I am the very devil when I find out they have neither souls nor hearts, when they open to me a perspective of flatness, triviality, and perhaps imbecility, coarseness, and ill temper, but to the clear eye and eloquent tongue, to the soul made of fire, and the character that bends but does not break, at once supple and stable, tractable and consistent, I am ever tender and true. Had you ever experience of such a character, sir? Did you ever love such an one? I love it now. But before me, if I indeed in any respect come up to your difficult standard, I never met your likeness. Jane, you please me, and you master me, you seem to submit, and I like the sense of pliancy you impart, and while I am twining the soft, silken skein round my finger. It sends a thrill up my arm to my heart. I am influenced, conquered, and the influence is sweeter than I can express, and the conquest I undergo has a witchery beyond any triumph I can win. Why do you smile, Jane? What does that inexplicable, that uncanny turn of countenance mean? I was thinking, sir, you will excuse the idea, it was involuntary. I was thinking of Hercules and Samson with their charmers. You were, you little elfish. Hush, sir. You don't talk very wisely just now. 
any more than those gentlemen acted very wisely. However, had they been married, they would no doubt by their severity as husbands have made up for their softness as suitors. And so will you, I fear. I wonder how you will answer me a year hence, should I ask a favour it does not suit your convenience or pleasure to grant. Ask me something now, Janet. The least thing, I desire to be entreated. Indeed I will, sir. I have my petition all ready. Speak. But if you look up and smile with that countenance, I shall swear concession before I know to what, and that will make a fool of me. Not at all, sir. I ask only this. Don't send for the jewels, and don't crown me with roses. You might as well put a border of gold lace round that plain pocket handkerchief you have there. I might as well gild refined gold. I know it. Your request is granted, then, for the time. I will remand the order I dispatched to my banker, but you have not yet asked for anything. You have prayed a gift to be withdrawn. Try again. Well then, sir, have the goodness to gratify my curiosity, which is much piqued on one point. He looked disturbed. What? What? He said hastily. Curiosity is a dangerous petition. It is well I have not taken a vow to accord every request. But there can be no danger in complying with this, sir. Utter it, Jane. But I wish that instead of a mere inquiry into perhaps a secret, it was a wish for half my estate. Now, King Ahasuerus, what do I want with half your estate? Do you think I am a Jew usurer, seeking good investment in land? I would much rather have all your confidence. You will not exclude me from your confidence if you admit me to your heart? You are welcome to all my confidence that is worth having, Jane. But for God's sake, don't desire a useless burden. Don't long for poison. Don't turn out a downright eve on my hands. Why not, sir? You have just been telling me how much you like to be conquered and how pleasant over-persuasion is to you. Don't you think I had better take advantage of the confession and begin and coax and entreat, even cry and be sulky if necessary, for the sake of a mere essay of my power? I dare you to any such experiment. Encroach, presume, and the game is up. Is it, sir? You soon give in. How stern you look now. Your eyebrows have become as thick as my finger, and your forehead resembles what, in some very astonishing poetry, I once saw styled a blue-piled thunderloft. That will be your married look, sir, I suppose. If that will be your married look, I, as a Christian, will soon give up the notion of consorting with a mere sprite or salamander. But what had you to ask, thing? Out with it. There, you are less than civil now and I like rudeness a great deal better than flattery. I had rather be a thing than an angel. This is what I have to ask. Why did you take such pains to make me believe you wished to marry Miss Ingram? Is that all? Thank God it is no worse. And now he unknit his black brows, looked down, smiling at me, and stroked my hair, as if well pleased at seeing a danger averted. I think I may confess, he continued even although I should make you a little indignant, Jane. And I have seen what a fire spirit you can be when you are indignant. You glowed in the cool moonlight last night when you mutinied against fate and claimed your rank as my equal. Janet, by the by, it was you who made me the offer. Of course I did. But to the point, if you please, sir. Miss Ingram. Well, I feigned courtship of Miss Ingram because I wished to render you as madly in love with me as I was with you. And I knew jealousy would be the best ally I could call in for the furtherance of that end. Excellent. Now you are small, not one whit bigger than the end of my little finger. It was a burning shame and a scandalous disgrace to act in that way. Did you think nothing of Miss Ingram's feelings, sir? Her feelings are concentrated in one pride, and that needs humbling. Were you jealous, Jane? Never mind, Mr. Rochester. It is in no way interesting to you to know that. Answer me truly once more. Do you think Miss Ingram will not suffer from your dishonest coquetry? Won't she feel forsaken and deserted? Impossible. 
when I told you how she, on the contrary, deserted me. The idea of my insolvency cooled, or rather extinguished, her flame in a moment. You have a curious designing mind, Mr. Rochester. I am afraid your principles on some points are eccentric. My principles were never trained, Jane. They may have grown a little awry for want of attention. Once again, seriously, may I enjoy the great good that has been vouchsafed to me without fearing that anyone else is suffering the bitter pain I myself felt a while ago. That you may, my good little girl, there is not another being in the world has the same pure love for me as yourself, for I lay that pleasant unction to my soul, Jane, a belief in your affection. I turned my lips to the hand that lay on my shoulder. I loved him very much, more than I could trust myself to say, more than words had power to express. Ask something more, he said presently. It is my delight to be entreated and to yield. I was again ready with my request. Communicate your intentions to Mrs. Fairfax, sir. She saw me with you last night in the hall, and she was shocked. Give her some explanation before I see her again. It pains me to be misjudged by so good a woman. Go to your room and put on your bonnet, he replied. I mean you to accompany me to Mill Coat this morning, and while you prepare for the drive, I will enlighten the old lady's understanding. Did she think, Janet, you had given the world for love and considered it well lost? I believe she thought I had forgotten my station and yours, sir. Station, station, your station is in my heart and on the necks of those who would insult you now or hereafter. Go. I was soon dressed and when I heard Mr. Rochester quit Mrs. Fairfax's parlour, I hurried down to it. The old lady had been reading her morning portion of scripture, the lesson for the day, her Bible lay open before her, and her spectacles were upon it. Her occupation, suspended by Mr. Rochester's announcement, seemed now forgotten. Her eyes, fixed on the blank wall opposite, expressed the surprise of a quiet mind stirred by unwanted tidings. Seeing me, she roused herself. She made a sort of effort to smile and framed a few words of congratulation, but the smile expired and the sentence was abandoned unfinished. She put up her spectacles, shut the Bible, and pushed her chair back from the table. I feel so astonished, she began. I hardly know what to say to you, Miss Eyre. I have surely not been dreaming, have I? Sometimes I half fall asleep when I am sitting alone and fancy things that have never happened. It has seemed to me more than once when I have been in a doze that my dear husband, who died fifteen years since, has come in and sat down beside me, and that I have even heard him call me by my name, Alice, as he used to do. Now, can you tell me whether it is actually true that Mr. Rochester has asked you to marry him? Don't laugh at me, but I really thought he came in here five minutes ago and said that in a month you would be his wife. He has said the same thing to me, I replied. He has. Do you believe him? Have you accepted him? Yes, she looked at me bewildered. I could never have thought it. He is a proud man. All the Rochesters were proud, and his father at least liked money. He too has always been called careful. He means to marry you. He tells me so. She surveyed my whole person. In her eyes, I read that they had their found no charm powerful enough to solve the enigma. It passes me, she continued, but no doubt it is true since you say so. How it will answer, I cannot tell. I really don't know. Equality of position and fortune is often advisable in such cases, and there are twenty years of difference in your ages. He might almost be your father. No, indeed, Mrs. Fairfax, exclaimed I, nettled. He is nothing like my father. No one who saw us together would suppose it for an instant. Mr. Rochester looks as young and is as young as some men at five and twenty. Is it really for love he is going to marry you? She asked. I was so hurt by her coldness and scepticism that the tears rose to my eyes. I am sorry to grieve you, pursued the widow. 
but you are so young and so little acquainted with men, I wish to put you on your guard. It is an old saying that all is not gold that glitters. And in this case, I do fear there will be something found to be different to what either you or I expect. Why? Am I a monster? I said. Is it impossible that Mr. Rochester should have a sincere affection for me? No, you are very well, and much improved of late, and Mr. Rochester, I dare say, is fond of you. I have always noticed that you were a sort of pet of his. There are times when, for your sake, I have been a little uneasy at his marked preference, and have wished to put you on your guard, but I did not like to suggest even the possibility of wrong. I knew such an idea would shock, perhaps offend you, and you were so discreet and so thoroughly modest and sensible, I hoped you might be trusted to protect yourself. Last night I cannot tell you what I suffered when I sought all over the house and could find you nowhere, nor the master either. And then, at twelve o'clock, saw you come in with him. Well, never mind that now, I interrupted impatiently. It is enough that all was right. I hope all will be right in the end, she said, but believe me, you cannot be too careful. Try and keep Mr. Rochester at a distance. Distrust yourself as well as him. Gentlemen in his station are not accustomed to marry their governesses. I was growing truly irritated. Happily, Adele ran in. Let me go, let me go to Millcote too, she cried. Mr. Rochester won't, though there is so much room in the new carriage. Beg him to let me go, mademoiselle. That I will, Adele. And I hastened away with her, glad to quit my gloomy monitress. The carriage was ready. They were bringing it round to the front, and my master was pacing the pavement, Pilot following him backwards and forwards. Adele may accompany us, may she not, sir? I told her no. I'll have no brats. I'll have only you. Do let her go, Mr. Rochester, if you please. It would be better. Not it. She will be a restraint. He was quite peremptory, both in look and voice. The chill of Mrs. Fairfax's warnings and the damp of her doubts were upon me. Something of unsubstantiality and uncertainty had beset my hopes. I half lost the sense of power over him. I was about mechanically to obey him without further remonstrance, but as he helped me into the carriage, he looked at my face. What is the matter? he asked. All the sunshine is gone. Do you really wish the bairn to go? Will it annoy you if she is left behind? I would far rather she went, sir. Then off for your bonnet and back like a flash of lightning, cried he to Adele. She obeyed him with what speed she might. After all, a single morning's interruption will not matter much, said he, when I mean shortly to claim you, your thoughts, conversation, and company, for life. Adele, when lifted in, commenced kissing me by way of expressing her gratitude for my intercession. She was instantly stowed away into a corner on the other side of him. She then peeped round to where I sat. So stern a neighbour was too restrictive. To him, in his present fractious mood, she dared whisper no observations, nor ask of him any information. Let her come to me, I entreated. She will perhaps trouble you, sir. There is plenty of room on this side. He handed her over as if she had been a lapdog. I'll send her to school yet, he said, but now he was smiling. Adele heard him and asked if she was to go to school, sans mademoiselle. Yes, he replied, absolutely sans mademoiselle, for I am to take mademoiselle to the moon, and there I shall seek a cave in one of the white valleys among the volcano tops, and mademoiselle shall live with me there and only me. She will have nothing to eat. You will starve her, observed Adele. I shall gather manna for her morning and night. The plains and hillsides in the moon are bleached with manna, Adele. Yeah, she will want to warm herself. What will she do for a fire? Fire rises out of the lunar mountains. When she is cold, I'll carry her up to a peak and lay her down on the edge of a crater. Oh, Kelly sera mal, peu comfortable. And her clothes, they will wear out. How can she get new ones? Mr. Rochester professed to be puzzled. Hem, said he. What would you do, Adele? Cudgel your brains for an expedient. 
How would a white or a pink cloud answer for a gown, do you think? And one could cut a pretty enough scarf out of a rainbow. She is far better as she is, concluded Adele, after musing some time. Besides, she would get tired of living with only you in the moon. If I were Mademoiselle, I would never consent to go with you. She has consented. She has pledged her word. But you can't get her there. There is no road to the moon. It is all air, and neither you nor she can fly. Adele, look at that field. We were now outside Thornfield Gates and bowling lightly along the smooth road to Millcote, where the dust was well laid by the thunderstorm, and where the low hedges and lofty timber trees on each side glistened green and rain refreshed. In that field, Adele, I was walking late one evening about a fortnight since, the evening of the day you helped me to make hay in the orchard meadows, and, as I was tired with raking swaths, I sat down to rest me on a stile. And there I took out a little book and a pencil and began to write about a misfortune that befell me long ago and a wish I had for happy days to come. I was writing away very fast, though daylight was fading from the leaf, when something came up the path and stopped two yards off me. I looked at it. It was a little thing with a veil of gossamer on its head. I beckoned it to come near me. It stood soon at my knee. I never spoke to it, and it never spoke to me in words but I read its eyes, and it read mine, and our speechless colloquy was to this effect. It was a fairy, and come from Elfland, it said, and its errand was to make me happy. I must go with it out of the common world to a lonely place, such as the moon, for instance, and it nodded its head towards her horn, rising over Hayhill. It told me of the alabaster cave and silver vale where we might live, I said I should like to go, but reminded it, as you did me, that I had no wings to fly. Oh, returned the fairy, that does not signify. Here is a talisman will remove all difficulties. And she held out a pretty gold ring. Put it, she said, on the fourth finger of my left hand, and I am yours, and you are mine, and we shall leave earth and make our own heaven yonder. She nodded again at the moon. The ring, Adele, is in my breeches pocket, under the disguise of a sovereign, but I mean soon to change it to a ring again. But what has Mademoiselle to do with it? I don't care for the fairy. You said it was Mademoiselle you would take to the moon. Mademoiselle is a fairy, he said, whispering mysteriously. Whereupon I told her not to mind his badinage, and she, on her part, evinced a fund of genuine French scepticism, denominating Mr. Rochester un vrai menteur and assuring him that she made no account whatever of his comtesse de fées and that, du reste, il n'y avait pas de fées et quand même il y en avait. She was sure they would never appear to him nor ever give him rings or offer to live with him in the moon. The hour spent at Millcote was a somewhat harassing one to me. Mr. Rochester obliged me to go to a certain silk warehouse. There I was ordered to choose half a dozen dresses. I hated the business. I begged leave to defer it. No, it should be gone through with now. By dint of entreaties expressed in energetic whispers, I reduced the half dozen to two. These, however, he vowed he would select himself. With anxiety, I watched his eye rove over the gay stores he fixed on a rich silk of the most brilliant amethyst dye and a superb pink satin. I told him in a new series of whispers that he might as well buy me a gold gown and a silver bonnet at once. I should certainly never venture to wear his choice. With infinite difficulty, for he was stubborn as a stone, I persuaded him to make an exchange in favour of a sober black satin and pearl grey silk. It might pass for the present, he said, but he would yet see me glittering like a parterre. Glad was I to get him out of the silk warehouse and then out of a jeweller's shop. The more he bought me, the more my cheek burned with a sense of annoyance and degradation. As we re-entered the carriage and I sat back feverish and fagged, I remembered what, in the hurry of events, dark and bright, I had wholly forgotten the letter of my uncle John Eyre to Mrs. Reed. 
his intention to adopt me and make me his legatee. It would indeed be a relief, I thought, if I had ever so small an independency. I never can bear being dressed like a doll by Mr. Rochester or sitting like a second Danai with the golden shower falling daily round me. I will write to Madeira the moment I get home and tell my Uncle John I am going to be married, and to whom. If I had but a prospect of one day bringing Mr. Rochester an accession of fortune, I could better endure to be kept by him now. And somewhat relieved by this idea which I failed not to execute that day, I ventured once more to meet my master's and lover's eye, which most pertinaciously sought mine, though I averted both face and gaze. He smiled, and I thought his smile was such as a sultan might, in a blissful and fond moment, bestow on a slave his gold and gems had enriched. I crushed his hand, which was ever hunting mine, vigorously, and thrust it back to him red with the passionate pressure. You need not look in that way, I said. If you do, I'll wear nothing but my old lowwood frocks to the end of the chapter. I'll be married in this lilac gingham. You may make a dressing gown for yourself out of the pearl grey silk and an infinite series of waistcoats out of the black satin. He chuckled, he rubbed his hands. Oh, it is rich to see and hear her, he exclaimed. Is she original? Is she piquant? I would not exchange this one little English girl for the Grand Turk's whole seraglio, gazelle eyes, hoory forms, and all. The Eastern illusion bit me again. I'll not stand you an inch in the stead of a seraglio, I said so don't consider me an equivalent for one. If you have a fancy for anything in that line, away with you, sir, to the bazaars of Stamboul without delay, and lay out in extensive slave purchases some of that spare cash you seem at a loss to spend satisfactorily here. And what will you do, Janet, while I am bargaining for so many tons of flesh and such an assortment of black eyes? I'll be preparing myself to go out as a missionary to preach liberty to them that are enslaved, your harem inmates amongst the rest. I'll get admitted there, and I'll stir up mutiny, and you, three-tailed Bashaw, as you are, sir, shall in a trice find yourself fettered amongst our hands, nor will I, for one, consent to cut your bonds till you have signed a charter, the most liberal that despot ever yet conferred. I would consent to be at your mercy, Jane. I would have no mercy, Mr. Rochester, if you supplicated for it with an eye like that. While you looked so, I should be certain that whatever charter you might grant under coercion, your first act, when released, would be to violate its conditions. Why, Jane, what would you have? I fear you will compel me to go through a private marriage ceremony, besides that performed at the altar. You will stipulate, I see, for peculiar terms. What will they be? I only want an easy mind, sir, not crushed by crowded obligations. Do you remember what you said of Céline Varon, of the diamonds, the cashmeres you gave her? I will not be your English Céline Varon. I shall continue to act as Adèle's governess. By that I shall earn my board and lodging and thirty pounds a year besides. I'll furnish my own wardrobe out of that money and you shall give me nothing but well, but what? Your regard, and if I give you mine in return, that debt will be quit. Well, for cool native impudence and pure innate pride, you haven't your equal, said he. We were now approaching Thornfield. Will it please you to dine with me today? He asked as we re-entered the gates. No, thank you, sir. And what for? No, thank you, if one may inquire. I never have dined with you, sir, and I see no reason why I should now, till... Till what, you delight in half phrases? Till I can't help it. Do you suppose I eat like an ogre or a ghoul, that you dread being the companion of my repast? I have formed no supposition on the subject, sir, but I want to go on as usual for another month. You will give up your governessing slavery at once. Indeed. Begging your pardon, sir, I shall not. I shall just go on with it as usual. I shall keep out of your way 
all day, as I have been accustomed to do. You may send for me in the evening, when you feel disposed to see me, and I'll come then, but at no other time. I want a smoke, Jane, or a pinch of snuff to comfort me under all this. Pour me donna une contenance, as Adele would say, and unfortunately I have neither my cigar case nor my snuff box. But listen, whisper. It is your time now, little tyrant, but it will be mine presently. And when once I have fairly seized you to have and to hold, I'll just, figuratively speaking, attach you to a chain like this, touching his watch guard. Yes, Bonnie wee thing, I'll wear you in my bosom, lest my jewel I should tine. He said this as he helped me to alight from the carriage, and while he afterwards lifted out Adele, I entered the house and made good my retreat upstairs. He duly summoned me to his presence in the evening. I had prepared an occupation for him, for I was determined not to spend the whole time in a tete-a-tete -tete conversation. I remembered his fine voice. I knew he liked to sing. Good singers generally do. I was no vocalist myself, and, in his fastidious judgment, no musician either. But I delighted in listening when the performance was good. No sooner had twilight, that hour of romance, began to lower her blue and starry banner over the lattice. Then I rose, opened the piano, and entreated him, for the love of heaven, to give me a song. He said I was a capricious witch, and that he would rather sing another time, but I averred that no time was like the present. Did I like his voice? he asked. Very much. I was not fond of pampering that susceptible vanity of his, but for once, and from motives of expediency, I would e'en soothe and stimulate it. Then, Jane, you must play the accompaniment. Very well, sir, I will try. I did try, but was presently swept off the stool and denominated a little bungler. Being pushed unceremoniously to one side, which was precisely what I wished, he usurped my place and proceeded to accompany himself, for he could play as well as sing. I hied me to the window recess, and while I sat there and looked out on the still trees and dim lawn, to a sweet air was sung in mellow tones the following strain. The truest love that ever heart felt at its kindled core did through each vein, in quickened start, the tide of being poor. Her coming was my hope each day, her parting was my pain, the chance that did her steps delay was ice in every vein. I dreamed it would be nameless bliss, as I loved, loved to be, and to this object did I press as blind as eagerly. But wide as pathless was the space that lay our lives between, and dangerous as the foamy race of ocean surges green, and haunted as a robber path through wilderness or wood, for might and right and woe and wrath between our spirits stood. I dangers dared, I hindrance scorned, I omens did defy. Whatever menaced, harassed, warned, I passed impetuous by. On sped my rainbow fast as light. I flew as in a dream, for glorious rose upon my sight that child of shower and gleam. Still bright on clouds of suffering dim shines that soft solemn joy. Nor care I now how dense and grim disasters gather nigh. I care not in this moment sweet, though all I have rushed o'er should come on pinion, strong and fleet, proclaiming vengeance sore. Though haughty hate should strike me down, right, bar approach to me, and grinding might, with furious frown, swear endless enmity. My love has placed her little hand with noble faith in mine, and vowed that wedlock's sacred band our nature shall entwine. My love has sworn with sealing kiss, with me to live, to die. I have at last my nameless bliss. As I love, loved am I. He rose and came towards me, and I saw his face all kindled and his full falcon eye flashing and tenderness and passion in every lineament. I quailed momentarily, then I rallied. Soft scene, daring demonstration, I would not have, and I stood in peril of both. A weapon of defence must be prepared. I wetted my tongue. As he reached me, I asked with asperity whom he was going to marry now. 
That was a strange question to be put by his darling Jane. Indeed, I considered it a very natural and necessary one. He had talked of his future wife dying with him. What did he mean by such a pagan idea? I had no intention of dying with him. He might depend on that. Oh, all he longed, all he prayed for, was that I might live with him. Death was not for such as I. Indeed it was. I had as good a right to die when my time came as he had, but I should bide that time and not be hurried away in a sutty. Would I forgive him for the selfish idea and prove my pardon by a reconciling kiss? No, I would rather be excused. Here I heard myself apostrophized as a hard little thing, and it was added, any other woman would have been melted to marrow at hearing such stanzas crooned in her praise. I assured him I was naturally hard, very flinty, and that he would often find me so, and that, moreover, I was determined to show him divers rugged points in my character before the ensuing four weeks elapsed. He should know fully what sort of a bargain he had made while there was yet time to rescind it. Would I be quiet and talk rationally? I would be quiet if he liked, and as to talking rationally, I flattered myself I was doing that now. He fretted, pished, and pshawed. Very good, I thought. You may fume and fidget as you please, but this is the best plan to pursue with you, I am certain. I like you more than I can say, but I'll not sink into a bathos of sentiment. And with this needle of repartee, I'll keep you from the edge of the gulf too. And, moreover, maintain by its pungent aid that distance between you and myself most conducive to our real mutual advantage. From less to more, I worked him up to considerable irritation. Then, after he had retired, in dudgeon, quite to the other end of the room, I got up and saying, I wish you good night, sir. In my natural and wanted respectful manner, I slipped out by the side door and got away. The system thus entered on, I pursued during the whole season of probation, and with the best success. He was kept, to be sure, rather cross and crusty, but on the whole, I could see he was excellently entertained, and that a lamb-like submission and turtle-dove sensibility, while fostering his despotism more, would have pleased his judgment, satisfied his common sense, and even suited his taste less. In other people's presence I was, as formerly, deferential and quiet, any other line of conduct being uncalled for. It was only in the evening conferences I thus thwarted and afflicted him. He continued to send for me punctually the moment the clock struck seven, though when I appeared before him now, he had no such honeyed terms as love and darling on his lips. The best words at my service were provoking puppet, malicious elf, sprite, changeling, etc. For caresses too, I now got grimaces, for a pressure of the hand, a pinch on the arm, for a kiss on the cheek, a severe tweak of the ear. It was all right. At present, I decidedly preferred these fierce favours to anything more tender. Mrs. Fairfax, I saw, approved me. Her anxiety on my account vanished. Therefore, I was certain I did well. Meantime, Mr. Rochester affirmed I was wearing him to skin and bone and threatened awful vengeance for my present conduct at some period fast coming. I laughed in my sleeve at his menaces. I can keep you in reasonable check now, I reflected, and I don't doubt to be able to do it hereafter. If one expedient loses its virtue, another must be devised. Yet after all, my task was not an easy one. Often I would rather have pleased than teased him. My future husband was becoming to me my whole world, and more than the world, almost my hope of heaven. He stood between me and every thought of religion, as an eclipse intervenes between man and the broad sun. I could not, in those days, see God for his creature, of whom I had made an idol. Chapter 25 The month of courtship had wasted. Its very last hours were being numbered. There was no putting off the day that advanced, the bridal day, and all preparations for its arrival were complete. I, at least, had nothing more to do. There were my trunks, packed, locked, corded, ranged in a row along the wall of my little chamber, 
Tomorrow, at this time, they would be far on their road to London. And so should I, D.V. Or rather not I, but one Jane Rochester, a person whom as yet I knew not. The cards of address alone remained to nail on. They lay four little squares in the drawer. Mr. Rochester had himself written the direction. Mrs. Rochester, Hotel London, on each. I could not persuade myself to affix them, or to have them affixed. Mrs. Rochester. She did not exist. She would not be born till tomorrow, sometime after eight o'clock a.m., and I would wait to be assured she had come into the world alive before I assigned to her all that property. It was enough that in yonder closet, opposite my dressing table, garments said to be hers had already displaced my black stuff, low wood frock, and straw bonnet, for not to me appertained that suit of wedding raiment, the pearl-coloured robe, the vapoury veil pendant from the usurped portmanteau. I shut the closet to conceal the strange wraith-like apparel it contained, which, at this evening hour, nine o'clock, gave out certainly a most ghostly shimmer through the shadow of my apartment. I will leave you by yourself, white dream, I said. I am feverish. I hear the wind blowing. I will go out of doors and feel it. It was not only the hurry of preparation that made me feverish, not only the anticipation of the great change, the new life which was to commence tomorrow, both these circumstances had their share, doubtless, in producing that restless, excited mood which hurried me forth at this late hour into the darkening grounds. But a third cause influenced my mind more than they. I had at heart a strange and anxious thought. Something had happened which I could not comprehend. No one knew of or had seen the event but myself. It had taken place the preceding night. Mr. Rochester that night was absent from home, nor was he yet returned. Business had called him to a small estate of two or three farms he possessed thirty miles off. Business, it was requisite he should settle in person, previous to his meditated departure from England. I waited now his return, eager to disburthen my mind, and to seek of him the solution of the enigma that perplexed me. Stay till he comes, reader, and, when I disclose my secret to him, you shall share the confidence. I sought the orchard, driven to its shelter by the wind, which all day had blown strong and full from the south, without, however, bringing a speck of rain. Instead of subsiding as night drew on, it seemed to augment its rush and deepen its roar. The trees blew steadfastly one way, never writhing round and scarcely tossing back their boughs once in an hour. So continuous was the strain bending their branchy heads northward. The clouds drifted from pole to pole, fast following mass on mass. No glimpse of blue sky had been visible that July day. It was not without a certain wild pleasure I ran before the wind, delivering my trouble of mind to the measureless air torrent thundering through space. Descending the laurel walk, I faced the wreck of the chestnut tree. It stood up black and riven. The trunk split down the centre gasped ghastly. The cloven halves were not broken from each other, for the firm base and strong roots kept them unsundered below. Though community of vitality was destroyed, the sap could flow no more. Their great boughs on each side were dead, and next winter's tempest would be sure to fell one or both to earth. As yet, however, they might be said to form one tree, a ruin, but an entire ruin. You did right to hold fast to each other, I said, as if the monster splinters were living things and could hear me. I think scathed as you look, and charred and scorched, there must be a little sense of life in you yet, rising out of that adhesion at the faithful, honest roots. You will never have green leaves more, never more see birds making nests and singing idyls in your boughs. The time of pleasure and love is over with you. But you are not desolate. Each of you has a comrade to sympathise with him in his decay. As I looked up at them, the moon appeared momentarily in that part of the sky which filled their fissure. Her disc was blood-red and half overcast. She seemed to throw on me one bewildered, dreary glance and buried herself again instantly in the deep drift of cloud. 
the wind fell for a second round Thornfield, but far away over wood and water poured a wild, melancholy wail. It was sad to listen to, and I ran off again. Here and there I strayed through the orchard, gathered up the apples with which the grass round the tree roots was thickly strewn. Then I employed myself in dividing the ripe from the unripe. I carried them into the house and put them away in the storeroom. Then I repaired to the library to ascertain whether the fire was lit, for though summer, I knew on such a gloomy evening, Mr. Rochester would like to see a cheerful hearth when he came in. Yes, the fire had been kindled sometime and burnt well. I placed his armchair by the chimney corner. I wheeled the table near it. I let down the curtain and had the candles brought in ready for lighting. More restless than ever, when I had completed these arrangements, I could not sit still nor even remain in the house. A little timepiece in the room and the old clock in the hall simultaneously struck ten. How late it grows, I said. I will run down to the gaiters. It is moonlight at intervals. I can see a good way on the road. He may be coming now, and to meet him will save some minutes of suspense. The wind roared high in the great trees which embowered the gates, but the road as far as I could see, to the right hand and the left, was all still and solitary, save for the shadows of clouds crossing it at intervals as the moon looked out. It was but a long pale line, unvaried by one moving speck. A puerile tear dimmed my eye while I looked, a tear of disappointment and impatience. Ashamed of it, I wiped it away. I lingered. The moon shut herself wholly within her chamber and drew close her curtain of dense cloud. The night grew dark. Rain came driving fast on the gale. I wish he would come. I wish he would come, I exclaimed, seized with hypochondriac foreboding. I had expected his arrival before tea. Now it was dark. What could keep him? Had an accident happened, the event of last night again recurred to me. I interpreted it as a warning of disaster. I feared my hopes were too bright to be realised, and I had enjoyed so much bliss lately that I imagined my fortune had passed its meridian and must now decline. Well, I cannot return to the house, I thought. I cannot sit by the fireside while he is abroad in inclement weather. Better tire my limbs than strain my heart. I will go forward and meet him. I set out. I walked fast, but not far. Ere I had measured a quarter of a mile, I heard the tramp of hooves. A horseman came on, full gallop. A dog ran by his side. Away with evil presentiment. It was he. Here he was, mounted on Mesrur, followed by Pilate. He saw me, for the moon had opened a blue field in the sky and rode in it watery bright. He took his hat off and waved it round his head. I now ran to meet him. There, he exclaimed, as he stretched out his hand and bent from the saddle. You can't do without me, that is evident. Step on my boot toe, give me both hands, mount. I obeyed. Joy made me agile. I sprang up before him. A hearty kissing I got for a welcome and some boastful triumph, which I swallowed as well as I could. He checked himself in his exultation to demand, But is there anything the matter, Janet, that you come to meet me at such an hour? Is there anything wrong? No, but I thought you would never come. I could not bear to wait in the house for you, especially with this rain and wind. Rain and wind, indeed. Yes, you are dripping like a mermaid. Pull my cloak round you. But I think you are feverish, Jane. Both your cheek and hand are burning hot. I ask again, is there anything the matter? Nothing now. I am neither afraid nor unhappy. Then you have been both? Rather, but I'll tell you all about it by and by, sir, and I dare say you will only laugh at me for my pains. I'll laugh at you heartily when tomorrow is past. Till then I dare not. My prize is not certain. This is you who have been as slippery as an eel this last month and as thorny as a briar rose? I could not lay a finger anywhere but I was pricked, and now I seem to have gathered up a stray lamb in my arms. 
You wandered out of the fold to seek your shepherd, did you, Jane? I wanted you, but don't boast. Here we are at Thornfield. Now, let me get down. He landed me on the pavement. As John took his horse and he followed me into the hall, he told me to make haste and put something dry on, and then return to him in the library. And he stopped me, as I made for the staircase, to extort a promise that I would not be long. Nor was I long. In five minutes, I rejoined him. I found him at supper. Take a seat and bear me company, Jane. Please God, it is the last meal but one you will eat at Thornfield Hall for a long time. I sat down near him but told him I could not eat. Is it because you have the prospect of a journey before you, Jane? Is it the thoughts of going to London that takes away your appetite? I cannot see my prospects clearly tonight, sir, and I hardly know what thoughts I have in my head. Everything in life seems unreal. Except me. I am substantial enough. Touch me. You, sir, are the most phantom-like of all. You are a mere dream. He held out his hand, laughing. Is that a dream? said he, placing it close to my eyes. He had a rounded, muscular and vigorous hand, as well as a long, strong arm. Yes, though I touch it, it is a dream, said I, as I put it down from before my face. Sir, have you finished supper? Yes, Jane. I rang the bell and ordered away the tray. When we were again alone, I stirred the fire and then took a low seat at my master's knee. It is near midnight, I said. Yes, but remember, Jane, you promised to wake with me the night before my wedding. I did, and I will keep my promise for an hour or two at least. I have no wish to go to bed. Are all your arrangements complete? All, sir. And on my part likewise, he returned, I have settled everything, and we shall leave Thornfield tomorrow, within half an hour after our return from church. Very well, sir. With what an extraordinary smile you uttered that word. Very well, Jane. What a bright spot of colour you have on each cheek, and how strangely your eyes glitter. Are you well? I believe I am. Believe, what is the matter? Tell me what you feel. I could not, sir. No words could tell you what I feel. I wish this present hour would never end. Who knows with what fate the next may come charged? This is hypochondria, Jane. You have been overexcited or overfatigued. Do you, sir, feel calm and happy? Calm? No, but happy to the heart's core. I looked up at him to read the signs of bliss in his face. It was ardent and flushed. Give me your confidence, Jane, he said. Relieve your mind of any weight that oppresses it by imparting it to me. What do you fear? That I shall not prove a good husband? It is the idea farthest from my thoughts. Are you apprehensive of the new sphere you are about to enter, of the new life into which you are passing? No. You puzzle me, Jane. Your look and tone of sorrowful audacity perplex and pain me. I want an explanation. Then, sir, listen. You were from home last night? I was. I know that. And you hinted a while ago at something which had happened in my absence. Nothing probably of consequence, but, in short, it has disturbed you. Let me hear it. Mrs. Fairfax has said something, perhaps, or you have overheard the servants talk. Your sensitive self-respect has been wounded. No, sir. It struck twelve. I waited till the timepiece had concluded its silver chime and the clock its hoarse, vibrating stroke, and then I proceeded. All day yesterday I was very busy and very happy in my ceaseless bustle, for I am not, as you seem to think, troubled by any haunting fears about the new sphere, etc. I think it a glorious thing to have the hope of living with you, because I love you. No, sir, don't caress me now. Let me talk undisturbed. Yesterday I trusted well in Providence and believed that events were working together for your good and mine. It was a fine day, if you recollect. The calmness of the air and sky forbade apprehensions respecting your safety or comfort on your journey. I walked a little while on the pavement after tea, thinking of you, and I beheld you in imagination so near me, I scarcely missed your actual presence. I thought of the life that lay before me, 
your life, sir, an existence more expansive and stirring than my own, as much more so as the depths of the sea to which the brook runs are than the shallows of its own straight channel. I wondered why moralists call this world a dreary wilderness. For me, it blossomed like a rose. Just at sunset, the air turned cold and the sky cloudy. I went in. Sophie called me upstairs to look at my wedding dress, which they had just brought. And under it, in the box, I found your present, the veil which, in your princely extravagance, you sent for from London. Resolved, I suppose, since I would not have jewels to cheat me into accepting something as costly. I smiled as I unfolded it, and devised how I would tease you about your aristocratic tastes and your efforts to mask your plebeian bride in the attributes of a peeress. I thought how I would carry down to you the square of unembroidered blonde I had myself prepared as a covering for my low-born head, and ask if that was not good enough for a woman who could bring her husband neither fortune, beauty, nor connections. I saw plainly how you would look, and heard your impetuous Republican answers and your haughty disavowal of any necessity on your part to augment your wealth or elevate your standing by marrying either a purse or a coronet. How well you read me, you witch, interposed Mr. Rochester. But what did you find in the veil besides its embroidery? Did you find poison or a dagger that you look so mournful now? No, no, sir. Besides the delicacy and richness of the fabric, I found nothing save Fairfax Rochester's pride, and that did not scare me because I am used to the sight of the demon. But, sir, as it grew dark, the wind rose. It blew yesterday evening, not as it blows now, wild and high, but with a sullen moaning sound, far more eerie. I wished you were at home. I came into this room, and the sight of the empty chair and fireless hearth chilled me. For some time after I went to bed, I could not sleep. A sense of anxious excitement distressed me. The gale still rising seemed to my ear to muffle a mournful undersound. Whether in the house or abroad, I could not at first tell, but it recurred, doubtful yet doleful at every lull. At last, I made out it must be some dog howling at a distance. I was glad when it ceased. On sleeping, I continued in dreams the idea of a dark and gusty night. I continued also the wish to be with you and experienced a strange, regretful consciousness of some barrier dividing us. During all my first sleep, I was following the windings of an unknown road. Total obscurity environed me. Rain pelted me. I was burdened with the charge of a little child, a very small creature, too young and feeble to walk, and which shivered in my cold arms and wailed piteously in my ear. I thought, sir, that you were on the road a long way before me, and I strained every nerve to overtake you and made effort on effort to utter your name and entreat you to stop. But my movements were fettered, and my voice still died away inarticulate, while you, I felt, withdrew farther and farther every moment. And these dreams weigh on your spirits now, Jane, when I am close to you. Little nervous subject, forget visionary woe and think only of real happiness. You say you love me, Janet. Yes, I will not forget that, and you cannot deny it. Those words did not die inarticulate on your lips. I heard them clear and soft, a thought too solemn perhaps, but sweet as music. I think it is a glorious thing to have the hope of living with you, Edward because I love you. Do you love me, Jane? Repeat it. I do, sir. I do with my whole heart. Well, he said after some minutes' silence, it is strange, but that sentence has penetrated my breast painfully. Why? I think because you said it with such an earnest religious energy, and because your upward gaze at me now is the very sublime of faith, truth, and devotion. It is too much as if some spirit were near me. Look wicked, Jane, as you know well how to look. Coin one of your wild, shy, provoking smiles. Tell me you hate me, tease me, vex me, do anything but move me. I would rather be incensed than saddened. I will tease you and vex you to your heart's content 
when I have finished my tale, but hear me to the end. I thought, Jane, you had told me all. I thought I had found the source of your melancholy in a dream. I shook my head. What? Is there more? But I will not believe it to be anything important. I warn you of incredulity beforehand. Go on. The disquietude of his air, the somewhat apprehensive impatience of his manner, surprised me. But I proceeded. I dreamt another dream, sir, that Thornfield Hall was a dreary ruin, the retreat of bats and owls. I thought that of all the stately front, nothing remained but a shell-like wall, very high and very fragile looking. I wandered, on a moonlight night, through the grass-grown enclosure within. Here I stumbled over a marble hearth, and there, over a fallen fragment of cornice. Wrapped up in a shawl, I still carried the unknown little child. I might not lay it down anywhere, however tired were my arms, however much its weight impeded my progress, I must retain it. I heard the gallop of a horse at a distance on the road. I was sure it was you, and you were departing for many years, and for a distant country. I climbed the thin wall with frantic perilous haste, eager to catch one glimpse of you from the top. The stones rolled from under my feet, the ivy branches I grasped gave way, the child clung round my neck in terror and almost strangled me. At last, I gained the summit. I saw you like a speck on a white track, lessening every moment. The blast blew so strong I could not stand. I sat down on the narrow ledge. I hushed the scared infant in my lap. You turned an angle of the road. I bent forward to take a last look. The wall crumbled. I was shaken. The child rolled from my knee. I lost my balance, fell, and woke. Now, Jane, that is all. All the preface, sir. The tale is yet to come. On waking, a gleam dazzled my eyes. I thought, oh, it is daylight. But I was mistaken. It was only candlelight. Sophie, I supposed, had come in. There was a light in the dressing table and the door of the closet where, before going to bed, I had hung my wedding dress and veil, stood open. I heard a rustling there. I asked, Sophie, what are you doing? No one answered, but a form emerged from the closet. It took the light, held it aloft, and surveyed the garments pendant from the portmanteau. Sophie, Sophie, I again cried, and still it was silent. I had risen up in bed. I bent forward. First surprise, then bewilderment came over me, and then my blood crept cold through my veins. Mr. Rochester, this was not Sophie. It was not Leah. It was not Mrs. Fairfax. It was not... No, I was sure of it, and am still. It was not even that strange woman, Grace Poole. It must have been one of them, interrupted my master. No, sir, I solemnly assure you to the contrary. The shape standing before me had never crossed my eyes within the precincts of Thornfield Hall before. The height, the contour were new to me. Describe it, Jane. It seemed, sir, a woman, tall and large, with thick and dark hair hanging long down her back. I know not what dress she had on. It was white and straight, but whether gown, sheet, or shroud, I cannot tell. Did you see her face? Not at first, but presently she took my veil from its place. She held it up, gazed at it long, and then she threw it over her own head and turned to the mirror. At that moment, I saw the reflection of the visage and features quite distinctly in the dark oblong glass. And how were they? Fearful and ghastly to me. Oh, sir, I never saw a face like it. It was a discoloured face. It was a savage face. I wish I could forget the roll of the red eyes and the fearful blackened inflation of the lineaments. Ghosts are usually pale, Jane. This, sir, was purple. The lips were swelled and dark. The brow furrowed. The black eyebrows widely raised over the bloodshot eyes. Shall I tell you of what it reminded me? You may. Of the foul German spectre. The vampire. Ah! What did it do? Sir, it removed my veil from its gaunt head, rent it in two parts, and flinging both on the floor, trampled on them. 
It removed my veil from its gaunt head, rent it in two parts and flinging both on the floor, trampled on them. Afterwards, it drew aside the window curtain and looked out. Perhaps it saw dawn approaching, for taking the candle, it retreated to the door. Just at my bedside, the figure stopped. The fiery eyes glared upon me. She thrust up her candle close to my face and extinguished it under my eyes. I was aware her lurid visage flamed over mine, and I lost consciousness. For the second time in my life, only the second time, I became insensible from terror. Who was with you when you revived? No one, sir, but the broad day. I rose, bathed my head and face in water, drank a long draught, felt that though enfeebled I was not ill, and determined that to none but you would I impart this vision. Now, sir, tell me who and what that woman was. The creature of an overstimulated brain, that is certain. I must be careful of you, my treasure. Nerves like yours were not made for rough handling. Sir, depend on it, my nerves were not in fault. The thing was real. The transaction actually took place. And your previous dreams, were they real too? Is Thornfield Hall a ruin? Am I severed from you by insuperable obstacles? Am I leaving you without a tear, without a kiss, without a word? Not yet. Am I about to do it? Why, the day is already commenced which is to bind us indissolubly, and when we are once united there shall be no recurrence of these mental terrors, I guarantee that. Mental terrors, sir, I wish I could believe them to be only such. I wish it more now than ever, since even you cannot explain to me the mystery of that awful visitant. And since I cannot do it, Jane, it must have been unreal. But, sir, when I said so to myself on rising this morning, and when I looked round the room to gather courage and comfort from the cheerful aspect of each familiar object in full daylight, there, on the carpet, I saw what gave the distinct lie to my hypothesis, the veil, torn from top to bottom in two halves. I felt Mr. Rochester start and shudder. He hastily flung his arms round me. Thank God, he exclaimed, that if anything malignant did come near you last night, it was only the veil that was harmed. Oh, to think what might have happened. He drew his breath short and strained me so close to him I could scarcely pant. After some minutes' silence, he continued cheerily. Now, Janet, I'll explain to you all about it. It was half dream, half reality. A woman did, I doubt not, enter your room. And that woman was, must have been, Grace Poole. You call her a strange being yourself. From all you know, you have reasons so to call her. What did she do to me? What to Mason? In a state between sleeping and waking, you noticed her entrance and her actions, but feverish, almost delirious as you were, you ascribed to her a goblin appearance different from her own. The long, dishevelled hair, the swelled black face, the exaggerated stature were figments of imagination, results of nightmare. The spiteful tearing of the veil was real. And it is like her. I see you would ask why I keep such a woman in my house. When we have been married a year and a day, I will tell you, but not now. Are you satisfied, Jane? Do you accept my solution of the mystery? I reflected, and, in truth, it appeared to me the only possible one. Satisfied I was not, but to please him I endeavoured to appear so. Relieved I certainly did feel. So I answered him with a contented smile. And now, as it was long past one, I prepared to leave him. Does not Sophie sleep with Adele in the nursery? He asked as I lit my candle. Yes, sir. And there is room enough in Adele's little bed for you. You must share it with her tonight, Jane. It is no wonder that the incident you have related should make you nervous, and I would rather you did not sleep alone. Promise me to go to the nursery. I shall be very glad to do so, sir. And fasten the door securely on the inside. Wake Sophie when you go upstairs, under pretense of requesting her to rouse you in good time tomorrow, for you must be dressed and have finished breakfast before eight.
And now, no more sombre thoughts. Chase dull care away, Janet. Don't you hear to what soft whispers the wind has fallen? And there is no more beating of rain against the window panes. Look here. He lifted up the curtain. It is a lovely night. It was. Half heaven was pure and stainless. The clouds, now trooping before the wind, which had shifted to the west, were filing off eastward in long silvered columns. The moon shone peacefully. Well, said Mr. Rochester, gazing inquiringly into my eyes, how is my Janet now? The night is serene, sir, and so am I. And you will not dream of separation and sorrow tonight, but of happy love and blissful union. This prediction was but half fulfilled. I did not indeed dream of sorrow, but as little did I dream of joy, for I never slept at all. With little Adele in my arms, I watched the slumber of childhood, so tranquil, so passionless, so innocent, and waited for the coming day. All my life was awake and astir in my frame, and as soon as the sun rose, I rose too. I remember Adele clung to me as I left her. I remember I kissed her as I loosened her little hands from my neck, and I cried over her with strange emotion and quitted her because I feared my sobs would break her still sound repose. She seemed the emblem of my past life, and he, I was now to array myself to meet, the dread but adored type of my unknown future day. Chapter 26 Sophie came at seven to dress me. She was very long indeed in accomplishing her task, so long that Mr. Rochester, grown, I suppose, impatient of my delay, sent up to ask why I did not come. She was just fastening my veil, the plain square of blonde after all, to my hair with a brooch. I hurried from under her hands as soon as I could. Stop! she cried in French. Look at yourself in the mirror. You have not taken one peep. So I turned at the door. I saw a robed and veiled figure, so unlike my usual self, that it seemed almost the image of a stranger. Jane, called a voice, and I hastened down. I was received at the foot of the stairs by Mr. Rochester. Lingerer, he said, my brain is on fire with impatience and you tarry so long. He took me into the dining room, surveyed me keenly all over, pronounced me fair as a lily, and not only the pride of his life, but the desire of his eyes, and then telling me he would give me but ten minutes to eat some breakfast, he rang the bell. One of his lately hired servants, a footman, answered it. Is John getting the carriage ready? Yes, sir. Is the luggage brought down? They are bringing it down, sir. Go you to the church, see if Mr. Wood, the clergyman, and the clerk are there. Return and tell me. The church, as the reader knows, was but just beyond the gates. The footman soon returned. Mr. Wood is in the vestry, sir, putting on his surplice. And the carriage? The horses are harnessing. We shall not want it to go to church, but it must be ready the moment we return. All the boxes and luggage arranged and strapped on, and the coachman in his seat. Yes, sir. Jane, are you ready? I rose. There were no groomsmen, no bridesmaids, no relatives to wait for or marshal, none but Mr. Rochester and I. Mrs. Fairfax stood in the hall as we passed. I would fain have spoken to her, but my hand was held by a grasp of iron. I was hurried along by a stride I could hardly follow, and to look at Mr. Rochester's face was to feel that not a second of delay would be tolerated for any purpose. I wonder what other bridegroom ever looked as he did, so bent up to a purpose, so grimly resolute, or who, under such steadfast brows, ever revealed such flaming and flashing eyes. I know not whether the day was fair or foul. In descending the drive, I gazed neither on sky nor earth. My heart was with my eyes, and both seemed migrated into Mr. Rochester's frame. I wanted to see the invisible thing on which, as we went along, he appeared to fasten a glance fierce and fell. I wanted to feel the thoughts whose force he seemed breasting and resisting. At the churchyard wicket, he stopped. He discovered I was quite out of breath. Am I cruel in my love? He said. Delay an instant. Lean on me, Jane. 
And now I can recall the picture of the grey old house of God rising calm before me, of a rook wheeling round the steeple, of a ruddy morning sky beyond. I remember something too of the green grave mounds, and I have not forgotten either two figures of strangers straying amongst the low hillocks and reading the mementos graven on the few mossy headstones. I noticed them because as they saw us, they passed round to the back of the church and I doubted not they were going to enter by the side aisle door and witness the ceremony. By Mr Rochester they were not observed. He was earnestly looking at my face from which the blood had, I dare say, momentarily fled for I felt my forehead dewy and my cheeks and lips cold. When I rallied, which I soon did, he walked gently with me up the path to the porch. We entered the quiet and humble temple. The priest waited in his white surplice at the lowly altar, the clerk beside him. All was still. Two shadows only moved in a remote corner. My conjecture had been correct. The strangers had slipped in before us, and they now stood by the vault of the Rochesters, their backs towards us, viewing through the rails the old time-stained marble tomb, where a kneeling angel guarded the remains of Dama de Rochester, slain at Marston Moor in the time of the civil wars, and of Elizabeth, his wife. Our place was taken at the communion rails. Hearing a cautious step behind me, I glanced over my shoulder. One of the strangers, a gentleman evidently, was advancing up the chancel. The service began. The explanation of the intent of matrimony was gone through, and then the clergyman came a step further forward and, bending slightly towards Mr. Rochester, went on. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not lawfully be joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word doth allow, are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. He paused, as the custom is. When is the pause after that sentence ever broken by reply? Not perhaps once in a hundred years. And the clergyman, who had not lifted his eyes from his book and had held his breath but for a moment was proceeding, his hand was already stretched towards Mr. Rochester, as his lips unclosed to ask, Wilt thou have this woman for thy wedded wife? When a distinct and near voice said, The marriage cannot go on. I declare the existence of an impediment. The clergyman looked up at the speaker and stood mute. The clerk did the same. Mr. Rochester moved slightly, as if an earthquake had rolled under his feet. Taking a firmer footing and not turning his head or eyes, he said, Proceed. Profound silence fell when he had uttered that word, with deep but low intonation. Presently Mr. Wood said, I cannot proceed without some investigation into what has been asserted and evidence of its truth or falsehood. The ceremony is quite broken off, subjoined the voice behind us. I am in a condition to prove my allegation. An insuperable impediment to this marriage exists. Mr. Rochester heard, but he did not. He stood stubborn and rigid, making no movement but to possess himself of my hand. What a hot and strong grasp he had. And how like quarried marble was his pale, firm, massive front at this moment. How his eyes shone still watchful, and yet wild beneath. Mr. Wood seemed at a loss. What is the nature of the impediment? he asked. Perhaps it may be got over, explained away. Hardly, was the answer. I have called it insuperable, and I speak advisedly. The speaker came forward and leaned on the rails. He continued, uttering each word distinctly, calmly, steadily, but not loudly. It simply consists in the existence of a previous marriage. Mr. Rochester has a wife now living. My nerves vibrated to those low-spoken words as they had never vibrated to thunder. My blood felt their subtle violence as it had never felt frost or fire. But I was collected, 
and in no danger of swooning. I looked at Mr. Rochester. I made him look at me. His whole face was colourless rock. His eye was both spark and flint. He disavowed nothing. He seemed as if he would defy all things. Without speaking, without smiling, without seeming to recognise in me a human being, he only twined my waist with his arm and riveted me to his side. Who are you? he asked of the intruder. My name is Briggs, a solicitor of Mall, Street, London. And you would thrust on me a wife? I would remind you of your lady's existence, sir, which the law recognises if you do not. Favour me with an account of her, with her name, her parentage, her place of abode. Certainly. Mr Briggs calmly took a paper from his pocket and read out in a sort of official nasal voice. I affirm and can prove that on the 20th of October, A.D., a date of 15 years back, Edward Fairfax Rochester of Thornfield Hall in the county of Ars and of Ferndean Manor in Orshire, England, was married to my sister, Bertha Antoinetta Mason, daughter of Jonas Mason, merchant, and of Antoinetta, his wife, a Creole, at Ish Church, Spanish Town, Jamaica. The record of the marriage will be found in the register of that church. A copy of it is now in my possession. Signed, Richard Mason. That, if a genuine document, may prove I have been married, but it does not prove that the woman mentioned therein as my wife is still living. She was living three months ago, returned the lawyer. How do you know? I have a witness to the fact, whose testimony even you, sir, will scarcely controvert. Produce him, or go to hell. I will produce him first. He is on the spot. Mr. Mason, have the goodness to step forward. Mr. Rochester, on hearing the name, set his teeth. He experienced, too, a sort of strong convulsive quiver. Near to him as I was, I felt the spasmodic movement of fury or despair run through his frame. The second stranger, who had hitherto lingered in the background, now drew near. A pale face looked over the solicitor's shoulder. Yes, it was Mason himself. Mr. Rochester turned and glared at him. His eye, as I have often said, was a black eye. It had now a tawny, nay, a bloody light in its gloom, and his face flushed. Olive cheek and hueless forehead received a glow as from spreading, ascending heart fire and he stirred, lifted his strong arm. He could have struck Mason, dashed him on the church floor, shocked by ruthless blow the breath from his body. But Mason shrank away and cried faintly, Good God! Contempt fell cool on Mr. Rochester. His passion died, as if a blight had shriveled it up. He only asked, What have you to say? An inaudible reply escaped Mason's white lips. The devil is in it if you cannot answer distinctly. I again demand, what have you to say? Sir, sir, interrupted the clergyman, do not forget you are in a sacred place. Then addressing Mason, he inquired gently, are you aware, sir, whether or not this gentleman's wife is still living? Courage, urged the lawyer, speak out. She is now living at Thornfield Hall, said Mason in more articulate tones. I saw her there last April. I am her brother. At Thornfield Hall, ejaculated the clergyman. Impossible. I am an old resident in this neighbourhood, sir, and I never heard of a Mrs. Rochester at Thornfield Hall. I saw a grim smile contort Mr. Rochester's lips, and he muttered, No, by God. I took care that none should hear of it, or of her under that name. He mused. For ten minutes he held counsel with himself. He formed his resolve and announced it. Enough. All shall bolt out at once, like the bullet from the barrel. Wood, close your book and take off your surplice. John Green, to the clerk, leave the church. There will be no wedding today. The man obeyed, Mr. Rochester continued, hardily and recklessly. Bigamy is an ugly word. I meant, however, to be a bigamist but fate has outmaneuvered me, 
or Providence has checked me, perhaps the last. I am little better than a devil at this moment. And, as my pastor there would tell me, deserve no doubt the sternest judgments of God, even to the quenchless fire and deathless worm. Gentlemen, my plan is broken up. What this lawyer and his clients say is true. I have been married, and the woman to whom I was married lives. You say you never heard of a Mrs. Rochester at the house up yonder wood, but I dare say you have many a time inclined your ear to gossip about the mysterious lunatic kept there under watch and ward. Some have whispered to you that she is my bastard half-sister, some my cast-off mistress. I now inform you that she is my wife, whom I married fifteen years ago, Bertha Mason by name, sister of this resolute personage who is now, with his quivering limbs and white cheeks, showing you what a stout heart men may bear. Cheer up, Dick, never fear me. I'd almost as soon strike a woman as you. Bertha Mason is mad, and she came of a mad family, idiots and maniacs through three generations. Her mother, the Creole, was both a madwoman and a drunkard, as I found out after I had wed the daughter, for they were silent on family secrets before. Bertha, like a dutiful child, copied her parent in both points. I had a charming partner, pure, wise, modest. You can fancy I was a happy man. I went through rich scenes. Oh, my experience has been heavenly if you only knew it, but I owe you no further explanation. Briggs, Wood, Mason, I invite you all to come up to the house and visit Mrs. Poole's patient and my wife. You shall see what sort of a being I was cheated into espousing and judge whether or not I had a right to break the compact and seek sympathy with something at least human. This girl, he continued looking at me, knew no more than you would of the disgusting secret. She thought all was fair and legal, and never dreamt she was going to be entrapped into a feigned union with a defrauded wretch already bound to a bad, mad and embruted partner. Come, all of you. Follow. Still holding me fast, he left the church. The three gentlemen came after. At the front door of the hall, we found the carriage. Take it back to the coach house, John, said Mr. Rochester coolly. It will not be wanted today. At our entrance, Mrs. Fairfax, Adele, Sophie, Leah advanced to meet and greet us. To the right about, every soul, cried the master. Away with your congratulations. Who wants them? Not I. They are fifteen years too late. He passed on and ascended the stairs, still holding my hand and still beckoning the gentlemen to follow him, which they did. We mounted the first staircase, passed up the gallery, proceeded to the third story. The low black door, opened by Mr. Rochester's master key, admitted us to the tapestried room with its great bed and its pictorial cabinet. You know this place, Mason, said our guide. She bit and stabbed you here. He lifted the hangings from the wall, uncovering the second door. This too he opened. In a room without a window, there burnt a fire guarded by a high and strong fender and a lamp suspended from the ceiling by a chain. Grace Poole bent over the fire, apparently cooking something in a saucepan. In the deep shade at the farther end of the room, a figure ran backwards and forwards. What it was, whether beast or human being, one could not, at first sight, tell. It groveled, seemingly on all fours, it snatched and growled like some strange wild animal, but it was covered with clothing, and a quantity of dark, grizzled hair, wild as a mane, hid its head and face. Good morrow, Mrs. Poole, said Mr. Rochester. How are you? And how is your charge today? We're tolerable, sir, I thank you, replied Grace, lifting the boiling mess carefully onto the hob. Rather snappish, but not rageous. A fierce cry seemed to give the lie to her favourable report. The clothed hyena rose up and stood tall on its hind feet. Ah, sir, she sees you, exclaimed Grace. You'd better not stay. Only a few moments, Grace. You must allow me a few moments. Take care then, sir. For God's sake, take care, the maniac bellowed. 
She parted her shaggy locks from her visage and gazed wildly at her visitors. I recognised well that purple face, those bloated features. Mrs Poole advanced. Keep out of the way, said Mr Rochester, thrusting her aside. She has no knife now, I suppose, and I'm on my guard. One never knows what she has, sir. She is so cunning, it is not in mortal discretion to fathom her craft. We had better leave her, whispered Mason. Go to the devil, was his brother-in-law's recommendation. Where? cried Grace. The three gentlemen retreated simultaneously. Mr. Rochester flung me behind him. The lunatic sprang and grappled his throat viciously and laid her teeth to his cheek. They struggled. She was a big woman in stature almost equaling her husband, and corpulent besides. She showed virile force in the contest. More than once she almost throttled him, athletic as he was. He could have settled her with a well-planted blow, but he would not strike, he would only wrestle. At last he mastered her arms. Grace Poole gave him a cord, and he pinioned them behind her. With more rope, which was at hand, he bound her to a chair. The operation was performed amidst the fiercest yells and the most convulsive plunges. Mr. Rochester then turned to the spectators. He looked at them with a smile, both acrid and desolate. That is my wife, said he. Such is the sole conjugal embrace I am ever to know. Such are the endearments which are to solace my leisure hours. And this is what I wish to have laying his hand on my shoulder. This young girl, who stands so grave and quiet at the mouth of hell, looking collectedly at the gambols of a demon, I wanted her just as a change after that fierce ragu. Wood and Briggs, look at the difference. Compare these clear eyes with the red balls yonder, this face with that mask, this form with that bulk, then judge me, priest of the gospel and man of the law and remember with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Off with you now, I must shut up my prize. We all withdrew. Mr. Rochester stayed a moment behind us to give some further order to Grace Poole. The solicitor addressed me as he descended the stair. You, madam, said he, are cleared from all blame. Your uncle will be glad to hear it, if indeed he should be still living when Mr. Mason returns to Madeira. My uncle, what of him? Do you know him? Mr. Mason does. Mr. Eyre has been the fun child correspondent of his house for some years. When your uncle received your letter intimating the contemplated union between yourself and Mr. Rochester, Mr. Mason, who was staying at Madeira to recruit his health, on his way back to Jamaica, happened to be with him. Mr. Eyre mentioned the intelligence for he knew that my client here was acquainted with a gentleman of the name of Rochester. Mr. Mason, astonished and distressed as you may suppose, revealed the real state of matters. Your uncle, I am sorry to say, is now on a sick bed, from which, considering the nature of his disease, decline, and the stage it has reached, it is unlikely he will ever rise. He could not then hasten to England himself to extricate you from the snare into which you had fallen. But he implored Mr. Mason to lose no time in taking steps to prevent the false marriage. He referred him to me for assistance. I used all dispatch and am thankful I was not too late, as you, doubtless, must be also. Were I not morally certain that your uncle will be dead ere you reach Madeira, I would advise you to accompany Mr. Mason back. But as it is... I think you had better remain in England till you can hear further, either from or of Mr. Eyre. Have we anything else to stay for? He inquired of Mr. Mason. No, no, let us be gone, was the anxious reply. And without waiting to take leave of Mr. Rochester, they made their exit at the hall door. The clergyman stayed to exchange a few sentences, either of admonition or reproof, with his haughty parishioner. This duty done, he too departed. I heard him go as I stood at the half-open door of my own room, to which I had now withdrawn. The house cleared, I shut myself in, fastened the bolt that none might intrude, and proceeded. Not to weep, not to mourn, I was yet too calm for that, 
but mechanically to take off the wedding dress and replace it by the stuff gown I had worn yesterday as I thought, for the last time. I then sat down. I felt weak and tired. I leaned my arms on a table and my head dropped on them, and now I thought, till now I had only heard, seen, moved, followed up and down where I was led or dragged, watched event rush on event, disclosure open beyond disclosure. But now, I thought, the morning had been a quiet morning enough, all except the brief scene with the lunatic. The transaction in the church had not been noisy. There was no explosion of passion, no loud altercation, no dispute, no defiance or challenge, no tears, no sobs. A few words had been spoken, a calmly pronounced objection to the marriage made. Some stern, short questions put by Mr. Rochester, answers, explanations given, evidence adduced. An open admission of the truth had been uttered by my master. Then the living proof had been seen. The intruders were gone, and all was over. I was in my own room as usual, just myself, without obvious change. Nothing had smitten me, or scathed me, or maimed me. And yet where was the Jane Eyre of yesterday? Where was her life? Where were her prospects? Jane Eyre, who had been an ardent, expectant woman, almost a bride, was a cold, solitary girl again. Her life was pale. Her prospects were desolate. A Christmas frost had come at midsummer. A white December storm had whirled over June. Ice glazed the ripe apples. Drifts crushed the blowing roses. On hayfield and cornfield lay a frozen shroud. Lanes which last night blushed full of flowers. Today were pathless with untrodden snow. And the woods, which twelve hours since waved leafy and fragrant as groves between the tropics, now spread, waste wild and white as pine forests in wintry Norway. My hopes were all dead, struck with a subtle doom, such as, in one night, fell on all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I looked on my cherished wishes, yesterday so blooming and glowing. They lay stark, chill, livid corpses that could never revive. I looked at my love, that feeling which was my master's which he had created. It shivered in my heart, like a suffering child in a cold cradle. Sickness and anguish had seized it. It could not seek Mr. Rochester's arms. It could not derive warmth from his breast. Oh, never more could it turn to him, for faith was blighted, confidence destroyed. Mr. Rochester was not to me what he had been, for he was not what I had thought him. I would not ascribe vice to him. I would not say he had betrayed me, but the attribute of stainless truth was gone from his idea, and from his presence I must go, that I perceived well. When, how, whither, I could not yet discern, but he himself, I doubted not, would hurry me from Thornfield. Real affection, it seemed, he could not have for me. It had been only fitful passion. That was balked. He would want me no more. I should fear even to cross his path now. My view must be hateful to him. Oh, how blind had been my eyes. How weak my conduct. My eyes were covered and closed, eddying darkness seemed to swim round me, and reflection came in as black and confused a flow. Self-abandoned, relaxed, and effortless, I seemed to have laid me down in the dried-up bed of a great river. I heard a flood, loosened in remote mountains, and felt the torrent come. To rise I had no will, to flee I had no strength. I lay faint, longing to be dead. One idea only still throbbed lifelike within me, a remembrance of God. It begot an unuttered prayer. These words went wandering up and down in my rayless mind as something that should be whispered, but no energy was found to express them. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. It was near, and as I had lifted no petition to heaven to avert it, as I had neither joined my hands, nor bent my knees, nor moved my lips, it came. In full, heavy swing, the torrent poured over me. The whole consciousness of my life lorn, my love lost, my hope quenched, my faith death-struck, 
swayed full and mighty above me in one sullen mass. That bitter hour cannot be described. In truth, the waters came into my soul. I sank in deep mire. I felt no standing. I came into deep waters. The floods overflowed me. Chapter 27 Sometime in the afternoon I raised my head, and looking round and seeing the western sun gilding the sign of its decline on the wall, I asked, What am I to do? But the answer my mind gave, leave Thornfield at once, was so prompt, so dread, that I stopped my ears. I said I could not bear such words now. That I am not Edward Rochester's bride is the least part of my woe, I alleged that I have wakened out of most glorious dreams and found them all void and vain is a horror I could bear and master, but that I must leave him decidedly, instantly, entirely, is intolerable. I cannot do it. But then, a voice within me averred that I could do it and foretold that I should do it. I wrestled with my own resolution. I wanted to be weak that I might avoid the awful passage of further suffering I saw laid out for me, and conscience, turned tyrant, held passion by the throat, told her tauntingly she had yet but dipped her dainty foot in the slough, and swore that with that arm of iron he would thrust her down to unsounded depths of agony. Let me be torn away then, I cried. Let another help me. No, you shall tear yourself away. None shall help you. You shall yourself pluck out your right eye. Yourself cut off your right hand, your heart shall be the victim, and you the priest to transfix it. I rose up suddenly terror-struck at the solitude which so ruthless a judge haunted, at the silence which so awful a voice filled. My head swam as I stood erect. I perceived that I was sickening from excitement and inanition. Neither meat nor drink had passed my lips that day, for I had taken no breakfast. And, with a strange pang, I now reflected that, long as I had been shut up here, no message had been sent to ask how I was, or to invite me to come down. Not even little Adele had tapped at the door. Not even Mrs. Fairfax had sought me. Friends always forget those whom fortune forsakes, I murmured, as I undrew the bolt and passed out. I stumbled over an obstacle. My head was still dizzy, my sight was dim, and my limbs were feeble. I could not soon recover myself. I fell but not onto the ground. An outstretched arm caught me. I looked up. I was supported by Mr. Rochester, who sat in a chair across my chamber threshold. You come out at last, he said. Well, I have been waiting for you long and listening, yet not one movement have I heard, nor one sob. Five minutes more of that death-like hush, and I should have forced the lock like a burglar. So you shun me? You shut yourself up and grieve alone. I would rather you had come and upbraided me with vehemence. You are passionate. I expected a scene of some kind. I was prepared for the hot rain of tears. Only I wanted them to be shed on my breast. Now a senseless floor has received them, or your drenched handkerchief. But I err. Uh, you have not wept at all. I see a white cheek and a faded eye, but no trace of tears. I suppose, then, your heart has been weeping blood. Well, Jane, not a word of reproach. Nothing bitter, nothing poignant, nothing to cut a feeling or sting a passion. You sit quietly where I have placed you and regard me with a weary, passive look. Jane, I never meant to wound you thus. If the man who had but one little ewe lamb that was dear to him as a daughter, that ate of his bread and drank of his cup, and lay in his bosom, had by some mistake slaughtered it at the shambles, he would not have rued his bloody blunder more than I now rue mine. Will you ever forgive me? Reader, I forgave him at the moment and on the spot. There was such deep remorse in his eye, such true pity in his tone, such manly energy in his manner. And besides, there was such unchanged love in his whole look and mien. I forgave him all, yet not in words, not outwardly, only at my heart's core. You know I am a scoundrel, Jane? Ere long, he inquired wistfully, wondering, I suppose, at my continued silence and tameness, the result rather of weakness than of will. 
Yes, sir. Then tell me so roundly and sharply. Don't spare me. I cannot. I am tired and sick. I want some water. He heaved a sort of shuddering sigh and, taking me in his arms, carried me downstairs. At first, I did not know to what room he had borne me. All was cloudy to my glazed sight. Presently I felt the reviving warmth of a fire, for summer as it was, I had become icy cold in my chamber. He put wine to my lips. I tasted it and revived. Then I ate something he offered me and was soon myself. I was in the library, sitting in his chair. He was quite near. If I could go out of life now, without too sharp a pang, it would be well for me, I thought. Then I should not have to make the effort of cracking my heartstrings in rending them from among Mr. Rochester's. I must leave him, it appears. I do not want to leave him. I cannot leave him. How are you now, Jane? Much better, sir. I shall be well soon. Taste the wine again, Jane. I obeyed him. Then he put the glass on the table, stood before me, and looked at me attentively. Suddenly he turned away with an inarticulate exclamation, full of passionate emotion of some kind. He walked fast through the room and came back. He stooped towards me as if to kiss me, but I remembered caresses were now forbidden. I turned my face away and put his aside. What? How is this? he exclaimed hastily. Oh, I know! You won't kiss the husband of Bertha Mason. You consider my arms filled and my embraces appropriated? At any rate, there is neither room nor claim for me, sir. Why, Jane, I will spare you the trouble of much talking. I will answer for you because I have a wife already, you would reply. I guess rightly? Yes. If you think so, you must have a strange opinion of me. You must regard me as a plotting profligate a base and low rake who has been simulating disinterested love in order to draw you into a snare deliberately laid and strip you of honour and rob you of self-respect. What do you say to that? I see you can say nothing. In the first place, you are faint still and have enough to do to draw your breath. In the second place, you cannot yet accustom yourself to accuse and revile me, and besides, the floodgates of tears are opened and they would rush out if you spoke much. And you have no desire to expostulate, to upbraid, to make a scene. You are thinking how to act. Talking you consider is of no use. I know you. I am on my guard. Sir, I do not wish to act against you, I said, and my unsteady voice warned me to curtail my sentence. Not in your sense of the word, but in mine you are scheming to destroy me. You have as good as said that I am a married man as a married man, you will shun me, keep out of my way. Just now you have refused to kiss me. You intend to make yourself a complete stranger to me, to live under this roof only as Adele's governess. If ever I say a friendly word to you, if ever a friendly feeling inclines you again to me, you will say, that man had nearly made me his mistress. I must be ice and rock to him. And ice and rock you will accordingly become. I cleared and steadied my voice to reply, All is changed about me, sir. I must change too. There is no doubt of that. And to avoid fluctuations of feeling and continual combats with recollections and associations, there is only one way. Adele must have a new governess, sir. Oh, Adele will go to school. I have settled that already. Nor do I mean to torment you with the hideous associations and recollections of Thornfield Hall. This accursed place, this tent of Achan, this insolent vault, offering the ghastliness of living death to the light of the open sky, this narrow stone hell, with its one real fiend, worse than a legion of such as we imagine. Jane, you shall not stay here, nor will I. I was wrong ever to bring you to Thornfield Hall knowing as I did how it was haunted. I charged them to conceal from you, before I ever saw you, all knowledge of the curse of the place, merely because I feared Adele never would have a governess to stay if she knew with what inmate she was housed, and my plans would not permit me to remove the maniac elsewhere. Though I possess an old house, Ferndian Manor, even more retired and hidden than this, where I could have lodged her safely enough, had not a scruple about the unhealthiness of the situation, 
in the heart of a wood made my conscience recoil from the arrangement. Probably those damp walls would soon have eased me of her charge, but to each villain his own vice, and mine is not a tendency to indirect assassination, even of what I most hate. Concealing the mad woman's neighbourhood from you, however, was something like covering a child with a cloak and laying it down near a upas tree. That demon's vicinage is poisoned, and always was. But I'll shut up Thornfield Hall. I'll nail up the front door and board the lower windows. I'll give Mrs. Poole two hundred a year to live here with my wife, as you term that fearful hag. Grace will do much for money, and she shall have her son, the keeper at Grimsby Retreat, to bear her company and be at hand to give her aid in the paroxysms, when my wife is prompted by her familiar to burn people in their beds at night, to stab them, to bite their flesh from their bones and so on. Sir, I interrupted him, you are inexorable for that unfortunate lady. You speak of her with hate, with vindictive antipathy. It is cruel. She cannot help being mad. Jane, my little darling, so I will call you for so you are, you don't know what you are talking about. You misjudge me again. It is not because she is mad I hate her. If you were mad, do you think I should hate you? I do indeed, sir. Then you are mistaken, and you know nothing about me, and nothing about the sort of love of which I am capable. Every atom of your flesh is as dear to me as my own. In pain and sickness, it would still be dear. Your mind is my treasure, and if it were broken, it would be my treasure still. If you raved, my arms should confine you, and not a straight waistcoat, your grasp, even in fury, would have a charm for me. If you flew at me as wildly as that woman did this morning, I should receive you in an embrace, at least as fond as it would be restrictive. I should not shrink from you with disgust as I did from her. In your quiet moments, you should have no watcher and no nurse but me. And I could hang over you with untiring tenderness, though you gave me no smile in return and never weary of gazing into your eyes, though they had no longer a ray of recognition for me. But why do I follow that train of ideas? I was talking of removing you from Thornfield. All you know is prepared for prompt departure. Tomorrow you shall go. I only ask you to endure one more night under this roof, Jane, and then farewell to its miseries and terrors forever. I have a place to repair to, which will be a secure sanctuary from hateful reminiscences, from unwelcome intrusion, even from falsehood and slander. And take Adele with you, sir, I interrupted. She will be a companion for you. What do you mean, Jane? I told you I would send Adele to school. And what do I want with a child for a companion? And not my own child, a French dancer's bastard? Why do you importune me about her? I say... Why do you assign Adele to me for a companion? You spoke of a retirement, sir, and retirement and solitude are dull. Too dull for you. Solitude, solitude, he reiterated with irritation. I see I must come to an explanation. I don't know what sphinx-like expression is forming in your countenance. You are to share my solitude. Do you understand? I shook my head. It required a degree of courage, excited as he was becoming, even to risk that mute sign of dissent. He had been walking fast about the room, and he stopped, as if suddenly rooted to one spot. He looked at me long and hard. I turned my eyes from him, fixed them on the fire, and tried to assume and maintain a quiet, collected aspect. Now for the hitch in Jane's character, he said at last speaking more calmly than from his look I had expected him to speak. The reel of silk has run smoothly enough so far, but I always knew there would come a knot and a puzzle. Here it is, now for vexation and exasperation and endless trouble. By God, I long to exert a fraction of Samson's strength and break the entanglement like tow. He recommenced his walk, but soon again stopped, and this time just before me. Jane, will you hear reason? He stooped and approached his lips to my ear. Because if you won't, I'll try violence.
His voice was hoarse, his look that of a man who is just about to burst an insufferable bond and plunge headlong into wild license. I saw that in another moment, and with one impetus of frenzy more, I should be able to do nothing with him. The present, the passing second of time, was all I had in which to control and restrain him. A movement of repulsion, flight, fear would have sealed my doom, and his. But I was not afraid, not in the least. I felt an inward power, a sense of influence which supported me. The crisis was perilous, but not without its charm, such as the Indian, perhaps, feels when he slips over the rapid in his canoe. I took hold of his clenched hand, loosened the contorted fingers, and said to him, soothingly, Sit down. I'll talk to you as long as you like, and hear all you have to say, whether reasonable or unreasonable. He sat down, but he did not get leave to speak directly. I had been struggling with tears for some time. I had taken great pains to repress them, because I knew he would not like to see me weep. Now, however, I considered it well to let them flow as freely and as long as they liked. If the flood annoyed him, so much the better. So I gave way and cried heartily. Soon I heard him earnestly entreating me to be composed. I said I could not while he was in such a passion. But I am not angry, Jane. I only love you too well, and you had steeled your little pale face with such a resolute frozen look, I could not endure it. Hush now and wipe your eyes. His softened voice announced that he was subdued, so I, in my turn, became calm. Now he made an effort to rest his head on my shoulder, but I would not permit it. Then he would draw me to him. No. Jane, Jane, he said, in such an accent of bitter sadness, it thrilled along every nerve I had. You don't love me then? It was only my station and the rank of my wife that you valued? Now that you think me disqualified to become your husband, you recoil from my touch as if I were some toad or ape. These words cut me. Yet what could I do or I say? I ought probably to have done or said nothing, but I was so tortured by a sense of remorse at thus hurting his feelings, I could not control the wish to drop balm where I had wounded. I do love you, I said, more than ever, but I must not show or indulge the feeling and this is the last time I must express it. The last time, Jane? What? Do you think you can live with me and see me daily, and yet, if you still love me, be always cold and distant? No, sir, that I am certain I could not, and therefore I see there is but one way, but you will be furious if I mention it. Oh, mention it. If I storm, you have the art of weeping. Mr. Rochester, I must leave you. For how long, Jane? For a few minutes, while you smooth your hair, which is somewhat dishevelled, and bathe your face, which looks feverish. I must leave Adele and Thornfield. I must part with you for my whole life. I must begin a new existence among strange faces and strange scenes. Of course, I told you you should. I pass over the madness about parting from me. You mean you must become a part of me. As to the new existence, it is all right. You shall yet be my wife. I am not married. You shall be Mrs. Rochester, both virtually and nominally. I shall keep only to you so long as you and I live. You shall go to a place I have in the south of France, a whitewashed villa on the shores of the Mediterranean. There you shall live a happy, and guarded and most innocent life. Never fear that I wish to lure you into error, to make you my mistress. Why did you shake your head? Jane, you must be reasonable, or in truth, I shall again become frantic. His voice and hand quivered, his large nostrils dilated, his eye blazed. Still I dared to speak. Sir, your wife is living. That is a fact, acknowledged this morning by yourself. If I lived with you as you desire, I should then be your mistress. To say otherwise is sophistical, is false. Jane, I am not a gentle-tempered man. You forget that. 
I am not long enduring. I am not cool and dispassionate. Out of pity to me and yourself, put your finger on my pulse, feel how it throbs, and beware. He bared his wrist and offered it to me. The blood was forsaking his cheek and lips. They were growing livid. I was distressed on all hands. To agitate him thus deeply, by a resistance he so abhorred, was cruel. To yield was out of the question. I did what human beings do instinctively when they are driven to utter extremity, looked for aid to one higher than man. The words, God help me, burst involuntarily from my lips. I am a fool, cried Mr. Rochester suddenly. I keep telling her I am not married and do not explain to her why. I forget she knows nothing of the character of that woman or of the circumstances attending my infernal union with her. Oh, I am certain Jane will agree with me in opinion when she knows all that I know. Just put your hand in mine, Janet, that I may have the evidence of touch as well as sight to prove you are near me, and I will in a few words show you the real state of the case. Can you listen to me? Yes, sir, for hours, if you will. I ask only minutes. Jane, did you ever hear or know that I was not the eldest son of my house? that I had once a brother older than I? I remember Mrs. Fairfax told me so once. And did you ever hear that my father was an avaricious, grasping man? I have understood something to that effect. Well, Jane, being so, it was his resolution to keep the property together. He could not bear the idea of dividing his estate and leaving me a fair portion. All he resolved should go to my brother, Roland. Yet as little could he endure that a son of his should be a poor man. I must be provided for by a wealthy marriage. He sought me a partner betimes. Mr. Mason, a West India planter and merchant, was his old acquaintance. He was certain his possessions were real and vast. He made inquiries. Mr. Mason, he found, had a son and daughter, and he learned from him that he could and would give the latter a fortune of thirty thousand pounds. That sufficed. When I left college, I was sent out to Jamaica to espouse a bride already courted for me. My father said nothing about her money, but he told me Miss Mason was the boast of Spanish town for her beauty, and this was no lie. I found her a fine woman, in the style of Blanche Ingram, tall, dark, and majestic. Her family wished to secure me because I was of a good race, and so did she. They showed her to me in parties, splendidly dressed. I seldom saw her alone and had very little private conversation with her. She flattered me and lavishly displayed for my pleasure her charms and accomplishments. All the men in her circle seemed to admire her and envy me. I was dazzled, stimulated. My senses were excited. And being ignorant, raw and inexperienced, I thought I loved her. There is no folly so besotted that the idiotic rivalries of society, the prurience, the rashness, the blindness of youth, will not hurry a man to its commission. Her relatives encouraged me, competitors piqued me, she allured me. A marriage was achieved almost before I knew where I was. Oh, I have no respect for myself when I think of that act. An agony of inward contempt masters me. I never loved, I never esteemed, I did not even know her. I was not sure of the existence of one virtue in her nature. I had marked neither modesty, nor benevolence, nor candor, nor refinement in her mind or manners. And I married her, gross, groveling, mole-eyed blockhead that I was. With less sin I might have, but let me remember to whom I am speaking. My bride's mother I had never seen. I understood she was dead. The honeymoon over, I learned my mistake. She was only mad and shut up in a lunatic asylum. There was a younger brother too, a complete dumb idiot. The elder one, whom you have seen and whom I cannot hate, whilst I abhor all his kindred, because he has some grains of affection in his feeble mind, shown in the continued interest he takes in his wretched sister, and also in a dog-like attachment he once bore me, will probably be in the same state one day. My father and my brother Roland knew all this, but they thought only of the thirty thousand pounds and joined in the plot against me. These were vile discoveries, 
but except for the treachery of concealment, I should have made them no subject of reproach to my wife, even when I found her nature wholly alien to mine, her tastes obnoxious to me, her cast of mind common, low, narrow, and singularly incapable of being led to anything higher, expanded to anything larger. When I found that I could not pass a single evening, nor even a single hour of the day with her in comfort, that kindly conversation could not be sustained between us, because whatever topic I started, immediately received from her a turn at once coarse and trite, perverse and imbecile, when I perceived that I should never have a quiet or settled household, because no servant would bear the continued outbreaks of her violent and unreasonable temper, or the vexations of her absurd, contradictory, exacting orders. Even then I restrained myself. I eschewed upbraiding. I curtailed remonstrance. I tried to devour my repentance and disgust in secret. I repressed the deep antipathy I felt. Jane, I will not trouble you with abominable details. Some strong words shall express what I have to say. I lived with that woman upstairs four years, and before that time she had tried me indeed. Her character ripened and developed with frightful rapidity. Her vices sprang up fast and rank. They were so strong only cruelty could check them, and I would not use cruelty. What a pygmy intellect she had, and what giant propensities. How fearful were the curses those propensities entailed on me. Bertha Mason, the true daughter of an infamous mother, dragged me through all the hideous and degrading agonies which must attend a man bound to a wife at once intemperate and unchaste. My brother in the interval was dead, and at the end of the four years my father died too. I was rich enough now, yet poor to hideous indigence, a nature the most gross, impure, depraved I ever saw, was associated with mine, and called by the law and by society a part of me. And I could not rid myself of it by any legal proceedings, for the doctors now discovered that my wife was mad. Her excesses had prematurely developed the germs of insanity. Jane, you don't like my narrative. You look almost sick. Shall I defer the rest to another day? No, sir. Finish it now. I pity you. I do earnestly pity you. Pity, Jane, from some people is a noxious and insulting sort of tribute, which one is justified in hurling back in the teeth of those who offer it. But that is the sort of pity native to callous, selfish hearts. It is a hybrid, egotistical pain at hearing of woes, crossed with ignorant contempt for those who have endured them. But that is not your pity, Jane. It is not the feeling of which your whole face is full at this moment, with which your eyes are now almost overflowing, with which your heart is heaving, with which your hand is trembling in mine. Your pity, my darling, is the suffering mother of love. Its anguish is the very natal pang of the divine passion. I accept it, Jane. Let the daughter have free advent. My arms wait to receive her. Now, sir, proceed. What did you do when you found she was mad? Jane, I approached the verge of despair. A remnant of self-respect was all that intervened between me and the gulf. In the eyes of the world, I was doubtless covered with grimy dishonour, but I resolved to be clean in my own sight, and to the last I repudiated the contamination of her crimes and wrenched myself from connection with her mental defects. Still, society associated my name and person with hers. I yet saw her and heard her daily, something of her breath for, mixed with the air I breathed, and besides, I remembered I had once been her husband. That recollection was then, and is now, inexpressibly odious to me. Moreover, I knew that while she lived, I could never be the husband of another and better wife. And, though five years my senior, her family and her father had lied to me, even in the particular of her age, she was likely to live as long as I, being as robust in frame as she was infirm in mind. Thus, at the age of twenty-six, I was hopeless. One night I had been awakened by her yells. 
Since the medical men had pronounced her mad, she had, of course, been shut up. It was a fiery West Indian night, one of the description that frequently precede the hurricanes of those climates. Being unable to sleep in bed, I got up and opened the window. The air was like sulphur steams. I could find no refreshment anywhere. Mosquitoes came buzzing in and hummed sullenly round the room. The sea, which I could hear from thence, rumbled dull like an earthquake. Black clouds were casting up over it. The moon was setting in the waves, broad and red, like a hot cannonball. She threw her last bloody glance over a world quivering with the ferment of tempest. I was physically influenced by the atmosphere and scene, and my ears were filled with the curses the maniac still shrieked out, wherein she momentarily mingled my name with such a tone of demon hate, with such language. No professed harlot ever had a fouler vocabulary than she. Though two rooms off, I heard every word, the thin partitions of the West India house opposing but slight obstruction to her wolfish cries. This life, said I at last, is hell. This is the air. Those are the sounds of the bottomless pit. I have a right to deliver myself from it if I can. The sufferings of this mortal state will leave me with the heavy flesh that now cumbers my soul. Of the fanatic's burning eternity, I have no fear. There is not a future state worse than this present one. Let me break away and go home to God. I said this whilst I knelt down at and unlocked a trunk which contained a brace of loaded pistols. I meant to shoot myself. I only entertained the intention for a moment, for, not being insane, the crisis of exquisite and unalloyed despair, which had originated the wish and design of self-destruction, was passed in a second. A wind fresh from Europe blew over the ocean and rushed through the open casement. The storm broke, streamed, thundered, blazed, and the air grew pure. I then framed and fixed a resolution. While I walked under the dripping orange trees of my wet garden and amongst its drenched pomegranates and pineapples, and while the refulgent dawn of the tropics kindled round me, I reasoned thus, Jane. And now listen, for it was true wisdom that consoled me in that hour and showed me the right path to follow. The sweet wind from Europe was still whispering in the refreshed leaves and the Atlantic was thundering in glorious liberty. My heart, dried up and scorched for a long time, swelled to the tone and filled with living blood. My being longed for renewal, my soul thirsted for a pure draught. I saw hope revive and felt regeneration possible. From a flowery arch at the bottom of my garden, I gazed over the sea, bluer than the sky. The old world was beyond. Clear prospects opened thus. Go, said Hope and live again in Europe. There it is not known what a sullied name you bear, nor what a filthy burden is bound to you. You may take the maniac with you to England, confine her with due attendance and precautions at Thornfield, then travel yourself to what clime you will, and form what new tie you like. That woman who has so abused your long-suffering, so sullied your name, so outraged your honour, so blighted your youth is not your wife, nor are you her husband. See that she is cared for as her condition demands, and you have done all that God and humanity require of you. Let her identity, her connection with yourself, be buried in oblivion. You are bound to impart them to no living being. Place her in safety and comfort. Shelter her degradation with secrecy and leave her. I acted precisely on this suggestion. My father and brother had not made my marriage known to their acquaintance, because, in the very first letter I wrote to apprise them of the union, having already begun to experience extreme disgust of its consequences, and, from the family character and constitution, seeing a hideous future opening to me, I added an urgent charge to keep it secret, and very soon the infamous conduct of the wife my father had selected for me was such as to make him blush to own her as his daughter-in-law. Far from desiring to publish the connection, he became as anxious to conceal it as myself. To England, then, I conveyed her, 
a fearful voyage I had with such a monster in the vessel. Glad was I when I at last got her to Thornfield and saw her safely lodged in that third-story room, of whose secret inner cabinet she has now for ten years made a wild beast's den, a goblin's cell. I had some trouble in finding an attendant for her, as it was necessary to select one on whose fidelity dependence could be placed, for her ravings would inevitably betray my secret. Besides, she had lucid intervals of days, sometimes weeks, which she filled up with abuse of me. At last, I hired Grace Poole from the Grimsey retreat. She and the surgeon, Carter, who dressed Mason's wounds that night he was stabbed and worried, are the only two I have ever admitted to my confidence. Mrs. Fairfax may indeed have suspected something, but she could have gained no precise knowledge as to facts. Grace has, on the whole, proved a good keeper, though owing partly to a fault of her own, of which it appears nothing can cure her, and which is incident to her harassing profession. Her vigilance has been more than once lulled and baffled. The lunatic is both cunning and malignant. She has never failed to take advantage of her guardian's temporary lapses. Once to secrete the knife with which she stabbed her brother, and twice to possess herself of the key of her cell, and issue therefrom in the night time. On the first of these occasions, she perpetrated the attempt to burn me in my bed. On the second, she paid that ghastly visit to you. I thank Providence, who watched over you, that she then spent her fury on your wedding apparel, which perhaps brought back vague reminiscences of her own bridal days. But on what might have happened, I cannot endure to reflect. When I think of the thing which flew at my throat this morning, hanging its black and scarlet visage over the nest of my dove, my blood curdles. And what, sir? I asked while he paused. Did you do when you had settled her here? Where did you go? What did I do, Jane? I transformed myself into a will-o'-the-wisp. Where did I go? I pursued wanderings as wild as those of the March spirit. I sought the continent and went devious through all its lands. My fixed desire was to seek and find a good and intelligent woman whom I could love, a contrast to the fury I left at Thornfield. But you could not marry, sir. I had determined and was convinced that I could and ought. It was not my original intention to deceive as I have deceived you. I meant to tell my tale plainly and make my proposals openly and it appeared to me so absolutely rational that I should be considered free to love and be loved, I never doubted some woman might be found willing and able to understand my case and accept me, in spite of the curse with which I was burdened. Well, sir. When you are inquisitive, Jane, you always make me smile. You open your eyes like an eager bird and make every now and then a restless movement as if answers in speech did not flow fast enough for you, and you wanted to read the tablet of one's heart. But before I go on, tell me what you mean by your, well, sir. It is a small phrase very frequent with you, and which many a time has drawn me on and on through interminable talk. I don't very well know why. I mean, what next? How did you proceed? What came of such an event? Precisely. And what do you wish to know now? Whether you found anyone you liked, whether you asked her to marry you, and what she said. I can tell you whether I found anyone I liked and whether I asked her to marry me. But what she said is yet to be recorded in the Book of Fate. For ten long years I roved about, living first in one capital, then another, sometimes in St. Petersburg, oftener in Paris, occasionally in Rome, Naples, and Florence. Provided with plenty of money and the passport of an old name, I could choose my own society. No circles were closed against me. I sought my ideal of a woman amongst English ladies, French countesses, Italian signoras, and German Greffinen. I could not find her. Sometimes for a fleeting moment I thought I caught a glance, heard a tone, beheld a form, which announced the realization of my dream but I was presently undeceived. You are not to suppose that I desired perfection, either of mind or person. 
I longed only for what suited me, for the antipodes of the Creole, and I longed vainly. Amongst them all, I found not one whom, had I been ever so free, I, warned as I was of the risks, the horrors, the loathings of incongruous unions, would have asked to marry me. Disappointment made me reckless. I tried dissipation, never debauchery, that I hated and hate. That was my Indian Messalina's attribute. Rooted disgust at it, and her restrained me much, even in pleasure. Any enjoyment that bordered on riot seemed to approach me to her and her vices, and I eschewed it. Yet I could not live alone, so I tried the companionship of mistresses. The first I chose was Céline Varon, another of those steps which make a man spurn himself when he recalls them. You already know what she was and how my liaison with her terminated. She had two successors, an Italian, Giacinta, and a German, Clara, both considered singularly handsome. What was their beauty to me in a few weeks? Giacinta was unprincipled and violent. I tired of her in three months. Clara was honest and quiet, but heavy, mindless, and unimpressible. Not one whit to my taste. I was glad to give her a sufficient sum to set her up in a good line of business, and so get decently rid of her. But, Jane, I see by your face you are not forming a very favourable opinion of me just now. You think me an unfeeling, loose-principled rake, don't you? I don't like you so well as I have done sometimes, indeed, sir. Did it not seem to you in the least wrong to live in that way, first with one mistress and then another? You talk of it as a mere matter of course. It was with me, and I did not like it. It was a groveling fashion of existence. I should never like to return to it. Hiring a mistress is the next worst thing to buying a slave. Both are often by nature, and always by position, inferior, and to live familiarly with inferiors is degrading. I now hate the recollection of the time I passed with Céline, Giacinta, and Clara. I felt the truth of these words, and I drew from them the certain inference that if I were so far to forget myself and all the teaching that had ever been instilled into me, as, under any pretext with any justification, through any temptation, to become the successor of these poor girls, he would one day regard me with the same feeling which now in his mind desecrated their memory. I did not give utterance to this conviction. It was enough to feel it. I impressed it on my heart that it might remain there to serve me as aid in the time of trial. Now, Jane, why don't you say, well, sir, I have not done. You are looking grave. You disapprove of me still, I see. But let me come to the point. Last January, rid of all mistresses, in a harsh, bitter frame of mind, the result of a useless, roving, lonely life, corroded with disappointment, sourly disposed against all men, and especially against all womankind, for I began to regard the notion of an intellectual, faithful, loving woman as a mere dream, recalled by business, I came back to England. On a frosty winter afternoon, I rode in sight of Thornfield Hall, abhorred spot, I expected no peace, no pleasure there. On a stile in Hay Lane, I saw a quiet little figure sitting by itself. I passed it as negligently as I did the pollard willow opposite to it. I had no presentiment of what it would be to me, no inward warning that the arbitress of my life, my genius for good or evil, waited there in humble guise. I did not know it, even when, on the occasion of Mesrour's accident, it came up and gravely offered me help. Childish and slender creature, it seemed as if a linnet had hopped to my foot and proposed to bear me on its tiny wing. I was surly, but the thing would not go. It stood by me with strange perseverance and looked and spoke with a sort of authority. I must be aided, and by that hand, and aided I was. When once I had pressed the frail shoulder, Something new, a fresh sap and sense, stole into my frame. It was well I had learnt that this elf must return to me, that it belonged to my house down below, or I could not have felt it pass away from under my hand and seen it vanish behind the dim hedge without singular regret. 
I heard you come home that night, Jane, though probably you were not aware that I thought of you or watched for you. The next day I observed you, myself unseen, for half an hour, while you played with Adele in the gallery. It was a snowy day, I recollect, and you could not go out of doors. I was in my room, the door was ajar. I could both listen and watch. Adele claimed your outward attention for a while, yet I fancied your thoughts were elsewhere. But you were very patient with her, my little Jane. You talked to her and amused her a long time. When at last she left you, you lapsed at once into deep reverie. You betook yourself slowly to pace the gallery. Now and then, in passing a casement, you glanced out at the thick falling snow. You listened to the sobbing wind, and again you paced gently on and dreamed. I think those day visions were not dark. There was a pleasurable illumination in your eye occasionally, a soft excitement in your aspect, which told of no bitter, bilious, hypochondriac brooding. Your look revealed rather the sweet musings of youth when its spirit follows on willing wings, the flight of hope up and on to an ideal heaven. The voice of Mrs. Fairfax speaking to a servant in the hall wakened you, and how curiously you smiled to and at yourself, Janet. There was much sense in your smile. It was very shrewd and seemed to make light of your own abstraction. It seemed to say, My fine visions are all very well, but I must not forget they are absolutely unreal. I have a rosy sky and a green flowery Eden in my brain, but without, I am perfectly aware, lies at my feet a rough tract to travel, and around me gather black tempests to encounter. You ran downstairs and demanded of Mrs. Fairfax some occupation, the weekly house accounts to make up, or something of that sort, I think it was. I was vexed with you for getting out of my sight. Impatiently, I waited for evening, when I might summon you to my presence. An unusual, to me, a perfectly new character I suspected was yours. I desired to search it deeper and know it better. You entered the room with a look and air at once shy and independent. You were quaintly dressed, much as you are now. I made you talk. Ere long, I found you full of strange contrasts. Your garb and manner were restricted by rule. Your air was often diffident and altogether that of one refined by nature, but absolutely unused to society and a good deal afraid of making herself disadvantageously conspicuous by some solecism or blunder. Yet, when addressed, you lifted a keen, a daring, and a glowing eye to your interlocutor's face. There was penetration and power in each glance you gave. When plied by close questions, you found ready and round answers. Very soon you seemed to get used to me. I believe you felt the existence of sympathy between you and your grim and cross master Jane. For it was astonishing to see how quickly a certain pleasant ease tranquilized your manner. Snarl as I would, you showed no surprise, fear, annoyance, or displeasure at my moroseness. You watched me, and now and then smiled at me with a simple yet sagacious grace I cannot describe. I was at once content and stimulated with what I saw. I liked what I had seen and wished to see more. Yet, for a long time, I treated you distantly and sought your company rarely. I was an intellectual epicure and wished to prolong the gratification of making this novel and piquant acquaintance. Besides, I was for a while troubled with a haunting fear that if I handled the flower freely, its bloom would fade, the sweet charm of freshness would leave it. I did not then know that it was no transitory blossom, but rather the radiant resemblance of one, cut in an indestructible gem. Moreover, I wished to see whether you would seek me if I shunned you, but you did not. You kept in the schoolroom as still as your own desk and easel. If by chance I met you, you passed me as soon and with as little token of recognition as was consistent with respect. Your habitual expression in those days, Jane, was a thoughtful look, not despondent, for you were not sickly, but not buoyant, for you had little hope and no actual pleasure. I wondered what you thought of me, or if you ever thought of me, and resolved to find this out. 
I resumed my notice of you. There was something glad in your glance and genial in your manner. When you conversed, I saw you had a social heart. It was the silent schoolroom. It was the tedium of your life that made you mournful. I permitted myself the delight of being kind to you. Kindness stirred emotion soon. Your face became soft in expression, your tones gentle. I liked my name pronounced by your lips in a grateful, happy accent. I used to enjoy a chance meeting with you, Jane, at this time. There was a curious hesitation in your manner. You glanced at me with a slight trouble, a hovering doubt. You did not know what my caprice might be, whether I was going to play the master and be stern, or the friend and be benignant. I was now too fond of you often to simulate the first whim, and, when I stretched my hand out cordially, such bloom and light and bliss rose to your young, wistful features, I had much ado often to avoid straining you then and there to my heart. Don't talk any more of those days, sir, I interrupted, furtively dashing away some tears from my eyes. His language was torture to me, for I knew what I must do and do soon, and all these reminiscences and these revelations of his feelings only made my work more difficult. No, Jane, he returned. What necessity is there to dwell on the past when the present is so much surer, the future so much brighter? I shuddered to hear the infatuated assertion. You see now how the case stands, do you not? he continued. After a youth and manhood passed half in unutterable misery and half in dreary solitude, I have for the first time found what I can truly love. I have found you. You are my sympathy, my better self, my good angel. I am bound to you with a strong attachment. I think you good, gifted, lovely, a fervent, a solemn passion is conceived in my heart. It leans to you, draws you to my centre and spring of life, wraps my existence about you, and, kindling in pure, powerful flame, fuses you and me in one. It was because I felt and knew this that I resolved to marry you. To tell me that I had already a wife is empty mockery. You know now that I had but a hideous demon. I was wrong to attempt to deceive you. But I feared a stubbornness that exists in your character. I feared early instilled prejudice. I wanted to have you safe before hazarding confidences. This was cowardly. I should have appealed to your nobleness and magnanimity at first, as I do now, open to you plainly my life of agony, describe to you my hunger and thirst after a higher and worthier existence, shown to you, not my resolution, that word is weak, but my resistless bent to love faithfully and well, where I am faithfully and well loved in return. Then I should have asked you to accept my pledge of fidelity and to give me yours. Jane, give it me now. A pause. Why are you silent, Jane? I was experiencing an ordeal. A hand of fiery iron grasped my vitals. Terrible moment full of struggle, blackness, burning. Not a human being that ever lived could wish to be loved better than I was loved, and him who thus loved me I absolutely worshipped, and I must renounce love and idol. One drear word comprised my intolerable duty. Depart. Jane, you understand what I want of you. Just this promise. I will be yours, Mr. Rochester. Mr. Rochester, I will not be yours. Another long silence. Jane, recommenced he, with a gentleness that broke me down with grief and turned me stone cold with ominous terror, for this still voice was the pant of a lion rising. Jane, do you mean to go one way in the world and to let me go another? I do. Jane, bending towards and embracing me, do you mean it now? I do. And now, softly kissing my forehead and cheek, I do extricating myself from restraint rapidly and completely. Oh, Jane, this is bitter, this, this is wicked. It would not be wicked to love me. It would, to obey you. A wild look raised his brows, crossed his features. He rose, but he forbore yet. 
I laid my hand on the back of a chair for support. I shook, I feared, but I resolved. One instant, Jane. Give one glance to my horrible life when you are gone. All happiness will be torn away with you. What then is left? For a wife I have but the maniac upstairs. As well might you refer me to some corpse in yonder churchyard. What shall I do, Jane? Where turn for a companion and for some hope? Do as I do. Trust in God and yourself. Believe in heaven. Hope to meet again there. Then you will not yield. No. Then you condemn me to live wretched and to die accursed? His voice rose. I advise you to live sinless, and I wish you to die tranquil. Then you snatch love and innocence from me. You fling me back on lust for a passion, vice for an occupation. Mr. Rochester, I no more assign this fate to you than I grasp at it for myself. We were born to strive and endure, you as well as I, do so. You will forget me before I forget you. You make me a liar by such language. You sully my honour. I declared I could not change. You tell me to my face I shall change soon. And what a distortion in your judgment, what a perversity in your ideas, is proved by your conduct. Is it better to drive a fellow creature to despair than to transgress a mere human law, no man being injured by the breach? For you have neither relatives nor acquaintances whom you need fear to offend by living with me? This was true. And while he spoke, my very conscience and reason turned traitors against me and charged me with crime in resisting him. They spoke almost as loud as feeling, and that clamoured wildly. Oh, comply, it said. Think of his misery, think of his danger, look at his state when left alone, remember his headlong nature, consider the recklessness, following on despair, soothe him, save him, love him, tell him you love him and will be his. Who in the world cares for you? Or who will be injured by what you do? Still indomitable was the reply. I care for myself. The more solitary, the more friendless, the more unsustained I am, the more I will respect myself. I will keep the law given by God, sanctioned by man. I will hold to the principles received by me when I was sane, and not mad, as I am now. Laws and principles are not for the times when there is no temptation. They are for such moments as this, when body and soul rise in mutiny against their rigour. Stringent are they. Inviolate they shall be. If at my individual convenience I might break them, what would be their worth? They have a worth, so I have always believed, and if I cannot believe it now, it is because I am insane, quite insane, with my veins running fire and my heart beating faster than I can count its throbs. Preconceived opinions, foregone determinations, are all I have at this hour to stand by. There I plant my foot. I did. Mr. Rochester, reading my countenance, saw I had done so. His fury was wrought to the highest. He must yield to it for a moment, whatever followed. He crossed the floor and seized my arm and grasped my waist. He seemed to devour me with his flaming glance. Physically, I felt at the moment powerless as stubble exposed to the draught and glow of a furnace. Mentally, I still possessed my soul, and with it the certainty of ultimate safety. The soul, fortunately, has an interpreter, often an unconscious but still a truthful interpreter, in the eye. My eye rose to his, and while I looked in his fierce face, I gave an involuntary sigh. His gripe was painful, and my overtaxed strength almost exhausted. Never, said he, as he ground his teeth, never was anything at once so frail and so indomitable. A mere reed she feels in my hand. And he shook me with the force of his hold. I could bend her with my finger and thumb. And what good would it do if I bent? If I uptore, if I crushed her? Consider that eye. Consider the resolute, wild, free thing looking out of it, defying me, with more than courage, with a stern triumph. Whatever I do with its cage, I cannot get at it the savage, beautiful creature. If I tear, if I rend the slight prison, my outrage will only let the captive loose. 
conqueror I might be of the house, but the inmate would escape to heaven before I could call myself possessor of its clay dwelling place. And it is you, spirit, with will and energy and virtue and purity, that I want, not alone your brittle frame. Of yourself, you could come with soft flight and nestle against my heart, if you would. Seized against your will, you will elude the grasp like an essence. You will vanish ere I inhale your fragrance. Oh, come, Jane, come. As he said this, he released me from his clutch and only looked at me. The look was far worse to resist than the frantic strain. Only an idiot, however, would have succumbed now. I had dared and baffled his fury. I must elude his sorrow. I retired to the door. You are going, Jane? I am going, sir. You are leaving me? Yes. You will not come? You will not be my comforter, my rescuer? My deep love, my wild woe, my frantic prayer are all nothing to you? What unutterable pathos was in his voice. How hard it was to reiterate firmly, I am going. Jane, Mr. Rochester. Withdraw then, I consent, but remember you leave me here in anguish. Go up to your own room, think over all I have said, and Jane, cast a glance on my sufferings. Think of me. He turned away. He threw himself on his face on the sofa. Oh, Jane, my hope, my love, my life, broke in anguish from his lips. Then came a deep, strong sob. I had already gained the door, but, reader, I walked back, walked back as determinedly as I had retreated. I knelt down by him. I turned his face from the cushion to me. I kissed his cheek. I smoothed his hair with my hand. God bless you, my dear master, I said. God keep you from harm and wrong. Direct you, solace you, reward you well for your past kindness to me. Little Jane's love would have been my best reward, he answered. Without it, my heart is broken. But Jane will give me her love, yes, nobly, generously. Up the blood rushed to his face. Forth flashed the fire from his eyes. Erect he sprang, he held his arms out, but I evaded the embrace and at once quitted the room. Farewell, was the cry of my heart as I left him. Despair added, farewell forever. That night I never thought to sleep, but a slumber fell on me as soon as I lay down in bed. I was transported in thought to the scenes of childhood. I dreamt I lay in the red room at Gateshead, that the night was dark and my mind impressed with strange fears. The light that long ago had struck me into syncope, recalled in this vision, seemed glidingly to mount the wall and tremblingly to pause in the centre of the obscured ceiling. I lifted up my head to look, the roof resolved to clouds high and dim, the gleam was such as the moon imparts to vapours she is about to sever. I watched her come, watched with the strangest anticipation, as though some word of doom were to be written on her disc. She broke forth as never moon yet burst from cloud. A hand first penetrated the sable folds and waved them away. Then, not a moon, but a white human form shone in the azure, inclining a glorious brow earthward. It gazed and gazed on me. It spoke to my spirit. Immeasurably distant was the tone, yet so near, it whispered in my heart, My daughter, flee temptation. Mother, I will. So I answered after I had waked from the trance-like dream. It was yet night, but July nights are short. Soon after midnight, dawn comes. It cannot be too early to commence the task I have to fulfil, thought I. I rose, I was dressed for I had taken off nothing but my shoes. I knew where to find in my drawers some linen, a locket, a ring. In seeking these articles, I encountered the beads of a pearl necklace Mr. Rochester had forced me to accept a few days ago. I left that. It was not mine. It was the visionary brides who had melted in air. The other articles I made up in a parcel, my purse containing twenty shillings, it was all I had, I put in my pocket. I tied on my straw bonnet, pinned my shawl, 
took the parcel and my slippers, which I would not put on yet, and stole from my room. Farewell, kind Mrs. Fairfax, I whispered as I glided past her door. Farewell, my darling Adele, I said as I glanced towards the nursery. No thought could be admitted of entering to embrace her. I had to deceive a fine ear, for aught I knew it might now be listening. I would have got past Mr. Rochester's chamber without a pause, but my heart momentarily stopping its beat at that threshold, my foot was forced to stop also. No sleep was there. The inmate was walking restlessly from wall to wall, and again and again he sighed while I listened. There was a heaven, a temporary heaven, in this room for me, if I chose. I had but to go in and to say, Mr. Rochester, I will love you and live with you through life till death, and a fount of rapture would spring to my lips. I thought of this. That kind master who could not sleep now was waiting with impatience for day. He would send for me in the morning. I should be gone. He would have me sought for, vainly. He would feel himself forsaken, his love rejected. He would suffer, perhaps grow desperate. I thought of this too. My hand moved towards the lock. I caught it back and glided on. Drearily, I wound my way downstairs. I knew what I had to do and I did it mechanically. I sought the key of the side door in the kitchen. I sought, too, a file of oil and a feather. I oiled the key and the lock. I got some water, I got some bread, for perhaps I should have to walk far. And my strength, sorely shaken of late, must not break down. All this I did without one sound. I opened the door, passed out, shut it softly. Dim dawn glimmered in the yard. The great gates were closed and locked but a wicket in one of them was only latched. Through that I departed. It, too, I shut. And now I was out of Thornfield. A mile off beyond the fields lay a road which stretched in the contrary direction to Millcote, a road I had never travelled, but often noticed, and wondered where it led. Thither I bent my steps. No reflection was to be allowed now. Not one glance was to be cast back, not even one forward, not one thought was to be given either to the past or the future. The first was a page so heavenly sweet, so deadly sad, that to read one line of it would dissolve my courage and break down my energy. The last was an awful blank, something like the world when the deluge was gone by. I skirted fields and hedges and lanes till after sunrise. I believe it was a lovely summer morning. I know my shoes, which I had put on when I left the house, were soon wet with dew. But I looked neither to rising sun, nor smiling sky, nor wakening nature. He who is taken out to pass through a fair scene to the scaffold thinks not of the flowers that smile on his road, but of the block and axe edge, of the disseverment of bone and vein, of the grave gaping at the end and I thought of drear flight and homeless wandering, and oh, with agony I thought of what I left. I could not help it. I thought of him now, in his room, watching the sunrise, hoping I should soon come to say I would stay with him and be his. I longed to be his. I panted to return. It was not too late. I could yet spare him the bitter pang of bereavement. As yet my flight, I was sure, was undiscovered. I could go back and be his comforter, his pride, his redeemer from misery, perhaps from ruin. Oh, that fear of his self-abandonment, far worse than my abandonment, how it goaded me. It was a barbed arrowhead in my breast. It tore me when I tried to extract it. It sickened me when remembrance thrust it farther in. Birds began singing in brake and copse. Birds were faithful to their mates. Birds were emblems of love. What was I? In the midst of my pain of heart and frantic effort of principle, I abhorred myself. I had no solace from self-approbation, none even from self-respect. I had injured, wounded, left my master. I was hateful in my own eyes. Still, I could not turn nor retrace one step. God must have led me on. As to my own will or conscience, impassioned grief had trampled one and stifled the other. I was weeping wildly as I walked along my solitary way. Fast, fast, I went like one delirious. A weakness, B. 
beginning inwardly, extending to the limbs, seized me and I fell. I lay on the ground some minutes, pressing my face to the wet turf. I had some fear or hope that here I should die, but I was soon up, crawling forwards on my hands and knees, and then again raised to my feet, as eager and as determined as ever to reach the road. When I got there, I was forced to sit to rest me under the hedge, and while I sat, I heard wheels and saw a coach come on. I stood up and lifted my hand. It stopped. I asked where it was going. The driver named a place a long way off and where I was sure Mr. Rochester had no connections. I asked for what sum he would take me there. He said 30 shillings. I answered I had but 20. Well, he would try to make it do. He further gave me leave to get into the inside, as the vehicle was empty. I entered, was shut in, and it rolled on its way. Gentle reader, may you never feel what I then felt. May your eyes never shed such stormy, scalding, heart-wrung tears as poured from mine. May you never appeal to heaven in prayers so hopeless and so agonised as in that hour left my lips, for never may you, like me, dread to be the instrument of evil to what you wholly love. Chapter 28 Two days are past. It is a summer evening. The coachman has set me down at a place called Whitcross. He could take me no farther for the sum I had given, and I was not possessed of another shilling in the world. The coach is a mile off by this time. I am alone. At this moment, I discover that I forgot to take my parcel out of the pocket of the coach, where I had placed it for safety. There it remains. There it must remain. And now, I am absolutely destitute. Whitcross is no town, nor even a hamlet. It is but a stone pillar set up where four roads meet. Whitewashed, I suppose, to be more obvious at a distance and in darkness. Four arms spring from its summit the nearest town to which these point is, according to the inscription, distant ten miles, the farthest, above twenty. From the well-known names of these towns, I learn in what county I have lighted. A North Midland shire, dusk with moorland, ridged with mountain, this I see. There are great moors behind and on each hand of me. There are waves of mountains far beyond that deep valley at my feet. The population here must be thin, and I see no passengers on these roads. They stretch out east, west, north and south, white, broad, lonely. They are all cut in the moor, and the heather grows deep and wild to their very verge, yet a chance traveller might pass by. And I wish no eye to see me now. Strangers would wonder what I am doing, lingering here at the signpost, evidently objectless and lost. I might be questioned. I could give no answer but what would sound incredible and excite suspicion. Not a tie holds me to human society at this moment. Not a charm or hope calls me where my fellow creatures are. None that saw me would have a kind thought or a good wish for me. I have no relative but the universal mother, nature. I will seek her breast and ask repose. I struck straight into the heath. I held on to a hollow I saw deeply furrowing the brown moor side. I waded knee-deep in its dark growth. I turned with its turnings, and, finding a moss-blackened granite crag in a hidden angle, I sat down under it. High banks of moor were about me. The crag protected my head. The sky was over that. Some time passed before I felt tranquil even here. I had a vague dread that wild cattle might be near or that some sportsman or poacher might discover me. If a gust of wind swept the waste, I looked up, fearing it was the rush of a bull. If a plover whistled, I imagined it a man. Finding my apprehensions unfounded, however, and calmed by the deep silence that reigned as evening declined at nightfall, I took confidence. As yet, I had not thought. I had only listened, watched, dreaded. Now I regained the faculty of reflection. What was I to do? Where to go? Oh, intolerable questions, when I could do nothing and go nowhere, when a long way must yet be measured by my weary, trembling limbs before I could reach human habitation, when cold charity must be entreated before I could get a lodging. Reluctant sympathy importuned, almost certain repulse incurred, 
before my tale could be listened to, or one of my wants relieved. I touched the heath. It was dry, and yet warm with the heat of the summer day. I looked at the sky. It was pure. A kindly star twinkled just above the chasm ridge. The dew fell but with propitious softness. No breeze whispered. Nature seemed to me benign and good. I thought she loved me, outcast as I was. And I, who from man could anticipate only mistrust, rejection, insult, clung to her with filial fondness. Tonight, at least, I would be her guest, as I was her child. My mother would lodge me without money and without price. I had one morsel of bread yet, the remnant of a roll I had bought in a town we passed through at noon with a stray penny, my last coin. I saw ripe bilberries gleaming here and there, like jet beads in the heath. I gathered a handful and ate them with the bread. My hunger, sharp before, was, if not satisfied, appeased by this hermit's meal. I said my evening prayers at its conclusion and then chose my couch. I said my evening prayers. Beside the crag, the heath was very deep. When I lay down, my feet were buried in it. Rising high on each side, it left only a narrow space for the night air to invade. I folded my shawl double and spread it over me for a coverlet. A low, mossy swell was my pillow. Thus lodged, I was not, at least at the commencement of the night, cold. My rest might have been blissful enough. Only a sad heart broke it. It plained of its gaping wounds, its inward bleeding, its riven cords. It trembled for Mr. Rochester and his doom. It bemoaned him with bitter pity. It demanded him with ceaseless longing. And, impotent as a bird with both wings broken, it still quivered its shattered pinions in vain attempts to seek him. Worn out with this torture of thought, I rose to my knees. Night was come and her planets were risen, a safe, still night, too serene for the companionship of fear. We know that God is everywhere, but certainly we feel his presence most when his works are on the grandest scale spread before us, and it is in the unclouded night sky where his worlds wheel their silent course that we read clearest his infinitude, his omnipotence, his omnipresence. I had risen to my knees to pray for Mr. Rochester. Looking up, I, with tear-dimmed eyes, saw the mighty Milky Way. Remembering what it was, what countless systems there swept space like a soft trace of light, I felt the might and strength of God. Sure was I of his efficiency to save what he had made, convinced I grew that neither earth should perish, nor one of the souls it treasured. I turned my prayer to thanksgiving. The source of life was also the saviour of spirits. Mr. Rochester was safe, he was God's, and by God would he be guarded. I again nestled to the breast of the hill, and ere long in sleep forgot sorrow. But next day, want came to me pale and bare. Long after the little birds had left their nests, long after bees had come in the sweet prime of day to gather the heath honey before the dew was dried. When the long morning shadows were curtailed and the sun filled earth and sky, I got up and I looked round me. What a still, hot, perfect day. What a golden desert this spreading moor. Everywhere sunshine. I wished I could live in it and on it. I saw a lizard run over the crag. I saw a bee busy among the sweet bilberries. I would fain at the moment have become bee or lizard that I might have found fitting nutriment permanent shelter here. But I was a human being, and had a human being's wants. I must not linger where there was nothing to supply them. I rose. I looked back at the bed I had left. Hopeless of the future, I wished but this, that my maker had that night thought good to require my soul of me while I slept, and that this weary frame, absolved by death from further conflict with fate, had now but to decay quietly and mingle in peace with the soil of this wilderness. Life, however, was yet in my possession with all its requirements and pains and responsibilities. The burden must be carried, the want provided for, 
the suffering endured, the responsibility fulfilled. I set out. Whitcross regained. I followed a road which led from the sun, now fervent and high. By no other circumstance had I will to decide my choice. I walked a long time, and when I thought I had nearly done enough, and might conscientiously yield to the fatigue that almost overpowered me, might relax this forced action, and, sitting down on a stone I saw near, submit resistlessly to the apathy that clogged heart and limb. I heard a bell chime, a church bell. I turned in the direction of the sound, and there, amongst the romantic hills, whose changes and aspect I had ceased to note an hour ago, I saw a hamlet and a spire. All the valley at my right hand was full of pasture fields and cornfields and wood, and a glittering stream ran zigzag through the varied shades of green, the mellowing grain, the sombre woodland, the clear and sunny lee. Recalled by the rumbling of wheels to the road before me, I saw a heavily laden wagon labouring up the hill, and not far beyond were two cows and their drover. Human life and human labour were near. I must struggle on, strive to live, and bend to toil like the rest. About two o'clock p.m., I entered the village. At the bottom of its one street, there was a little shop with some cakes of bread in the window. I coveted a cake of bread. With that refreshment, I could perhaps regain a degree of energy. Without it, it would be difficult to proceed. The wish to have some strength and some vigour returned to me as soon as I was amongst my fellow beings. I felt it would be degrading to faint with hunger on the causeway of a hamlet. Had I nothing about me I could offer in exchange for one of these rolls? I considered. I had a small silk handkerchief tied round my throat. I had my gloves. I could hardly tell how men and women in extremities of destitution proceeded. I did not know whether either of these articles would be accepted. Probably they would not, but I must try. I entered the shop. A woman was there. Seeing a respectably dressed person, a lady as she supposed, she came forward with civility. How could she serve me? I was seized with shame. My tongue would not utter the request I had prepared. I dared not offer her the half-worn gloves, the creased handkerchief. Besides, I felt it would be absurd. I only begged permission to sit down a moment as I was tired. Disappointed in the expectation of a customer, she coolly acceded to my request. She pointed to a seat. I sank into it. I felt sorely urged to weep, but conscious how unseasonable such a manifestation would be, I restrained it. Soon I asked her if there were any dressmaker or plain workwoman in the village. Yes, two or three. Quite as many as there was employment for. I reflected. I was driven to the point now. I was brought face to face with necessity. I stood in the position of one without a resource, without a friend, without a coin. I must do something. What? I must apply somewhere. Where? Did she know of any place in the neighbourhood where a servant was wanted? Nay, she couldn't say. What was the chief trade in this place? What did most of the people do? Some were farm labourers. A good deal worked at Mr Oliver's needle factory and at the foundry. Did Mr Oliver employ women? Nay, it was men's work. And what do the women do? I naunt, was the answer. Some does one thing and some another. Poor folk mun get on as they can. She seemed to be tired of my questions. And indeed, what claim had I to importune her? A neighbour or two came in. My chair was evidently wanted. I took leave. I passed up the street, looking as I went at all the houses to the right hand and to the left. But I could discover no pretext, nor see an inducement to enter any. I rambled round the hamlet, going sometimes to a little distance and returning again, for an hour or more. Much exhausted, and suffering greatly now for want of food, I turned aside into a lane and sat down under the hedge. Ere many minutes had elapsed, I was again on my feet, however, and again searching something, a resource, or at least an informant. A pretty little house stood at the top of the lane, with a garden before it, exquisitely neat and brilliantly blooming. I stopped at it. What business had I to approach the white door 
or touch the glittering knocker? In what way could it possibly be the interest of the inhabitants of that dwelling to serve me? Yet I drew near and knocked. A mild-looking, cleanly attired young woman opened the door, in such a voice as might be expected from a hopeless heart and fainting frame, a voice wretchedly low and faltering. I asked if a servant was wanted here. No, said she, we do not keep a servant. Can you tell me where I could get employment of any kind? I continued. I am a stranger, without acquaintance in this place. I want some work, no matter what. But it was not her business to think for me, or to seek a place for me. Besides, in her eyes, how doubtful must have appeared my character, position, tale. She shook her head. She was sorry she could give me no information, and the white door closed quite gently and civilly. But it shut me out. If she had held it open a little longer, I believe I should have begged a piece of bread, for I was now brought low. I could not bear to return to the sordid village, where, besides, no prospect of aid was visible. I should have longed rather to deviate to a wood I saw not far off, which appeared in its thick shade to offer inviting shelter. But I was so sick, so weak, so gnawed with nature's cravings, instinct kept me roaming round abodes where there was a chance of food. Solitude would be no solitude. Rest no rest, while the vulture, hunger, thus sank beak and talons in my side. I drew near houses, I left them, and came back again, and again I wandered away, always repelled by the consciousness of having no claim to ask, no right to expect interest in my isolated lot. Meantime, the afternoon advanced, while I thus wandered about like a lost and starving dog. In crossing a field, I saw the church spire before me. I hastened towards it. Near the churchyard, and in the middle of a garden, stood a well-built, though small house, which I had no doubt was the parsonage. I remembered that strangers who arrive at a place where they have no friends and who want employment sometimes apply to the clergyman for introduction and aid. It is the clergyman's function to help, at least with advice, those who wish to help themselves. I seem to have something like a right to seek counsel here. Renewing then my courage and gathering my feeble remains of strength, I pushed on. I reached the house and knocked at the kitchen door. An old woman opened. I asked, was this the parsonage? Yes. Was the clergyman in? No. Would he be in soon? No, he was gone from home. To a distance. Not so far, happened three mile. He had been called away by the sudden death of his father. He was at Marsh End now and would very likely stay there a fortnight longer. Was there any lady of the house? Nay, there was naught but her and she was housekeeper. And of her, reader, I could not bear to ask the relief for want of which I was sinking. I could not yet beg. And again I crawled away. Once more I took off my handkerchief. Once more I thought of the cakes of bread in the little shop. Oh, for but a crust, for but one mouthful to allay the pang of famine. Instinctively I turned my face again to the village. I found the shop again, and I went in. And though others were there besides the woman, I ventured the request. Would she give me a roll for this handkerchief? She looked at me with evident suspicion. Nay, she never sold stuff in that way. Almost desperate, I asked for half a cake. She again refused. How could she tell where I had got the handkerchief, she said. Would she take my gloves? No. What could she do with them? Reader, it is not pleasant to dwell on these details. Some say there is enjoyment in looking back to painful experience past. But at this day, I can scarcely bear to review the times to which I allude. The moral degradation, blent with the physical suffering, formed too distressing a recollection ever to be willingly dwelt on. I blamed none of those who repulsed me. I felt it was what was to be expected and what could not be helped. An ordinary beggar is frequently an object of suspicion. A well-dressed beggar, inevitably so. To be sure, what I begged was employment. But whose business was it to provide me with employment? Not certainly that of persons who saw me then for the first time and who knew nothing about my character. 
and as to the woman who would not take my handkerchief in exchange for her bread, why she was right if the offer appeared to her sinister or the exchange unprofitable. Let me condense now. I am sick of the subject. A little before dark I passed a farmhouse, at the open door of which the farmer was sitting, eating his supper of bread and cheese. I stopped and said, Will you give me a piece of bread, for I am very hungry? He cast on me a glance of surprise, but without answering, he cut a thick slice from his loaf and gave it to me. I imagine he did not think I was a beggar, but only an eccentric sort of lady who had taken a fancy to his brown loaf. As soon as I was out of sight of his house, I sat down and ate it. I could not hope to get a lodging under a roof and sought it in the wood I have before alluded to. But my night was wretched, my rest broken. The ground was damp, the air cold. Besides, intruders passed near me more than once, and I had again and again to change my quarters. No sense of safety or tranquility befriended me. Towards morning it rained. The whole of the following day was wet. Do not ask me, reader, to give a minute account of that day. As before, I sought work. As before, I was repulsed. As before, I starved but once did food pass my lips. At the door of a cottage, I saw a little girl about to throw a mess of cold porridge into a pig trough. Will you give me that? I asked. Will you give me that? I asked. She stared at me. Mother, she exclaimed, there is a woman wants me to give her these porridge. Well, lass, replied a voice within, give it her if she's a beggar. To pig doesn't want it. The girl emptied the stiffened mould into my hand and I devoured it ravenously. As the wet twilight deepened, I stopped in a solitary bridle path, which I had been pursuing an hour or more. My strength is quite failing me, I said in a soliloquy. I feel I cannot go much farther. Shall I be an outcast again this night? While the rain descends so, must I lay my head on the cold, drenched ground? I fear I cannot do otherwise, for who will receive me? But it will be very dreadful with this feeling of hunger, faintness, chill, and this sense of desolation, this total prostration of hope. In all likelihood, though, I should die before morning. And why cannot I reconcile myself to the prospect of death? Why do I struggle to retain a valueless life? Because I know or believe Mr. Rochester is living, and then... To die of want and cold is a fate to which nature cannot submit passively. O oh, Providence, sustain me a little longer. Aid, direct me. My glazed eye wandered over the dim and misty landscape. I saw I had strayed far from the village. It was quite out of sight. The very cultivation surrounding it had disappeared. I had, by crossways and by paths, once more drawn near the tract of moorland, and now only a few fields, almost as wild and unproductive as the heath from which they were scarcely reclaimed, lay between me and the dusky hill. Well, I would rather die yonder than in a street or on a frequented road, I reflected, and far better that crows and ravens, if any ravens there be in these regions, should pick my flesh from my bones than that they should be prisoned in a workhouse coffin and moulder in a pauper's grave. To the hill, then, I turned. I reached it. It remained now only to find a hollow where I could lie down and feel at least hidden, if not secure. But all the surface of the waste looked level. It showed no variation but of tint, green, where rush and moss overgrew the marshes, black, where the dry soil bore only heath. Dark as it was getting, I could still see these changes, though but as mere alternations of light and shade, for colour had faded with the daylight. My eye still roved over the sullen swell and along the moor edge, vanishing amidst the wildest scenery, when at one dim point, far in among the marshes and the ridges, a light sprang up. That is an ignis fatuus, was my first thought, and I expected it would soon vanish. It burnt on, however, quite steadily, neither receding nor advancing. Is it, then, a bonfire just kindled? I questioned. I watched to see whether it would spread, but no, 
as it did not diminish, so it did not enlarge. It may be a candle in a house, I then conjectured, but if so, I can never reach it. It is much too far away. And were it within a yard of me, what would it avail? I should but knock at the door to have it shut in my face. And I sank down where I stood and hid my face against the ground. I lay still a while. The night wind swept over the hill and over me and died moaning in the distance. The rain fell fast, wetting me afresh to the skin. Could I but have stiffened to the still frost, the friendly numbness of death, it might have pelted on. I should not have felt it, but my yet living flesh shuddered at its chilling influence. I rose ere long. The light was yet there, shining dim but constant through the rain. I tried to walk again. I dragged my exhausted limbs slowly towards it. It led me aslant over the hill, through a wide bog, which would have been impassable in winter, and was splashy and shaking even now in the height of summer. Here I fell twice, but as often I rose and rallied my faculties. This light was my forlorn hope. I must gain it. Having crossed the marsh, I saw a trace of white over the moor. I approached it. It was a road or a track. It led straight up to the light, which now beamed from a sort of knoll amidst a clump of trees. Firs, apparently, from what I could distinguish, of the character of their forms and foliage through the gloom. My star vanished as I drew near. Some obstacle had intervened between me and it. I put out my hand to feel the dark mass before me. I discriminated the rough stones of a low wall, above it something like palisades, and within, a high and prickly hedge. I groped on. Again, a whitish object gleamed before me. It was a gate, a wicket. It moved on its hinges as I touched it. On each side stood a sable bush, holly or yew. Entering the gate and passing the shrubs, the silhouette of a house rose to view, black, low and rather long, but the guiding light shone nowhere. All was obscurity. Were the inmates retired to rest? I feared it must be so. In seeking the door, I turned an angle. There shot out the friendly gleam again from the lozenged panes of a very small latticed window within a foot of the ground, made still smaller by the growth of ivy or some other creeping plant, whose leaves clustered thick over the portion of the house wall in which it was set. The aperture was so screened and narrow that curtain or shutter had been deemed unnecessary, and when I stooped down and put aside the spray of foliage shooting over it, I could see all within. I could see clearly a room with a sanded floor, clean scoured, a dresser of walnut, with pewter plates ranged in rows, reflecting the redness and radiance of a glowing peat fire. I could see a clock, a white deal table, some chairs. The candle whose ray had been my beacon burnt on the table, and by its light, an elderly woman, somewhat rough-looking, but scrupulously clean like all about her, was knitting a stocking. I noticed these objects cursorily only. In them there was nothing extraordinary. A group of more interest appeared near the hearth, sitting still amidst the rosy peace and warmth suffusing it. Two young, graceful women, ladies in every point, sat, one in a low rocking chair, the other on a lower stool. Both wore deep mourning of crepe and bombazine which sombre garbs singularly set off very fair necks and faces. A large old pointer dog rested its massive head on the knee of one girl. In the lap of the other was cushioned a black cat. A strange place was this humble kitchen for such occupants. Who were they? They could not be the daughters of the elderly person at the table, for she looked like a rustic, and they were all delicacy and cultivation. I had nowhere seen such faces as theirs. And yet, as I gazed on them, I seemed intimate with every lineament. I cannot call them handsome. They were too pale and grave for the word. As they each bent over a book, they looked thoughtful almost to severity. A stand between them supported a second candle and two great volumes, to which they frequently referred, comparing them seemingly with the smaller books they held in their hands, like people consulting a dictionary 
to aid them in the task of translation. This scene was as silent as if all the figures had been shadows and the firelit apartment a picture. So hushed was it, I could hear the cinders fall from the grate, the clock tick in its obscure corner. And I even fancied I could distinguish the click-click of the woman's knitting needles. When, therefore, a voice broke the strange stillness at last, it was audible enough to me. Listen, Diana, said one of the absorbed students. Franz and old Daniel are together in the night time, and Franz is telling a dream from which he has awakened in terror. Listen. And in a low voice she read something, of which not one word was intelligible to me, for it was in an unknown tongue, neither French nor Latin. Whether it were Greek or German, I could not tell. That is strong, she said when she had finished. I relish it. The other girl, who had lifted her head to listen to her sister, repeated, while she gazed at the fire, a line of what had been read. At a later day, I knew the language and the book. Therefore, I will here quote the line. Though, when I first heard it, it was only like a stroke on sounding brass to me, conveying no meaning. Da trat hervor einer anzusehen wie die Sternen Nacht. Good, good, she exclaimed while her dark and deep eyes sparkled. There you have a dim and mighty archangel fitly set before you. The line is worth a hundred pages of Fustian. Ich wäge die Gedanken in der Schale meines Zornes und die Werke mit dem Gewichte meines Grimms. I like it. Both were again silent. Is there one country where they talk e that way? asked the old woman, looking up from her knitting. Yes, Hannah, a far larger country than England, where they talk in no other way. Well, for sure case, I know how they can understand to one t'other. And if either of you went there, you could tell what they said, I guess. We could probably tell something of what they said, but not all. For we are not as clever as you think us, Hannah. We don't speak German and we cannot read it without a dictionary to help us. And what good does it do you? We mean to teach it sometime, or at least the elements, as they say, and then we shall get more money than we do now. Very like, but give all a studying. You've done enough for tonight. I think we have, at least I'm tired. Mary, are you? Mortally, after all, it's tough work fagging away at a language with no master but a lexicon. It is, especially such a language as this crabbed but glorious Deutsch. I wonder when St. John will come home. Surely he will not be long now. It is just ten, looking at a little gold watch she drew from her girdle. It rains fast, Hannah. Will you have the goodness to look at the fire in the parlour? The woman rose. She opened a door, through which I dimly saw a passage. Soon I heard her stir a fire in an inner room. She presently came back. Ah, Childa, said she, it fair troubles me to go into yond room now. It looks so lonesome with the chair empty and set back in a corner. She wiped her eyes with her apron. The two girls, grave before, looked sad now. But he is in a better place, continued Hannah. We shouldn't wish him here again. And then nobody need to have a quieter death nor he had. You say he never mentioned us? inquired one of the ladies. He hadn't time, Bern. He was gone in a minute, was your father. He had been a bit ailing like the day before, but naught to signify. And when Mr. St. John asked if he would like either of ye to be sent for, he fair laughed at him. He began again with a bit of a heaviness in his head the next day, that is, a fortnight's sin. And he went to sleep and never wakened. He were a most stark when your brother went into the chamber and fanned him. Ah, Childa, that's to last a told stock, for ye and Mr. St. John is like of different sort to them that's gone. For all your mother were my should your way and a most as book learned. She were the picture, O oh ye Mary. Diana is more like your father. I thought them so similar I could not tell where the old servant, for such I now concluded her to be, saw the difference. Both were fair complexioned and slenderly made. Both possessed faces full of distinction and intelligence. One, to be sure, had hair a shade darker than the other, and there was a difference in their style of wearing it. Mary's pale brown locks were parted and braided smooth. Diana's duskier tresses covered her neck with thick curls. 
The clock struck ten. You'll want your supper, I am sure, observed Hannah, and so will Mr. St. John when he comes in. And she proceeded to prepare the meal. The ladies rose, they seemed about to withdraw to the parlour. Till this moment, I had been so intent on watching them, their appearance and conversation had excited in me so keen an interest, I had half forgotten my own wretched position. Now it recurred to me. More desolate, more desperate than ever, it seemed, from contrast. And how impossible did it appear to touch the inmates of this house with concern on my behalf, to make them believe in the truth of my wants and woes, to induce them to vouchsafe a rest for my wanderings. As I groped out the door and knocked at it hesitatingly, I felt that last idea to be a mere chimera. Hannah opened. What do you want? she inquired in a voice of surprise as she surveyed me by the light of the candle she held. May I speak to your mistresses? I said. You had better tell me what you have to say to them. Where do you come from? I am a stranger. What is your business here at this hour? I want a night's shelter in an outhouse or anywhere, and a morsel of bread to eat. Distrust, the very feeling I dreaded, appeared in Hannah's face. I'll give you a piece of bread, she said after a pause, but we can't take in a vagrant to lodge. It isn't likely. Do let me speak to your mistresses. No, not I. What can they do for you? You should not be roving about now. It looks very ill. But where shall I go if you drive me away? What shall I do? Oh, I'll warrant you know where to go and what to do. Mind you don't do wrong, that's all. Here is a penny. Now go. A penny cannot feed me and I have no strength to go farther. Don't shut the door. Oh, don't for God's sake. I must. The rain is driving in. Tell the young ladies. Let me see them. Indeed, I will not. You are not what you ought to be or you wouldn't make such a noise. Move off. But I must die if I am turned away. Not you. I'm feared you have some ill plans, Agati, that bring you about folks' houses at this time o' night. If you've any followers, whose breakers or such like, anywhere near, you may tell them we are not by ourselves in the house. We have a gentleman and dogs and guns. Here the honest but inflexible servant clapped the door to and bolted it within. This was the climax, a pang of exquisite suffering, a throe of true despair, rent and heaved my heart. Worn out indeed I was, not another step could I stir. I sank on the wet doorstep. I groaned, I wrung my hands, I wept in utter anguish. Oh, this spectre of death, oh, this last hour, approaching in such horror. Alas, this isolation, this banishment from my kind. Not only the anchor of hope, but the footing of fortitude was gone, at least for a moment, but the last I soon endeavoured to regain. I can but die, I said, and I believe in God. Let me try to wait his will in silence. These words I not only thought, but uttered, and thrusting back all my misery into my heart, I made an effort to compel it to remain there, dumb and still. All men must die, said a voice quite close at hand, but all are not condemned to meet a lingering and premature doom, such as yours would be if you perished here of want. Who or what speaks? I asked, terrified at the unexpected sound and incapable now of deriving from any occurrence a hope of aid. A form was near. What form? The pitch-dark night, and my enfeebled vision prevented me from distinguishing. With a loud long knock, the newcomer appealed to the door. Is it you, Mr. St. John? cried Hannah. Yes, yes, open quickly. Well, how wet and cold you must be, such a wild night as it is. Come in. Your sisters are quite uneasy about you, and I believe there are bad folks about. There has been a beggar woman. I declare she is not gone yet. Lay down there. Get up. For shame. Move off, I say. Hush, Hannah. I have a word to say to the woman. You have done your duty in excluding. Now let me do mine in admitting her. I was near and listened to both you and her. I think this is a peculiar case. I must at least examine into it. Young woman, rise and pass before me into the house. Hush, Hannah. 
I have a word to say to the woman. With difficulty, I obeyed him. Presently, I stood within that clean, bright kitchen, on the very hearth, trembling, sickening, conscious of an aspect in the last degree ghastly wild and weather-beaten. The two ladies, their brother, Mr. St. John, the old servant, were all gazing at me. St. John, who is it? I heard one ask. I cannot tell. I found her at the door, was the reply. She does look white, said Hannah. As white as clay or death, was responded. She will fall, let her sit. And indeed, my head swam. I dropped, but a chair received me. I still possessed my senses, though just now I could not speak. Perhaps a little water would restore her. Hannah, fetch some. But she is worn to nothing. How very thin and how very bloodless. A mere spectre. Is she ill or only famished? Famished, I think. Hannah, is that milk? Give it me and a piece of bread. Diana, I knew her by the long curls which I saw drooping between me and the fire as she bent over me, broke some bread, dipped it in milk and put it to my lips. Her face was near mine. I saw there was pity in it and I felt sympathy in her hurried breathing. In her simple words, too, the same balm-like emotions spoke. Try to eat? Yes, try, repeated Mary gently. And Mary's hand removed my sodden bonnet and lifted my head. I tasted what they offered me, feebly at first, eagerly soon. Not too much at first. Restrain her, said the brother. She has had enough. And he withdrew the cup of milk and the plate of breed. A little more, St. John. Look at the avidity in her eyes. No more at present, sister. Try if she can speak now. Ask her her name. I felt I could speak, and I answered, My name is Jane Elliot. Anxious as ever to avoid discovery, I had before resolved to assume an alias. And where do you live? Where are your friends? I was silent. Can we send for anyone you know? I shook my head. What account can you give of yourself? Somehow, now that I had once crossed the threshold of this house, and once was brought face to face with its owners, I felt no longer outcast, vagrant, and disowned by the wide world. I dared to put off the mendicant, to resume my natural manner and character. I began once more to know myself, and when Mr. St. John demanded an account, which at present I was far too weak to render, I said after a brief pause, Sir, I can give you no details tonight. But what then, said he, do you expect me to do for you? Nothing, I replied. My strength sufficed for but short answers. Diana took the word. Do you mean, she asked, that we have now given you what aid you require, and that we may dismiss you to the moor? and the rainy night. I looked at her. She had, I thought, a remarkable countenance, instinct both with power and goodness. I took sudden courage. Answering her compassionate gaze with a smile, I said, I will trust you. If I were a masterless and stray dog, I know that you would not turn me from your hearth tonight. As it is, I really have no fear. Do with me and for me as you like, but excuse me from much discourse. My breath is short. I feel a spasm when I speak. All three surveyed me, and all three were silent. Hannah, said Mr. St. John at last, let her sit there at present and ask her no questions. In ten minutes more, give her the remainder of that milk and bread. Mary and Diana, let us go into the parlour and talk the matter over. They withdrew. Very soon one of the ladies returned. I could not tell which. A kind of pleasant stupor was stealing over me as I sat by the genial fire. In an undertone, she gave some directions to Hannah. Ere long, with the servant's aid, I contrived to mount a staircase. My dripping clothes were removed. Soon a warm, dry bed received me. I thanked God, experienced amidst unutterable exhaustion, a glow of grateful joy, and slept. Chapter 29 the recollection of about three days and nights succeeding this is very dim in my mind. I can recall some sensations felt in that interval, but few thoughts framed and no actions performed. 
I knew I was in a small room and in a narrow bed. To that bed I seemed to have grown. I lay on it motionless as a stone, and to have torn me from it would have been almost to kill me. I took no note of the lapse of time, of the change from morning to noon, from noon to evening. I observed when anyone entered or left the apartment. I could even tell who they were. I could understand what was said when the speaker stood near to me, but I could not answer. To open my lips or move my limbs was equally impossible. Hannah, the servant, was my most frequent visitor. Her coming disturbed me. I had a feeling that she wished me away, that she did not understand me or my circumstances, that she was prejudiced against me. Diana and Mary appeared in the chamber once or twice a day. They would whisper sentences of this sort at my bedside. It is very well we took her in. Yes, she would certainly have been found dead at the door in the morning had she been left out all night. I wonder what she has gone through. Strange hardships, I imagine. Poor, emaciated, pallid wanderer. She is not an uneducated person, I should think, by her manner of speaking. Her accent was quite pure. And the clothes she took off, though splashed and wet, were little worn and fine. She has a peculiar face, fleshless and haggard as it is. I rather like it. And when in good health and animated, I can fancy her physiognomy would be agreeable. Never once in their dialogues did I hear a syllable of regret at the hospitality they had extended to me, or of suspicion of, or aversion to, myself. I was comforted. Mr. St. John came but once. He looked at me and said my state of lethargy was the result of reaction from excessive and protracted fatigue. He pronounced it needless to send for a doctor. Nature, he was sure, would manage best, left to herself. He said every nerve had been overstrained in some way, and the whole system must sleep torpid a while. There was no disease. He imagined my recovery would be rapid enough when once commenced. These opinions he delivered in a few words, in a quiet, low voice, and added, after a pause, in the tone of a man little accustomed to expansive comment, rather an unusual physiognomy, certainly not indicative of vulgarity or degradation. Far otherwise, responded Diana, to speak truth, St. John, my heart rather warms to the poor little soul. I wish we may be able to benefit her permanently. That is hardly likely, was the reply. You will find she is some young lady who has had a misunderstanding with her friends and has probably injudiciously left them. We may perhaps succeed in restoring her to them, if she is not obstinate but I trace lines of force in her face which make me sceptical of her tractability. He stood considering me some minutes, then added, She looks sensible, but not at all handsome. She is so ill, St. John. Ill or well, she would always be plain. The grace and harmony of beauty are quite wanting in those features. On the third day I was better. On the fourth, I could speak, move, rise in bed, and turn. Hannah had brought me some gruel and dry toast, about, as I supposed, the dinner hour. I had eaten with relish. The food was good, void of the feverish flavour which had hitherto poisoned what I had swallowed. When she left me, I felt comparatively strong and revived. Ere long satiety of repose and desire for action stirred me. I wished to rise, but what could I put on? Only my damp and bemired apparel in which I had slept on the ground and fallen in the marsh. I felt ashamed to appear before my benefactors so clad. I was spared the humiliation. On a chair by the bedside were all my own things, clean and dry. My black silk frock hung against the wall. The traces of the bog were removed from it, the creases left by the wet smoothed out. It was quite decent. My very shoes and stockings were purified and rendered presentable. There were the means of washing in the room and a comb and brush to smooth my hair. After a weary process and resting every five minutes, I succeeded in dressing myself. My clothes hung loose on me, for I was much wasted, but I covered deficiencies with a shawl 
and once more clean and respectable looking. No speck of the dirt, no trace of the disorder I so hated, and which seemed so to degrade me, left. I crept down a stone staircase with the aid of the banisters to a narrow low passage and found my way presently to the kitchen. It was full of the fragrance of new bread and the warmth of a generous fire. Hannah was baking. Prejudices, it is well known, are most difficult to eradicate from the heart whose soil has never been loosened or fertilised by education. They grow there, firm as weeds among stones. Hannah had been cold and stiff indeed at the first. Latterly she had begun to relent a little, and when she saw me come in tidy and well-dressed, she even smiled. What? You have got up, she said. You are better then. You may sit you down in my chair on the hearthstone, if you will. She pointed to the rocking chair. I took it. She bustled about, examining me every now and then with the corner of her eye. Turning to me as she took some loaves from the oven, she asked bluntly, Did you ever go a-begging afore you came here? I was indignant for a moment, but remembering that anger was out of the question and that I had indeed appeared as a beggar to her, I answered quietly, but still not without a certain marked firmness. You are mistaken in supposing me a beggar. I am no beggar, any more than yourself or your young ladies. After a pause, she said, I do not understand that. You've like no house nor no brass, I guess. The want of house or brass, by which I suppose you mean money, does not make a beggar in your sense of the word. Are you book learned? She inquired presently. Yes, very. But you've never been to a boarding school. I was at a boarding school eight years. She opened her eyes wide. Whatever cannot ye keep yourself for, then? I have kept myself, and I trust shall keep myself again. What are you going to do with these gooseberries? I inquired, as she brought out a basket of the fruit. Mack them into pies. Give them to me, and I'll pick them. Nay, I do not want ye to do naught. But I must do something. Let me have them. She consented, and she even brought me a clean towel to spread over my dress. Lest, as she said, I should mucky it. You've not been used to servant's walk, I see by your hands, she remarked. Happen you've been a dressmaker? No, you are wrong. And now, never mind what I have been. Don't trouble your head further about me, but tell me the name of the house where we are. Some calls it Marsh End, and some calls it Moor House. And the gentleman who lives here is called Mr. St. John? Nay. He doesn't live here. He is only staying a while. When he is at home, he is in his own parish at Morton. That village a few miles off? Aye. And what is he? He is a parson. I remembered the answer of the old housekeeper at the parsonage when I had asked to see the clergyman. This, then, was his father's residence. Aye, old Mr. Rivers lived here, and his father, and grandfather, and Gert great-grandfather, afore him. The name, then, of that gentleman is Mr. St. John Rivers. Aye, St. John is like his kirstened name. And his sisters are called Diana and Mary Rivers. Yes. Their father is dead? Dead three weeks sin of a stroke. They have no mother? The mistress has been dead this money a year. Have you lived with the family long? I've lived here thirty year. I nursed them all three. That proves you must have been an honest and faithful servant. I will say so much for you, though you have had the incivility to call me a beggar. She again regarded me with a surprised stare. I believe, she said, I was quite mistaken in my thoughts of you, but there is so many cheats goes about you mon forgy me. And though, I continued rather severely, you wish to turn me from the door on a night when you should not have shut out a dog. Well, it was hard, but what can a body do? I thought more of the childer nor of my cell. Poor things, they've like nobody to take care on them but me. I'm like to look sharpish. I maintained a grave silence for some minutes. You munnet think too hardly of me, she again remarked. But I do think hardly of you, I said, and I'll tell you why. Not so much because you refuse to give me shelter, 
or regarded me as an imposter, as because you just now made it a species of reproach that I had no brass and no house. Some of the best people that ever lived have been as destitute as I am, and if you are a Christian, you ought not to consider poverty a crime. No more I ought, said she. Mr. St. John tells me so too, and I see I were rang, but I've clear a different notion on you now to what I had. You look a rate down decent little crater. That will do, I forgive you now. Shake hands. She put her flowery and horny hand into mine. Another and heartier smile illumined her rough face, and from that moment we were friends. Hannah was evidently fond of talking. While I picked the fruit, and she made the paste for the pies, she proceeded to give me sundry details about her deceased master and mistress, and the childer, as she called the young people. Old Mr. Rivers, she said, was a plain man enough, but a gentleman, and of as ancient a family as could be found. Marsh End had belonged to the Rivers ever since it was a house, and it was, she affirmed, a boon two hundred year old, for all it looked but a small, humble place, naught to compare with Mr. Oliver's grand hall down in Morton Vale. But she could remember Bill Oliver's father, a journeyman needle maker, and the Rivers were gentry i the old days of the Henrys as anybody might see by looking into the register's I Morton Church vestry. Still, she allowed, the old maester was like other folk, naught mish out at a common way, stark mad of shooting and farming and sick-like. The mistress was different. She was a great reader and studied a deal, and the bairns had taken after her. There was nothing like them in these parts, nor ever had been. They had liked learning, all three almost from the time they could speak and they had always been of a mark of their own. Mr. St. John, when he grew up, would go to college and be a parson, and the girls, as soon as they left school, would seek places as governesses, for they had told her their father had some years ago lost a great deal of money by a man he had trusted turning bankrupt, and as he was now not rich enough to give them fortunes, they must provide for themselves. They had lived very little at home for a long while, and were only come now to stay a few weeks on account of their father's death. But they did so like Marsh End and Morton, and all these moors and hills about. They had been in London and many other grand towns, but they always said there was no place like home. And then they were so agreeable with each other, never fell out nor threpped. She did not know where there was such a family for being united. Having finished my task of gooseberry picking, I asked where the two ladies and their brother were now. Gone over to Morton for a walk, but they would be back in half an hour to tea. They returned within the time Hannah had allotted them. They entered by the kitchen door. Mr. St. John, when he saw me, merely bowed and passed through. The two ladies stopped. Mary, in a few words, kindly and calmly expressed the pleasure she felt in seeing me well enough to be able to come down. Diana took my hand. She shook her head at me. You should have waited for my leave to descend, she said. You still look very pale and so thin. Poor child, poor girl. Diana had a voice toned to my ear, like the cooing of a dove. She possessed eyes whose gaze I delighted to encounter. Her whole face seemed to me full of charm. Mary's countenance was equally intelligent, her features equally pretty but her expression was more reserved, and her manners, though gentle, more distant. Diana looked and spoke with a certain authority. She had a will, evidently. It was my nature to feel pleasure in yielding to an authority supported like hers, and to bend, where my conscience and self-respect permitted, to an active will. And what business have you here? She continued. It is not your place. Mary and I sit in the kitchen sometimes, because at home we like to be free, even to license, but you are a visitor and must go into the parlour. I am very well here. Not at all, with Hannah bustling about and covering you with flour. Besides, the fire is too hot for you, interposed Mary. To be sure, added her sister. Come, you must be obedient. And still holding my hand, she made me rise and led me into the inner room. Sit there, she said, placing me on the sofa, while we take our things off and get the tea ready. 
it is another privilege we exercise in our little moorland home to prepare our own meals when we are so inclined, or when Hannah is baking, brewing, washing, or ironing. She closed the door, leaving me solace with Mr. St. John, who sat opposite, a book or newspaper in his hand. I examined first the parlour, and then its occupant. The parlour was rather a small room, very plainly furnished, yet comfortable, because clean and neat. The old-fashioned chairs were very bright, and the walnut wood table was like a looking glass. A few strange antique portraits of the men and women of other days decorated the stained walls. A cupboard with glass doors contained some books and an ancient set of china. There was no superfluous ornament in the room, not one modern piece of furniture, save a brace of workboxes and a lady's desk in rosewood, which stood on a side table. Everything, including the carpet and curtains, looked at once well-worn and well-saved. Mr. St. John, sitting as still as one of the dusty pictures on the walls, keeping his eyes fixed on the page he perused and his lips mutely sealed, was easy enough to examine. Had he been a statue instead of a man, he could not have been easier. He was young, perhaps from twenty-eight to thirty, tall, slender, his face riveted the eye. It was like a Greek face, very pure in outline, quite a straight classic nose, quite an Athenian mouth and chin. It is seldom indeed an English face comes so near the antique models as did his. He might well be a little shocked at the irregularity of my lineaments, his own being so harmonious. His eyes were large and blue with brown lashes, his high forehead colourless as ivory, was partially streaked over by careless locks of fair hair. This is a gentle delineation, is it not, reader? Yet, he whom it describes scarcely impressed one with the idea of a gentle, a yielding, an impressible, or even of a placid nature. Quiescent as he now sat, there was something about his nostril, his mouth, his brow, which, to my perceptions, indicated elements within either restless, or hard, or eager. He did not speak to me one word, nor even direct to me one glance, till his sisters returned. Diana, as she passed in and out, in the course of preparing tea, brought me a little cake, baked on the top of the oven. Eat that now, she said. You must be hungry. Hannah says you have had nothing but some gruel since breakfast. I did not refuse it, for my appetite was awakened and keen. Mr. Rivers now closed his book, approached the table, and, as he took a seat, fixed his blue pictorial-looking eyes full on me. There was an unceremonious directness, a searching, decided steadfastness in his gaze now, which told that intention, and not diffidence, had hitherto kept it averted from the stranger. You are very hungry, he said. I am, sir. It is my way. It always was my way, by instinct ever to meet the brief with brevity, the direct with plainness. It is well for you that a low fever has forced you to abstain for the last three days. There would have been danger in yielding to the cravings of your appetite at first. Now you may eat, though still not immoderately. I trust I shall not eat long at your expense, sir, was my very clumsily contrived, unpolished answer. No, he said coolly. When you have indicated to us the residence of your friends, we can write to them, and you may be restored to home. That, I must plainly tell you, is out of my power to do, being absolutely without home and friends. The three looked at me, but not distrustfully. I felt there was no suspicion in their glances. There was more of curiosity. I speak particularly of the young ladies. St. John's eyes, though clear enough in a literal sense, in a figurative one, were difficult to fathom. He seemed to use them rather as instruments to search other people's thoughts than as agents to reveal his own. The which combination of keenness and reserve was considerably more calculated to embarrass than to encourage. Do you mean to say, he asked, that you are completely isolated from every connection? I do. Not a tie links me to any living thing. Not a claim do I possess to admittance under any roof in England. A most singular position at your age. 
Here I saw his glance directed to my hands, which were folded on the table before me. I wondered what he sought there. His words soon explained the quest. You have never been married. You are a spinster? Diana laughed. Why, she can't be above 17 or 18 years old, St. John, said she. I am near 19, but I am not married. No. I felt a burning glow mount to my face, for bitter and agitating recollections were awakened by the allusion to marriage. They all saw the embarrassment and the emotion. Diana and Mary relieved me by turning their eyes elsewhere than to my crimsoned visage, but the colder and sterner brother continued to gaze till the trouble he had excited forced out tears as well as colour. Where did you last reside? he now asked. You are too inquisitive, St. John, murmured Mary in a low voice. But he leaned over the table and required an answer by a second firm and piercing look. The name of the place where, and of the person with whom I lived, is my secret, I replied concisely. Which, if you like, you have, in my opinion, a right to keep, both from St. John and every other questioner, remarked Diana. Yet if I know nothing about you or your history, I cannot help you, he said. And you need help, do you not? I need it, and I seek it so far, sir, that some true philanthropist will put me in the way of getting work which I can do, and the remuneration for which will keep me, if but in the barest necessaries of life. I know not whether I am a true philanthropist, yet I am willing to aid you to the utmost of my power in a purpose so honest. First, then, tell me what you have been accustomed to do and what you can do. I had now swallowed my tea. I was mightily refreshed by the beverage, as much so as a giant with wine. It gave new tone to my unstrung nerves and enabled me to address this penetrating young judge steadily. Mr. Rivers, I said, turning to him and looking at him, as he looked at me, openly and without diffidence. You and your sisters have done me a great service. The greatest man can do his fellow being. You have rescued me by your noble hospitality from death. This benefit conferred gives you an unlimited claim on my gratitude and a claim to a certain extent on my confidence. I will tell you as much of the history of the wanderer you have harboured as I can tell without compromising my own peace of mind, my own security, moral and physical, and that of others. I am an orphan, the daughter of a clergyman. My parents died before I could know them. I was brought up a dependent, educated in a charitable institution. I will even tell you the name of the establishment where I passed six years as a pupil and two as a teacher. Lowood Orphan Asylum, Shire. You will have heard of it, Mr. Rivers. The Rev. Robert Brocklehurst is the treasurer. I have heard of Mr. Brocklehurst, and I have seen the school. I left Lowood nearly a year since to become a private governess. I obtained a good situation and was happy. This place I was obliged to leave four days before I came here. The reason of my departure I cannot and ought not to explain. It would be useless, dangerous, and would sound incredible. No blame attached to me. I am as free from culpability as any one of you three. Miserable I am, and must be for a time. For the catastrophe which drove me from a house I had found a paradise was of a strange and direful nature. I observed but two points in planning my departure. Speed, secrecy. To secure these, I had to leave behind me everything I possessed, except a small parcel, which, in my hurry and trouble of mind, I forgot to take out of the coach that brought me to Whitcross. To this neighbourhood, then, I came quite destitute. I slept two nights in the open air, and wandered about two days without crossing a threshold. But twice in that space of time did I taste food, and it was when brought by hunger, exhaustion, and despair, almost to the last gasp, that you, Mr. Rivers, forbade me to perish of want at your door, and took me under the shelter of your roof. I know all your sisters have done for me since, 
for I have not been insensible during my seeming torpor, and I owe to their spontaneous, genuine, genial compassion as large a debt as to your evangelical charity. Don't make her talk any more now, St. John, said Diana as I paused. She is evidently not yet fit for excitement. Come to the sofa and sit down now, Miss Elliot. I gave an involuntary half-start at hearing the alias. I had forgotten my new name. Mr. Rivers, whom nothing seemed to escape, noticed it at once. You said your name was Jane Elliot, he observed. I did say so, and it is the name by which I think it expedient to be called at present, but it is not my real name, and when I hear it, it sounds strange to me. Your real name you will not give. No, I fear discovery above all things, and whatever disclosure would lead to it, I avoid. You are quite right, I am sure, said Diana. Now do, brother, let her be at peace a while. But when St. John had mused a few moments, he recommenced as imperturbably and with as much acumen as ever. You would not like to be long dependent on our hospitality. You would wish, I see, to dispense as soon as may be with my sister's compassion and above all with my charity. I am quite sensible of the distinction drawn, nor do I resent it. It is just. You desire to be independent of us. I do. I have already said so. Show me how to work or how to seek work. That is all I now ask. Then let me go if it be but to the meanest cottage. But till then, allow me to stay here. I dread another essay of the horrors of homeless destitution. Indeed, you shall stay here, said Diana, putting her white hand on my head. You shall, repeated Mary, in the tone of undemonstrative sincerity which seemed natural to her. My sisters, you see, have a pleasure in keeping you, said Mr. St. John, as they would have a pleasure in keeping and cherishing a half-frozen bird some wintry wind might have driven through their casement. I feel more inclination to put you in the way of keeping yourself and shall endeavour to do so. But observe, my sphere is narrow. I am but the incumbent of a poor country parish. My aid must be of the humblest sort. And if you are inclined to despise the day of small things, seek some more efficient succour than such as I can offer. She has already said that she is willing to do anything honest she can do, answered Diana for me. And you know, St. John, she has no choice of helpers. She is forced to put up with such crusty people as you. I will be a dressmaker. I will be a plain workwoman. I will be a servant, a nurse girl, if I can be no better, I answered. Right, said Mr. St. John quite coolly. If such is your spirit, I promise to aid you in my own time and way. And he now resumed the book with which he had been occupied before tea. I soon withdrew, for I had talked as much and sat up as long as my present strength would permit. Chapter 30 The more I knew of the inmates of Morehouse, the better I liked them. In a few days, I had so far recovered my health that I could sit up all day and walk out sometimes. I could join with Diana and Mary in all their occupations, converse with them as much as they wished, and aid them when and where they would allow me. There was a reviving pleasure in this intercourse, of a kind now tasted by me for the first time, the pleasure arising from perfect congeniality of tastes, sentiments, and principles. I liked to read what they liked to read, what they enjoyed, delighted me, what they approved, I reverenced. They loved their sequestered home. I, too, in the grey, small, antique structure, with its low roof, its latticed casements, its mouldering walls, its avenue of aged firs, all grown aslant under the stress of mountain winds, its garden, dark with yew and holly, and where no flowers but of the hardiest species would bloom, found a charm both potent and permanent. They clung to the purple moors behind and around their dwelling, to the hollow vale into which the pebbly bridle path leading from their gate descended and which wound between fern banks first, and then amongst a few of the wildest little pasture fields that ever bordered a wilderness of heath, 
or gave sustenance to a flock of grey moorland sheep with their little mossy-faced lambs. They clung to this scene, I say, with a perfect enthusiasm of attachment. I could comprehend the feeling and share both its strength and truth. I saw the fascination of the locality. I felt the consecration of its loneliness. My eye feasted on the outline of swell and sweep, on the wild colouring communicated to ridge and dell by moss, by heathbell, by flower-sprinkled turf, by brilliant bracken and mellow granite crag. These details were just to me what they were to them. So many pure and sweet sources of pleasure. The strong blast and the soft breeze, the rough and the halcyon day, the hours of sunrise and sunset, the moonlight and the clouded night developed for me in these regions the same attraction as for them, wound round my faculties the same spell that entranced theirs. Indoors we agreed equally well. They were both more accomplished and better read than I was, but with eagerness I followed in the path of knowledge they had trodden before me. I devoured the books they lent me. Then it was full satisfaction to discuss with them in the evening what I had perused during the day. Thought fitted thought. Opinion met opinion. We coincided, in short, perfectly. If in our trio there was a superior and a leader, it was Diana. Physically, she far excelled me. She was handsome. She was vigorous. In her animal spirits, there was an affluence of life and certainty of flow, such as excited my wonder, while it baffled my comprehension. I could talk a while when the evening commenced, but the first gush of vivacity and fluency gone, I was fain to sit on a stool at Diana's feet, to rest my head on her knee, and listen alternately to her and Mary, while they sounded thoroughly the topic on which I had but touched. Diana offered to teach me German. I liked to learn of her. I saw the part of instructress pleased and suited her, that of scholar pleased and suited me no less. Our natures dovetailed, mutual affection of the strongest kind was the result. They discovered I could draw. Their pencils and colour boxes were immediately at my service. My skill, greater in this one point than theirs, surprised and charmed them. Mary would sit and watch me by the hour together. Then she would take lessons, and a docile, intelligent, assiduous pupil she made. Thus occupied and mutually entertained, days passed like hours and weeks like days. As to Mr. St. John, the intimacy which had arisen so naturally and rapidly between me and his sisters did not extend to him. One reason of the distance yet observed between us was that he was comparatively seldom at home. A large proportion of his time appeared devoted to visiting the sick and poor among the scattered population of his parish. No weather seemed to hinder him in these pastoral excursions. Rain or fair, he would when his hours of morning study were over, take his hat and, followed by his father's old pointer, Carlo, go out on his mission of love or duty, I scarcely know in which light he regarded it. Sometimes, when the day was very unfavourable, his sisters would expostulate. He would then say with a peculiar smile, more solemn than cheerful, and if I let a gust of wind or a sprinkling of rain turn me aside from these easy tasks, what preparation would such sloth be for the future I propose to myself? Diana and Mary's general answer to this question was a sigh and some minutes of apparently mournful meditation. But besides his frequent absences, there was another barrier to friendship with him. He seemed of a reserved, an abstracted, and even of a brooding nature zealous in his ministerial labours, blameless in his life and habits, he yet did not appear to enjoy that mental serenity, that inward content, which should be the reward of every sincere Christian and practical philanthropist. Often of an evening, when he sat at the window, his desk and papers before him, he would cease reading or writing, rest his chin on his hand, and deliver himself up to I know not what course of thought but that it was perturbed and exciting might be seen in the frequent flash and changeful dilation of his eye. I think, moreover, that nature was not to him that treasury of delight it was to his sisters. 
He expressed once and but once in my hearing a strong sense of the rugged charm of the hills and an inborn affection for the dark roof and hoary walls he called his home. But there was more of gloom than pleasure in the tone and words in which the sentiment was manifested, and never did he seem to roam the moors for the sake of their soothing silence, never seek out or dwell upon the thousand peaceful delights they could yield. Incommunicative as he was, some time elapsed before I had an opportunity of gauging his mind. I first got an idea of its calibre when I heard him preach in his own church at Morton. I wish I could describe that sermon, but it is past my power. I cannot even render faithfully the effect it produced on me. It began calm, and indeed, as far as delivery and pitch of voice went, it was calm to the end. An earnestly felt, yet strictly restrained zeal breathed soon in the distinct accents and prompted the nervous language. This grew to force, compressed, condensed, controlled. The heart was thrilled, the mind astonished by the power of the preacher. Neither were softened. Throughout there was a strange bitterness, an absence of consolatory gentleness, stern allusions to Calvinistic doctrines, election, predestination, reprobation, were frequent, and each reference to these points sounded like a sentence pronounced for doom. When he had done, instead of feeling better, calmer, more enlightened by his discourse, I experienced an inexpressible sadness, for it seemed to me, I know not whether equally so to others, that the eloquence to which I had been listening had sprung from a depth where lay turbid dregs of disappointment, where moved troubling impulses of insatiate yearnings and disquieting aspirations. I was sure St. John Rivers, pure-lived, conscientious, zealous as he was, had not yet found that peace of God which passeth all understanding. He had no more found it, I thought, than had I, with my concealed and racking regrets for my broken idol and lost Elysium, regrets to which I have latterly avoided referring, but which possessed me and tyrannised over me ruthlessly. Meantime, a month was gone. Diana and Mary were soon to leave Moor House and return to the far different life and scene which awaited them, as governesses in a large, fashionable South of England city, where each held a situation in families by whose wealthy and haughty members they were regarded only as humble dependents, and who neither knew nor sought out their innate excellences, and appreciated only their acquired accomplishments, as they appreciated the skill of their cook or the taste of their waiting woman. Mr. St. John had said nothing to me yet about the employment he had promised to obtain for me, yet it became urgent that I should have a vocation of some kind. One morning, being left alone with him a few minutes in the parlour, I ventured to approach the window recess, which his table, chair and desk consecrated as a kind of study. And I was going to speak, though not very well knowing in what words to frame my inquiry, for it is at all times difficult to break the ice of reserve glassing over such natures as his, when he saved me the trouble by being the first to commence a dialogue. Looking up as I drew near, you have a question to ask of me, he said. Yes, I wish to know whether you have heard of any service I can offer myself to undertake. I found or devised something for you three weeks ago, but as you seemed both useful and happy here, as my sisters had evidently become attached to you and your society gave them unusual pleasure, I deemed it inexpedient to break in on your mutual comfort till their approaching departure from Marsh End should render yours necessary. And they will go in three days now, I said. Yes, and when they go I shall return to the parsonage at Morton. Hannah will accompany me, and this old house will be shut up. I waited a few moments, expecting he would go on with the subject first broached, but he seemed to have entered another train of reflection. His look denoted abstraction from me and my business. I was obliged to recall him to a theme which was of necessity one of close and anxious interest to me. What is the employment you had in view, Mr. Rivers? I hope this delay will not have increased the difficulty of securing it. 
Oh no, since it is an employment which depends only on me to give and you to accept. He again paused. There seemed a reluctance to continue. I grew impatient. A restless movement or two and an eager and exacting glance fastened on his face conveyed the feeling to him as effectually as words could have done and with less trouble. You need be in no hurry to hear, he said. Let me frankly tell you, I have nothing eligible or profitable to suggest. Before I explain, recall, if you please, my notice, clearly given, that if I helped you, it must be as the blind man would help the lame. I am poor, for I find that, when I have paid my father's debts, all the patrimony remaining to me will be this crumbling grange, the row of scathed firs behind, and the patch of moorish soil with the yew trees and holly bushes in front. I am obscure. Rivers is an old name. But of the three sole descendants of the race, two earn the dependent's crust among strangers, and the third considers himself an alien from his native country, not only for life, but in death. Yes, and deems, and is bound to deem, himself honoured by the lot, and aspires but after the day when the cross of separation from fleshly ties shall be laid on his shoulders, and when the head of that church militant, of whose humblest members he is one, shall give the word, Rise, follow me. St. John said these words as he pronounced his sermons, with a quiet, deep voice, with an unflushed cheek, and a coruscating radiance of glance. He resumed, And since I am myself poor and obscure, I can offer you but a service of poverty and obscurity. You may even think it degrading, for I see now your habits have been what the world calls refined. Your tastes lean to the ideal, and your society has at least been amongst the educated. But I consider that no service degrades which can better our race. I hold that the more arid and unreclaimed the soil where the Christian labourer's task of tillage is appointed him, the scantier the mead his toil brings, the higher the honour. His, under such circumstances, is the destiny of the pioneer. And the first pioneers of the gospel were the apostles. Their captain was Jesus, the Redeemer, himself. Well, I said, as he again paused, proceed. He looked at me before he proceeded. Indeed, he seemed leisurely to read my face, as if its features and lines were characters on a page. The conclusions drawn from this scrutiny he partially expressed in his succeeding observations. I believe you will accept the post I offer you, said he, and hold it for a while. Not permanently, though. Any more than I could permanently keep the narrow and narrowing the tranquil hidden office of English country incumbent. For in your nature is an alloy as detrimental to repose as that in mine, though of a different kind. Do explain, I urged, when he halted once more. I will. And you shall hear how poor the proposal is, how trivial, how cramping. I shall not stay long at Morton now that my father is dead, and that I am my own master. I shall leave the place probably in the course of a twelve-month. But while I do stay, I will exert myself to the utmost for its improvement. Morton, when I came to it two years ago, had no school. The children of the poor were excluded from every hope of progress. I established one for boys. I mean now to open a second school for girls. I have hired a building for the purpose with a cottage of two rooms attached to it for the mistress's house. Her salary will be £30 a year. Her house is already furnished, very simply, but sufficiently, by the kindness of a lady, Miss Oliver, the only daughter of the sole rich man in my parish. Mr Oliver, the proprietor of a needle factory and iron foundry in the valley. The same lady pays for the education and clothing of an orphan from the workhouse, on condition that she shall aid the mistress in such menial offices connected with her own house and the school as her occupation of teaching will prevent her having time to discharge in person. Will you be this mistress? 
he put the question rather hurriedly. He seemed half to expect an indignant, or at least a disdainful rejection of the offer. Not knowing all my thoughts and feelings, though guessing some, he could not tell in what light the lot would appear to me. In truth, it was humble, but then it was sheltered, and I wanted a safe asylum. It was plodding, but then, compared with that of a governess in a rich house, it was independent, and the fear of servitude with strangers entered my soul like iron. It was not ignoble, not unworthy, not mentally degrading. I made my decision. I thank you for the proposal, Mr. Rivers, and I accept it with all my heart. But you comprehend me, he said. It is a village school. Your scholars will be only poor girls, cottagers' children, at the best, farmers' daughters. Knitting, sewing, reading, writing, ciphering will be all you will have to teach. What will you do with your accomplishments? What, with the largest portion of your mind, sentiments, tastes? Save them till they are wanted. They will keep. You know what you undertake, then? I do. He now smiled, and not a bitter or a sad smile, but one well-pleased and deeply gratified. And when will you commence the exercise of your function? I will go to my house tomorrow and open the school, if you like, next week. Very well, so be it. He rose and walked through the room. Standing still, he again looked at me. He shook his head. What do you disapprove of, Mr. Rivers? I asked. You will not stay at Morton long. No, no. Why? What is your reason for saying so? I read it in your eye. It is not of that description which promises the maintenance of an even tenor in life. I am not ambitious. He started at the word ambitious. He repeated, no. What made you think of ambition? Who is ambitious? I know I am. But how did you find it out? I was speaking of myself. Well, if you are not ambitious, you are. He paused. What? I was going to say, impassioned. But perhaps you would have misunderstood the word and been displeased. I mean, that human affections and sympathies have a most powerful hold on you. I am sure you cannot long be content to pass your leisure in solitude and to devote your working hours to a monotonous labour wholly void of stimulus. Any more than I can be content, he added with emphasis, to live here buried in morass, pent in with mountains, my nature that God gave me, contravened, my faculties, heaven bestowed, paralysed, made useless. You hear now how I contradict myself. I, who preached contentment with a humble lot, and justified the vocation even of hewers of wood and drawers of water in God's service, I, his ordained minister, almost rave in my restlessness. Well, propensities and principles must be reconciled by some means. He left the room. In this brief hour I had learnt more of him than in the whole previous month, yet still he puzzled me. Diana and Mary Rivers became more sad and silent as the day approached for leaving their brother and their home. They both tried to appear as usual, but the sorrow they had to struggle against was one that could not be entirely conquered or concealed. Diana intimated that this would be a different parting from any they had ever yet known. It would probably, as far as St. John was concerned, be a parting for years. It might be a parting for life. He will sacrifice all to his long-framed resolves, she said, natural affection and feelings more potent still. St. John looks quiet, Jane, but he hides a fever in his vitals. You would think him gentle, yet in some things he is inexorable as death, and the worst of it is, my conscience will hardly permit me to dissuade him from his severe decision. Certainly I cannot for a moment blame him for it. It is right, noble, Christian. Yet it breaks my heart. And the tears gush to her fine eyes. Mary bent her head low over her work. We are now without father. We shall soon be without home and brother, she murmured. At that moment a little accident supervened, 
which seemed decreed by fate purposely to prove the truth of the adage, that misfortunes never come singly, and to add to their distresses the vexing one of the slip between the cup and the lip. St. John passed the window reading a letter. He entered. Our Uncle John is dead, said he. Both the sisters seemed struck, not shocked or appalled. The tidings appeared in their eyes rather momentous than afflicting. Dead, repeated Diana. Yes. She riveted a searching gaze on her brother's face. And what then? she demanded in a low voice. What then, Di? he replied, maintaining a marble immobility of feature. What then? Why, nothing. Read. He threw the letter into her lap. She glanced over it and handed it to Mary. Mary perused it in silence and returned it to her brother. All three looked at each other, and all three smiled. A dreary, pensive smile enough. Amen. We can yet live, said Diana at last. At any rate, it makes us no worse off than we were before, remarked Mary. Only it forces rather strongly on the mind the picture of what might have been, said Mr. Rivers, and contrasts it somewhat too vividly with what is. He folded the letter, locked it in his desk, and again went out. For some minutes, no one spoke. Diana then turned to me. Jane, you will wonder at us and our mysteries, she said, and think us hard-hearted beings not to be more moved at the death of so near a relation as an uncle. But we have never seen him or known him. He was my mother's brother. My father and he quarrelled long ago. It was by his advice that my father risked most of his property in the speculation that ruined him. Mutual recrimination passed between them. They parted in anger and were never reconciled. My uncle engaged afterwards in more prosperous undertakings. It appears he realised a fortune of £20,000. He was never married and had no near kindred but ourselves and one other person, not more closely related than we. My father always cherished the idea that he would atone for his error by leaving his possessions to us. That letter informs us that he has bequeathed every penny to the other relation with the exception of 30 guineas, to be divided between St. John, Diana, and Mary Rivers for the purchase of three mourning rings. He had a right, of course, to do as he pleased, and yet a momentary damp is cast on the spirits by the receipt of such news. Mary and I would have esteemed ourselves rich with a thousand pounds each, and to St. John such a sum would have been valuable for the good it would have enabled him to do. This explanation given, the subject was dropped, and no further reference made to it by either Mr. Rivers or his sisters. The next day I left Marsh End for Morton, the day after Diana and Mary quitted it for distant B. Ah. In a week Mr. Rivers and Hannah repaired to the parsonage, and so the old grange was abandoned. 